Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill Chapter 1 The Man Who Thought His Way Into Partnership with Thomas Alva Edison Truly thoughts are things, and powerful things at that, when they are mixed with definiteness of purpose, persistence, and a burning desire for their translation into riches or other material objects. A little more than 30 years ago, Edwin C. Barnes discovered how true it is that men really do think and grow rich. His discovery did not come about at one sitting. It came little by little, beginning with a burning desire to become a business associate of the great Thomas Edison. One of the chief characteristics of Barnes's desire was that it was definite. He wanted to work with Edison, not for him. Observe carefully the description of how he went about translating his desire into reality, and you will have a better understanding of the 13 principles which lead to riches. When this desire or impulse of thought first flashed into his mind, he was in no position to act upon it. Two difficulties stood in his way. He did not know Mr. Edison, and he did not have enough money to pay his railroad fare to Orange, New Jersey. These difficulties were sufficient to have discouraged the majority of men from making any attempt to carry out the desire. But this was no ordinary desire. He was so determined to find a way to carry out his desire that he finally decided to travel by blind baggage rather than be defeated. To the uninitiated, this means that he went to East Orange on a freight train. He presented himself at Mr. Edison's laboratory and announced he had come to go into business with the inventor. In speaking of the first meeting between Barnes and Edison years later, Mr. Edison said, He stood there before me, looking like an ordinary tramp, but there was something in the expression of his face which conveyed the impression that he was determined to get what he had come after. I had learned from years of experience with men that when a man really desires a thing so deeply that he is willing to stake his entire future on a single turn of the wheel in order to get it, he is sure to win. I gave him the opportunity he asked for because I saw he had made up his mind to stand by until he succeeded. Subsequent events proved that no mistake was made. Just what young Barnes said to Mr. Edison on that occasion was far less important than that which he thought. Edison himself said so. It could not have been the young man's appearance which got him his start in the Edison office, for that was definitely against him. It was what he thought that counted. If the significance of this statement could be conveyed to every person who reads it, there would be no need for the remainder of this book. Barnes did not get his partnership with Edison on his first interview. He did get a chance to work in the Edison offices at a very nominal wage, doing work that was unimportant to Edison, but most important to Barnes, because it gave him an opportunity to display his merchandise where his intended partner could see it. Months went by. Apparently nothing happened to bring the coveted goal which Barnes had set up in his mind as his definite major purpose. But something important was happening in Barnes' mind. He was constantly intensifying his desire to become the business associate of Edison. Psychologists have correctly said that when one is truly ready for a thing, it puts in its appearance. Barnes was ready for a business association with Edison. Moreover, he was determined to remain ready until he got that which he was seeking. He did not say to himself, Ah, oh, well, what's the use? I guess I'll change my mind and try for a salesman's job. But he did say, I came here to go into business with Edison, and I will accomplish this end if it takes the remainder of my life. He meant it. What a different story men would have to tell if only they would adopt a definite purpose and stand by that purpose until it had time to become an all-consuming obsession. Well, maybe young Barnes did not know it at the time, but his bulldog determination, his persistence in standing back of a single desire, was destined to mow down all opposition and bring him the opportunity he was seeking. When the opportunity came, it appeared in a different form and from a different direction than Barnes had expected. That is one of the tricks of opportunity. It has a sly habit of slipping in by the back door, and often it comes disguised in the form of misfortune or temporary defeat. Perhaps this is why so many fail to recognize opportunity. Mr. Edison had just perfected a new office device known at that time as the Edison dictating machine, now the Edifone. His salesmen were not enthusiastic over the machine. They did not believe it could be sold without great effort. Barnes saw his opportunity. It had crawled in quietly, hidden in a queer-looking machine which interested no one but Barnes and the inventor. Barnes knew he could sell the Edison dictating machine. He suggested this to Edison and promptly got his chance. He did sell the machine. 
In fact, he sold it so successfully that Edison gave him a contract to distribute and market it all over the nation. Out of that business association grew the slogan, made by Edison and installed by Barnes. The Business Alliance has been in operation for more than 30 years. Out of it, Barnes has made himself rich in money, but he has done something infinitely greater. He has proved that one really may think and grow rich. How much actual cash that original desire of Barnes has been worth to him, I have no way of knowing. Perhaps it has brought him two or three million dollars, but the amount, whatever it is, becomes insignificant when compared with the greater asset he acquired in the form of definite knowledge that an intangible impulse of thought can be transmuted into its physical counterpart by the application of known principles. Barnes literally thought himself into a partnership with the great Edison. He thought himself into a fortune. He had nothing to start with except the capacity to know what he wanted and the determination to stand by that desire until he realized it. He had no money to begin with. He had but little education. He had no influence. But he did have initiative, faith, and the will to win. With these intangible forces, he made himself number one man with the greatest inventor who ever lived. Now let us look at a different situation and study a man who had plenty of tangible evidence of riches, but lost it because he stopped three feet short of the goal that he was seeking. One of the most common causes of failure is the habit of quitting when one is overtaken by temporary defeat. Every person is guilty of this mistake at one time or another. An uncle of R.U. Darby was caught by the gold fever in the gold rush days and went west to dig and grow rich. He'd never heard that more gold has been mined from the brains of men than has ever been taken from the earth. He staked a claim and went to work with pick and shovel. The going was hard, but his lust for gold was definite. After weeks of labor, he was rewarded by the discovery of the shining ore. He needed machinery to bring the ore to the surface. Quietly, he covered up the mine, retraced his footsteps to his home in Williamsburg, Maryland, told his relatives and a few neighbors of the strike. They got together money for the needed machinery and had it shipped. The uncle and Darby went back to work the mine. The first car of ore was mined and shipped to a smelter. The returns proved they had one of the richest mines in Colorado. A few more cars of that ore would clear the debts, then would become the big killing in profits. Down went the drills, up went the hopes of Darby and uncle. Well, then something happened. The vein of gold ore disappeared. They had come to the end of the rainbow, and the pot of gold was no longer there. They drilled on, desperately trying to pick up the vein again, all to no avail. Finally, they decided to quit. They sold the machinery to a junk man for a few hundred dollars, and they took the train back home. Now, some junk men are dumb, but not this one. He called in a mining engineer to look at the mine and do a little calculating. The engineer advised that the project had failed because the owners were not familiar with fault lines. His calculations showed that the vein would be found just three feet from where the Darbys had stopped drilling. And that is exactly where it was found. The junk man took millions of dollars in ore from the mine because he knew enough to seek expert counsel before giving up. Most of the money which went into the machinery was procured through the efforts of R.U. Darby, who was then a very young man. The money came from his relatives and neighbors because the faith they had in him. He paid back every dollar of it, although he was in years doing so. Long afterward, Mr. Darby recouped his loss many times over when he made the discovery that desire can be transmuted into gold. That discovery came after he went into the business of selling life insurance. Remembering that he had lost a huge fortune because he stopped three feet from the gold, Darby profited by the experience in his chosen work by the simple method of saying to himself, I stopped three feet from gold, but I will never stop because men say no when I ask them to buy insurance. Darby is one of a small group of fewer than 50 men who sell more than a million dollars in life insurance annually. He owes his stickability to the lesson he learned from his quitability in the gold mining business. Perhaps success comes in any man's life. He is sure to meet with much temporary defeat and perhaps some failure. When defeat overtakes a man, the easiest and most logical thing to do is quit. That is exactly what the majority of men do. More than 500 of the most successful men in this country has ever known told the author their greatest success came just one step beyond the point at which defeat had overtaken them. Failure is a trickster with a keen sense of irony and cunning. It takes a great delight in tripping one when success is almost within reach. 
Shortly after Mr. Darby received his degree from the University of Hard Knocks and had decided to profit by his experience in the gold mining business, he had the good fortune to be present on an occasion that proved to him that no does not necessarily mean no. One afternoon, he was helping his uncle grind wheat in an old-fashioned mill. The uncle operated a large farm on which a number of colored sharecrop farmers lived. Quietly, the door was opened, and a small colored child, the daughter of a tenant, walked in and took her place near the door. The uncle looked up, saw the child, and barked at her roughly, "'What do you want?' Meekly, the child replied, "'My mammy say send her fifty cents.' "'I'll not do it,' the uncle retorted. "'Now you run on home.' "'Yes, sir,' the child replied." but she did not move. The uncle went ahead with his work, so busily engaged that he did not pay enough attention to the child to observe that she did not leave. When he looked up and saw her still standing there, he yelled at her, I told you to go on home. Now go, or I'll take a switch to you. The little girl said, Yes, sir, but she did not budge an inch. The uncle dropped a sack of grain he was about to pour into the mill hopper, picked up a barrel stave, and started toward the child with an expression on his face that indicated trouble. Darby held his breath. He was certain he was about to witness a murder. He knew his uncle had a fierce temper. He knew that colored children were not supposed to defy white people in that part of the country. When the uncle reached the spot where the child was standing, she quickly stepped forward one step, looked up into his eyes, and screamed at the top of her shrill voice, My mammy's gotta have that fifty cents! The uncle stopped, looked at her for a moment, then slowly laid the barrel stave on the floor. He put his hand in his pocket, took out half a dollar, and gave it to her. The child took the money and slowly backed toward the door, never taking her eyes off the man who she had just conquered. After she had gone, the uncle sat down on a box and looked out the window into space for more than ten minutes. He was pondering with awe over the whipping he had just taken Mr. Darby to with some thinking. That was the first time in all of his experience that he had seen a colored child deliberately master an adult white person. How did she do it? What happened to his uncle that caused him to lose his fierceness and become as docile as a lamb? What strange power did this child use that made her master over her superior? These and other similar questions flashed into Darby's mind, but he did not find the answer until years later when he told me the story. Strangely, the story of this unusual experience was told to the author in the old mill on the very spot where the uncle took his whipping. Strangely, too, I had devoted nearly a quarter of a century to the study of power which enabled an ignorant, illiterate colored child to conquer an intelligent man. As we stood there in that musty old mill, Mr. Darby repeated the story of the unusual conquest and finished by asking, What can you make of it? What strange power did that child use that so completely whipped my uncle? The answer to his question will be found in the principles described in this book. The answer is full and complete. It contains details and instructions sufficient to enable anyone to understand and apply the same force which the little child accidentally stumbled upon. Keep your mind alert, and you will observe exactly what strange power came to the rescue of the child. You will catch a glimpse of this power in the next chapter. Somewhere in the book you will find an idea that will quicken your receptive powers and place at your command, for your own benefit, the same irresistible power. The awareness of this power may come to you in the first chapter, or it may flash into your mind in some subsequent chapter. It may come in the form of a single idea, or it may come in the nature of a plan or a purpose. Again, it may cause you to look back into your past experiences of failure or defeat and bring to the surface some lesson by which you can regain all that you lost through defeat. After I had described to Mr. Darby the power unwittingly used by the little colored child, he quickly retraced his 30 years of experience as a life insurance salesman, and frankly acknowledged that his success in the field was due, in no small degree, to the lesson he had learned from that child. Mr. Darby pointed out, every time a prospect tried to bow me out without buying, I saw that child standing there in the old mill, her big eyes glaring in defiance, and I said to myself, I've got to make this sale. The better portion of all sales I've made were made after people had said no. He recalled, too, his mistake in having stopped only three feet from gold. But, he said, that experience was a blessing in disguise. It taught me to keep on keeping on, no matter how hard the going may be. A lesson I needed to learn before I could succeed in anything. The story of Mr. Darby and his uncle, the colored child in the gold mine, doubtless will be read by hundreds of men who make their living by selling life insurance, and to all of these, 
The author wishes to offer the suggestion that Darby owes to these two experiences his ability to sell more than a million dollars of life insurance every year. Life is strange and often imponderable. Both the successes and the failures have their roots in simple experiences. Mr. Darby's experiences were commonplace and simple enough, yet they held the answer to his destiny in life. Therefore, they were as important to him as life itself. He profited by these two dramatic experiences because he analyzed them and found the lesson they taught. But what of the man who has neither the time nor the inclination to study failure in search of knowledge that may lead to success? Where and how is he to learn the art of converting defeat into stepping stones to opportunity? In answer to these questions, this book was written. The answer called for a description of 13 principles. But remember, as you read the answer, you may be seeking to the questions which have caused you to ponder over the strangeness of life may be found in your own mind through some idea, plan, or purpose which may spring into your mind as you read. One sound idea is all that one needs to achieve success. The principles described in this book contain the best and the most practical of all that is known concerning ways and means of creating useful ideas. Before we go any further in our approach to the description of these principles, we believe you are entitled to receive this important suggestion. When riches begin to come, they come so quickly in such great abundance that one wonders where they've been hiding during all of those lean years. This is an astounding statement, and all the more so when we take into consideration the popular belief that riches come only to those who work hard and long. When you begin to think and grow rich, you will observe that riches begin with a state of mind with definiteness of purpose with little or no hard work. You and every other person ought to be interested in knowing how to acquire that state of mind which will attract riches. I spent 25 years in research, analyzing more than 25,000 people because I too wanted to know how wealthy men became that way. Without that research, this book could not have been written. Here, take notice of a very significant truth. The business depression started in 1929 and continued on to an all-time record of destruction until sometime after President Roosevelt entered office. Then the depression began to fade into nothingness. Just as an electrician in a theater raises the light so gradually that darkness is transmuted into light before you realize it, so did the spell of fear in the minds of the people gradually fade away and it became faith. Observe very closely as soon as you master the principles of this philosophy and begin to follow the instructions for applying those principles. Your financial status will begin to improve and everything you touch will begin to transmute itself into an asset for your benefit. Impossible? Not at all. One of the main weaknesses of mankind is the average man's familiarity with the word impossible. He knows all the rules which will not work. He knows all the things which cannot be done. This book was written for those who seek the rules which have made others successful and are willing to stake everything on those rules. A great many years ago, I purchased a fine dictionary. The first thing I did with it was to turn to the word impossible and neatly clip it out of the book. That would not be an unwise thing for you to do. Success comes to those who become success conscious. Failure comes to those who indifferently allow themselves to become failure conscious. The object of this book is to help all who seek it to learn the art of changing their minds from failure consciousness to success consciousness. Another weakness found in altogether too many people is the habit of measuring everything and everyone by their own impressions and beliefs. Some men who will read this will believe that no one can think and grow rich. They cannot think in terms of riches because their thought habits have been steeped in poverty, want, misery, failure, and defeat. These unfortunate people remind me of a prominent Chinese who came to America to be educated in American ways. He attended the University of Chicago. One day President Harper met this young Oriental on the campus and stopped to chat with him for a few minutes and asked what had impressed him as being the most noticeable characteristics of the American people. Why, the Chinaman exclaimed, the queer slant of your eyes. Your eyes are off slant. What do we say about the Chinese? We refuse to believe that which we do not understand. We foolishly believe that our own limitations are the proper measure of limitations. Sure, the other fellow's eyes are off slant because they're not the same as our own. Millions of people look at the achievement of Henry Ford after he has arrived and envy him because of his good fortune or luck or genius or whatever it is that they credit for Ford's fortune. 
Perhaps one person in every hundred thousand knows the secret of Ford's success, and those who do know are too modest or too reluctant to speak about it because of its simplicity. A single transaction will illustrate the secret perfectly. A few years back, Ford decided to produce his now famous V8 motor. He chose to build an engine with the entire eight cylinders cast in one block and instructed his engineers to produce a design for that engine. The design was placed on paper, but the engineers agreed to a man that it was simply impossible to cast an eight-cylinder gas engine block in one piece. Ford said, produce it anyway. But, they replied, it's impossible. Go ahead, Ford commanded, and stay on the job until you succeed, no matter how much time it requires. So the engineers went ahead. There was nothing else for them to do if they were to remain on the Ford staff. Six months went by, nothing happened. Another six months passed, and still nothing happened. The engineers tried every conceivable plan to carry out the orders, but the thing seemed out of the question. Impossible. At the end of the year, Ford checked with his engineers, and again, they informed him they had found no way to carry out his orders. Go right ahead, said Ford. I want it, and I'll have it. They went ahead, and then, as if by a stroke of magic, the secret was discovered. The Ford determination had won once more. This story may not be described with minute accuracy, but the sum and substance of it is. Deduce from it, you who wish to think and grow rich, the secrets of the Ford millions, if you can. You'll not have to look very far. Henry Ford is a success because he understands and applies the principles of success. One of these desires, knowing what one wants. Remember this Ford story as you read and pick out the lines in which the secret of his stupendous achievements have been described. If you can do this, if you can lay your finger on the particular group of principles which made Henry Ford rich, you can equal his achievements in almost any calling for which you are suited. You are the master of your fate, the captain of your soul, because when Henley wrote the prophetic lines, I am the master of my fate, I am the captain of my soul, he should have informed us that we are the masters of our fate, the captains of our souls, because we have the power to control our thoughts. He should have told us that the ether in which this little earth floats, in which we move and have our being, is a form of energy moving at an inconceivably high rate of vibration, and that the ether is filled with a form of universal power which adapts itself to the nature of the thoughts we hold in our minds, and influences us in natural ways to transmute our thoughts into their physical equivalent. If the poet had told us of this great truth, we would know why it is that we are the masters of our fate and the captains of our souls. He should have told us with great emphasis that this power makes no attempt to discriminate between destructive thoughts and constructive thoughts, that it will urge us to translate into physical reality thoughts of poverty just as quickly as it will influence us to act upon thoughts of riches. He should have told us, too, that our brains become magnetized with the dominating thoughts which we hold in our minds, and by means with which no man is familiar. These magnets attract us to the forces, the people, the circumstances of life, which harmonize with the nature of our dominating thoughts. He should have told us that before we can accumulate riches in great abundance, we must magnetize our minds with intense desire for riches, that we must become money conscious until the desire for money drives us to create definite plans for acquiring it. But being a poet and not a philosopher, Henley contented himself by stating a great truth in poetic form, leaving those who followed him to interpret the philosophical meaning of his lines. Little by little the truth has unfolded itself until it now appears certain that the principles described in this book hold the secret of mastery over our economic fate. We are now ready to examine the first of these principles. Maintain a spirit of open-mindedness, and remember as you read, they are the invention of no one man. The principles were gathered from the life experiences of more than 500 men who actually accumulated riches in huge amounts, men who began in poverty with but little education without influence. The principles worked for these men. You can put them to work in your own enduring benefit. You will find it easy, not hard to do. Before you read the next chapter, I want you to know that it conveys factual information which might easily change your entire financial destiny, as it has so definitely brought changes of stupendous proportions to two people described. I want you to know also that the relationship between these two men and myself is such that I could have taken no liberties with the facts, even if I had wished to do so. 
One of them has been my closest personal friend for almost 25 years. The other is my own son. The unusual success of these two men, success which they generously accredit to the principle described in the next chapter, more than justifies this personal reference as a means of emphasizing the far-flung power of this principle. Almost 15 years ago, I delivered the commencement address at Salem College in Salem, West Virginia. I emphasized the principle described in the next chapter with so much intensity that one of the members of the graduating class definitely appropriated it and made it a part of his own philosophy. That young man is now a member of Congress and an important factor in the present administration. Just before this book went to the publisher, he wrote me a letter in which he so clearly stated his opinion of the principle outlined in the next chapter, that I have chosen to publish his letter as an introduction to that chapter. It gives you an idea of the rewards to come. My dear Napoleon, my service as a member of Congress, having given me an insight into the problems of men and women, I am writing to offer a suggestion which may become helpful to thousands of worthy people. With apologies, I must state that the suggestion, if acted upon, will mean several years of labor and responsibility for you, but I am enheartened to make the suggestion because I know your great love for rendering useful service. In 1922, you delivered the commencement address at Salem College when I was a member of the graduating class. In that address, you planted in my mind an idea which has been responsible for the opportunity I now have to serve the people of my state and will be responsible in a very large measure for whatever success I may have in the future. The suggestion I have in mind is that you put into a book the sum and substance of the address you delivered at Salem College and in that way give the people of America an opportunity to profit by your many years of experience and association with the men who, by their greatness, have made America the richest nation on earth. I recall as though it were yesterday the marvelous description you gave of the method by which Henry Ford, with but little schooling, without a dollar, with no influential friends, rose to great heights. I made up my mind then, even before you had finished your speech, that I would make a place for myself no matter how many difficulties I had to surmount. Thousands of young people will finish their schooling this year and within the next few years. Every one of them will be seeking just such a message of practical encouragement as the one I received from you. They will want to know where to turn, what to do to get started in life. You can tell them because you've helped to solve the problems of so many, many people. If there is any possible way that you can afford to render so great a service, may I offer the suggestion that you include with every book one of your personal analysis charts in order that the purchaser of the book may have the benefit of a complete self-inventory, indicating, as you indicated to me years ago, exactly what is standing in the way of success. Such a service as this, providing the readers of your book with a complete unbiased picture of their faults and their virtues, would mean to them the difference between success and failure. The service would be priceless. Millions of people are now facing the problem of staging a comeback because of the Depression, and I speak from personal experience. When I say I know these earnest people would welcome the opportunity to tell you their problems and to receive your suggestions for the solution. You know the problems of those who face the necessity of beginning all over again. There are thousands of people in America today who would like to know how they can convert ideas into money, people who must start at scratch without finances and recoup their losses. If anyone can help them, you can. If you publish the book, I would like to own the first copy that comes from the press, personally autographed by you. With best wishes, believe me, cordially yours, Jennings Randolph. Chapter 2. Desire, the starting point of all achievement, the first step toward riches. When Edwin C. Barnes climbed down from the freight train in Orange, New Jersey, more than 30 years ago, he may have resembled a tramp, but his thoughts were those of a king. As he made his way from the railroad tracks to Thomas Edison's office, his mind was at work. He saw himself standing in Edison's presence. He heard himself asking Mr. Edison for an opportunity to carry out the one consuming obsession of his life, a burning desire to become the business associate of the great inventor. Barnes' desire was not a hope. It was not a wish. It was a keen, pulsating desire which transcended everything else. It was definite. The desire was not new when he approached Edison. It had been Barnes' dominating desire for a long time. In the beginning, when the desire first appeared in his mind, 
It may have been, and probably was, only a wish, but it was no mere wish when he appeared before Edison with it. A few years later, Edwin C. Barnes again stood before Edison in the same office where he first met the inventor. This time his desire had been translated into reality. He was in business with Edison. The dominating dream of his life had become a reality. Today people who know Barnes envy him because of the break that life yielded him. They see him in the days of his triumph without taking the trouble to investigate the cause of his success. Barnes succeeded because he chose a definite goal, placed all of his energy, all of his willpower, all of his effort, everything back of that goal. He did not become the partner of Edison the day he arrived. He was content to start on the most menial work as long as it provided an opportunity to take even one step toward his cherished goal. Five years passed before the chance he had been seeking made its appearance. During all of those years, not one ray of hope, not one promise of attainment of his desire had been held out to him. Everyone except himself, he appeared only another cog in the Edison business wheel. But in his own mind, he was the partner of Edison every minute of the time, from the very day that he first went to work there. It's a remarkable illustration of the power of a definite desire. Barnes won his goal because he wanted to be a business associate of Mr. Edison more than he wanted anything else. He created a plan by which to attain that purpose. But he burned all bridges behind him. He stood by his desire until it became the dominating obsession of his life and finally a fact. When he went to Orange, he did not say to himself, I will try to induce Edison to give me a job of some soft. He said, I will see Edison and put him on notice that I have come to go into business with him. He did not say, I will work there for a few months, and if I get no encouragement, I'll quit and I'll get a job somewhere else. He did say, I will start anywhere. I will do anything Edison tells me to do. But before I'm through, I will be his associate. He didn't say, I will keep my eyes open for another opportunity in case I fail to get what I want in the Edison organization. He said, There is but one thing in this world that I am determined to have, and that is a business association with Thomas Alva Edison. I will burn all bridges behind me and stake my entire future on my ability to get what I want. He left himself no possible way of retreat. He had to win or perish. That is all there is to the Barnes story of success. A long while ago, a great warrior faced a situation which made it necessary for him to make a decision which ensured his success on the battlefield. He was about to send his armies against a powerful foe whose men outnumbered his own. He loaded his soldiers into boats, sailed to the enemy's country, unloaded soldiers and equipment, then gave the order to burn the ships that had carried them. Addressing his men before the first battle, he said, you see the boats going up in smoke. That means that we cannot leave these shores alive unless we win. We now have a no choice we win or we perish. They won. Every person who wins in any undertaking must be willing to burn his ships and cut all sources of retreat. Only by doing so can one be sure of maintaining that state of mind known as a burning desire to win, essential to success. The morning after the Great Chicago Fire, a group of merchants stood on State Street, looking at the smoking remains of what had been their stores. They went into a conference to decide if they would try to rebuild or leave Chicago and start over in a more promising section of the country. They reached a decision, all except one, to leave Chicago. The merchant who decided to stay and rebuild pointed a finger at the remains of his store and said, Gentlemen, on that very spot, I will build the world's greatest store no matter how many times it may burn down. Well, that was more than 50 years ago, and the store was built. It stands there today, a towering monument to the power of that state. It is known as a burning desire. The easy thing for Marshall Field to have done would have been exactly what his fellow merchants did. When the going was hard and the future looked dismal, they pulled up and went where the going seemed easier. Mark well this difference between Marshall Field and the other merchants because it is the same difference which distinguishes Edwin C. Barnes from thousands of other young men who have worked in the Edison organization. It's the same difference which distinguishes practically all who succeed from those who fail. Every human being who reaches the age of understanding of the purpose of money wishes for it. 
Now, wishing will not bring riches, but desiring riches with a state of mind that becomes an obsession, then planning definite ways and means to acquire riches, and backing those plans with persistence, which does not recognize failure, will bring riches. The method by which desire for riches can be transmuted into its financial equivalent consists of six definite practical steps. First, fix in your mind the exact amount of money you desire. It is not sufficient merely to say, I want plenty of money. First, be definite as to the amount. There is a psychological reason for definiteness, which will be described in a subsequent chapter. Second, determine exactly what you intend to give in the return for the money you desire. There is no such reality as something for nothing. Third, establish a definite date when you intend to possess the money you desire. Fourth, create a definite plan for carrying out your desire and begin at once, whether you're ready or not to put this plan into action. Fifth, Write out a clear, concise statement of the amount of money you intend to acquire. Name the time limit for its acquisition. State what you intend to give in return for the money. And describe clearly the plan through which you intend to accumulate it. Sixth, read your written statement aloud twice daily, once just before retiring at night and once after arising in the morning. As you read, see, and feel, and believe yourself already in possession of the money. It is important that you follow the instructions described in these six steps. It is especially important that you observe and follow the instructions in the sixth paragraph. You may complain that it's impossible for you to see yourself in possession of money before you actually have it. Here is where a burning desire will come to your aid. If you truly desire money so keenly that your desire is an obsession, you will have no difficulty in convincing yourself that you will acquire it. The object is to want money and to become so determined to have it that you convince yourself that you will have it. Only those who become money conscious ever accumulate great riches. Money consciousness means that the mind has become so thoroughly saturated with the desire for money that one can see oneself already in possession of it. To the uninitiated who has not been schooled in the working principles of the human mind, these instructions may appear impractical. It may be helpful to all who fail to recognize the soundness of the six steps, to know that the information they convey was received from Andrew Carnegie, who began as an ordinary laborer in the steel mills, but managed, despite his humble beginnings, to make these principles yield him a fortune of considerably more than $100 million. It may be of further help to know that the six steps here recommended were carefully scrutinized by the late Thomas Alva Edison, who placed his stamp of approval upon them as being not only the steps essential for the accumulation of money, but necessary for the attainment of any definite goal. The steps call for no hard labor. They call for no sacrifice. They do not require one to become ridiculous or credulous. To apply them calls for no great amount of education. But the successful application of these six steps does call for sufficient imagination to enable one to see and to understand that accumulation of money cannot be left to chance, good fortune, and luck. One must realize that all who have accumulated great fortunes first did a certain amount of dreaming, hoping, wishing, desiring, and planning before they acquired money. You may as well know right here that you can never have riches in great quantities unless you can work yourself into a white heat of desire for money and actually believe that you will possess it. You may as well know also that every great leader from the dawn of civilization down to the present was a dreamer. Christianity is the greatest potential power in the world today because its founder was an intense dreamer who had the vision and the imagination to see realities in their mental and spiritual form before they had been transmuted into physical form. If you don't see great riches in your imagination, you'll never see them in your bank balance. Never in the history of America has there been so great an opportunity for practical dreamers as now exists. The six-year economic collapse has reduced all men substantially to the same level. A new race is about to be run. The stakes represent huge fortunes which will be accumulated within the next ten years. The rules of the race have changed because we now live in a changed world that definitely favors the masses. Those who had but little or no opportunity to win under the conditions existing during the Depression when fear paralyzed growth and development. We who are in this race for riches should be encouraged to know 
that this changed world in which we live is demanding new ideas, new ways of doing things, new leaders, new inventions, new methods of teaching, new methods of marketing, new books, new literature, new features for the radio, and new ideas for moving pictures. Back of all this demand for new and better things, there is one quality which one must possess to win, and that is definiteness of purpose, the knowledge of what one wants, and a burning desire to possess it. The business depression marked the death of one age and the birth of another. This changed world requires practical dreamers who can and will put their dreams into action. The practical dreamers have always been and always will be the pattern makers of civilization. We who desire to accumulate riches should remember the real leaders of the world always have been men who harnessed and put into practical use the intangible, unseen forces of unborn opportunity and have converted those forces, or impulses of thoughts, into skyscrapers, cities, factories, airplanes, automobiles, and every form of convenience that makes life more pleasant. Tolerance and an open mind are practical necessities of the dreamer of today. Those who are afraid of new ideas are doomed before they start. Never has there been a time more favorable to pioneers than the present. True, there's no wild and woolly west to be conquered, as in the days of the covered wagons, but there is a vast business, financial, and industrial world to be remolded and redirected along new and better lines. In planning to acquire your share of the riches, let no one influence you to scorn the dreamer. To win the big stakes in this changed world, you must catch the spirit of the great pioneers of the past whose dreams have given civilization all that it has of value, the spirit which serves as the lifeblood of our own country, your opportunity and mine to develop and market our talents. Let us not forget, Columbus dreamed of an unknown world, staked his life on the existence of such a world, and then discovered it. Copernicus, the great astronomer, dreamed of a multiplicity of worlds and revealed them. No one denounced him as impractical after he had triumphed. Instead, the world worshipped at his shrine, thus proving once more that success requires no apologies and failure permits no alibis. If the thing you wish to do is right, and you believe in it, go ahead and do it. Put your dream across, and never mind what they say, if you meet with temporary defeat, for they, perhaps, do not know that every failure brings with it the seed of an equivalent success. Henry Ford, poor and uneducated, dreamed of a horseless carriage. He went to work with what tools he possessed, without waiting for opportunity to favor him, and now evidence of his dream belts the entire earth. He has put more wheels into operation than any man who ever lived because he was not afraid to back his dreams. Thomas Edison dreamed of a lamp that could be operated by electricity. He began where he stood to put his dream into action, and despite more than 10,000 failures, he stood by that dream until he made it physical reality. Practical dreamers do not quit. Whelan dreamed of a chain of cigar stores. He transformed his dream into action, and now the United Cigar Stores occupy the best corners in America. Lincoln dreamed of freedom for the black slaves. He put his dream into action and barely missed living to see a united North and South translate his dream into reality. The Wright brothers dreamed of a machine that would fly through the air. Now one may see evidence all over the world that they dreamed soundly. Marconi dreamed of a system for harnessing the intangible forces of the ether. Evidence that he did not dream in vain may be found in every wireless and radio in the world. Moreover, Marconi's dream brought the humblest cabin and the most stately manor house side by side. It made the people of every nation on earth backdoor neighbors. It gave the President of the United States a medium by which he may talk to all the people of America at one time and on short notice. It may interest you to know that Marconi's friends had him taken into custody and examined in a psychopathic hospital when he announced that he had discovered a principle through which he could send messages through the air without the aid of wires or other direct physical means of communication. The dreamers of today fare much better. The world has become accustomed to new discoveries. Nay, it has shown a willingness to reward the dreamer who gives the world a new idea. The greatest achievement was, at first and for a time, but a dream. The oak sleeps in the acorn. The bird waits in the egg, and the highest vision of the soul, a walking angel, stirs. Dreams are the seedlings of reality. Awake, arise, and assert yourself, you dreamers of the world. Your star is now in the ascendancy. The world depression brought the opportunity you've been waiting for. It taught people humility, 
tolerance, and open-mindedness. The world is filled with an abundance of opportunity which the dreamers of the past never knew. A burning desire to be and to do is the starting point from which the dreamer must take off. Dreams are not born of indifference, laziness, or lack of ambition. The world no longer scoffs at the dreamer nor calls him impractical. If you think it does, take a trip to Tennessee and witness what a dreamer president has done in the way of harnessing and using the great water power of America. A score of years ago, such a dream would have seemed like madness. You've been disappointed that you've undergone defeat during the Depression. You have felt the great heart within you crushed until it bled. Take courage, for these experiences have tempered the spiritual metal of which you are made. They are assets of incomparable value. Remember, too, that all who succeed in life get off to a bad start, and they pass through many heartbreaking struggles before they arrive. The turning point in the lives of those who succeed usually comes at the moment of some crisis through which they are introduced to their other selves. John Bunyan wrote The Pilgrim's Progress, which is among the finest of all English literature, after he had been confined in prison and sorely punished because of his views on the subject of religion. O. Henry discovered the genius which slept within his brain after he had met with great misfortune and was confined in a prison cell in Columbus, Ohio. Being forced through misfortune to become acquainted with his other self and to use his imagination, he discovered himself to be a great author instead of a miserable criminal and outcast. Strange and varied are the ways of life, and stranger still are the ways of infinite intelligence through which men are sometimes forced to undergo all sorts of punishment before discovering their own brains and their own capacity to create useful ideas through imagination. Edison, the world's greatest inventor and scientist, was a tramp telegraph operator. He failed innumerable times before he was driven, finally, to the discovery of the genius which slept within his brain. Charles Dickens began by pasting labels on blacking pots. The tragedy of his first love penetrated the depths of his soul and converted him into one of the world's truly great authors. That tragedy produced first David Copperfield, then a succession of other works that made this a richer and better world for all who read the books. Disappointment over love affairs generally has the effect of driving men to drink and women to ruin, and this because most people never learn the art of transmuting their strongest emotions into dreams of a constructive nature. Helen Keller became deaf, dumb, and blind shortly after birth. Despite her greatest misfortune, she has written her name indelibly in the pages of History of the Great. Her entire life has served as evidence that no one ever is defeated until defeat has been accepted as a reality. Robert Burns was an illiterate country lad. He was cursed by poverty and grew up to be a drunkard in the bargain. The world was made better for his having lived, because he clothed beautiful thoughts in poetry, and thereby plucked a thorn and planted a rose in its place. Booker T. Washington was born in slavery, handicapped by race and color. Because he was tolerant, he had an open mind at all times on all subjects, and was a dreamer, he left his impress for good on an entire race. Beethoven was deaf, Milton was blind, but their names will last as long as time endures, because they dreamed and they translated their dreams into organized thought. Before passing to the next chapter, kindle anew in your mind the fire of hope, faith, courage, and tolerance. If you have these states of mind and a working knowledge of the principles described, all else that you need will come to you when you are ready for it. Len Emerson state the thought in these words, Every proverb, every book, every byword that belongs to thee for aid and comfort shall surely come home through open or winding passages. Every friend whom not thy fantastic will but the great and tender soul in thee craveth shall lock thee in his embrace. There's a difference between wishing for a thing and being ready to receive it. No one is ready for a thing until he believes he can acquire it. The state of mind must be belief, not mere hope or wish. Open-mindedness is essential for belief. Closed minds do not inspire faith, courage, and belief. Remember, no more effort is required to aim high in life, to demand abundance and prosperity, than is required to accept misery and poverty. A great poet has correctly stated this universal truth through these lines. I bargained with life for a penny, and life would pay no more. However, I begged at evening when I counted my scanty store, for life is just employer. He gives you what you ask. But once you have set the wages, why, you must bear the task. I worked for a menial's hire only to learn dismayed that any wage I had asked of life 
life would have willingly paid. Desire will outwit Mother Nature. As a fitting climax to this chapter, I wish to introduce one of the most unusual persons I have ever known. I first saw him 24 years ago, a few minutes after he was born. He came into the world without any physical sign of ears, and the doctor admitted when pressed for an opinion that the child might be deaf and mute for life. I challenged the doctor's opinion. I had the right to do so because I was the child's father. I too reached a decision and rendered an opinion, but I expressed the opinion silently in the secrecy of my own heart. I decided that my son would hear and speak. Nature could send me a child without ears, but nature could not induce me to accept the reality of the affliction. In my own mind, I knew that my son would hear and speak. How? I was sure there must be a way, and I knew I would find it. I thought of the words of the immortal Emerson. The whole course of things goes to teach us faith. We need only obey. There is guidance for each of us, and by lowly listening, we shall hear the right word. The right word? Desire. More than anything else, I desired that my son should not be a deaf mute. From that desire, I never receded, not for a second. Many years previously, I had written, Our only limitations are those we set up in our own minds. For the first time, I wondered if that statement were true. Lying on the bed in front of me was a newly born child without the natural equipment of hearing. Even though he might hear and speak, he was obviously disfigured for life. Surely this was a limitation which that child had not set up in his own mind. What could I do about it? Somehow I would find a way to transplant into that child's mind my own burning desire for ways and means of conveying sound to his brain without the aid of ears. As soon as the child was old enough to cooperate, I would fill his mind so completely with a burning desire to hear that nature would, by methods of her own, translate it into physical reality. All this thinking took place in my own mind, but I spoke of it to no one. Every day I renewed the pledge I had made to myself not to accept a deaf mute for a son. As he grew older and began to take notice of things around him, we observed that he had a slight degree of hearing. When we reached the age, and he, when children usually begin talking, he made no attempt to speak, but we could tell by his actions that he could hear certain sounds, although slightly. That was all I wanted to know. I was convinced that if he could hear even slightly, he might develop still greater hearing capacity. And then something happened that gave me hope. It came from an entirely unexpected source. We bought a Victrola. When the child heard the music for the first time, he went into ecstasies and promptly appropriated the machine. He soon showed a preference for certain records. Among them, it's a long way to Tipperary. On one occasion, he played that piece over and over for almost two hours, standing in front of the Victrola, with his teeth clamped on the edge of the case. The significance of this self-formed habit of his did not become clear to us, until years afterward, for we had never heard of the principle of bone conduction of sound at that time. Shortly after he appropriated the Victrola, I discovered that he could hear me quite clearly when I spoke with my lips touching his mastoid bone or at the base of the brain. These discoveries placed in my possession the necessary media by which I began to translate into reality my burning desire to help my son develop hearing and speech. By that time, he was making stabs at speaking certain words. The outlook was far from encouraging, but desire backed by faith knows no such word is impossible. Having determined that he could hear the sound of my voice plainly, I began immediately to transfer to his mind the desire to hear and speak. I soon discovered that the child enjoyed bedtime stories, so I went to work creating stories designed to develop in him self-reliance, imagination, and a keen desire to hear and to be normal. There was one story in particular which I emphasized by giving it some new and dramatic coloring each time it was told. It was designed to plant in his mind the thought that his affliction was not a liability, but an asset of great value. Despite the fact that all the philosophy I had examined clearly indicated that every adversity brings with it the seed of an equivalent advantage, I must confess that I had not the slightest idea how this affliction could ever become an asset. However, I continued my practice of wrapping that philosophy in bedtime stories, hoping that the time would come when he would find some plan by which his handicap could be made to serve some useful purpose. Reason told me plainly that there was no adequate compensation for the lack of ears and natural hearing equipment. 
desire backed by faith pushed reason aside and inspired me to carry on. As I analyze the experience in retrospect, I can see now that my son's faith in me had much to do with the astounding results. He did not question anything I told him. I sold him the idea that he had a distinct advantage over his older brother, and that this advantage would reflect itself in many ways. For example, the teachers in school would observe that he had no ears, and because of this, they would show him special attention and treat him with extraordinary kindness. And they always did. His mother saw to it that by visiting the teachers and arranging with them to give the child the extra attention necessary, I sold him the idea, too, that when he became old enough to sell newspapers, his older brother had already become a newspaper merchant, he would have a big advantage over his brother for the reason that people would pay him extra money for his wares because they could see that he was a bright, industrious boy despite the fact that he had no ears. We could notice that gradually the child's hearing was improving. Moreover, he had not the slightest tendency to be self-conscious because of his affliction. When he was about seven, he showed the first evidence that our method of servicing his mind was bearing fruit. For several months, he begged for the privilege of selling newspapers, but his mother would not give her consent. She was afraid that his deafness made it unsafe for him to go on the street alone. Finally, he took matters into his own hands. One afternoon, when he was left at home with the servants, he climbed through the kitchen window, shinnied to the ground, and set out on his own. He borrowed six cents in capital from the neighborhood shoemaker, invested it in papers, sold out, reinvested, and kept repeating until late in the evening. After balancing his accounts and paying back the six cents he had borrowed from his banker, he had a net profit of 42 cents. When we got home that night, we found him in bed asleep with the money tightly clenched in his hand. His mother opened his hand, removed the coins, and cried of all things. Crying over her son's first victory seemed so inappropriate. My reaction was the reverse. I laughed heartily, for I knew that my endeavor to plant in the child's mind an attitude of faith in himself had been successful. His mother saw in his first business venture a little deaf boy who had gone out in the streets and risked his life to earn money. I saw a brave, ambitious, self-reliant little businessman whose stock in himself had been increased a hundred percent because he had gone into business on his own initiative and he had won. The transaction pleased me because I knew that he had given evidence of a trait of resourcefulness that would go with him all through his life. Later events proved this to be true. When his older brother wanted something, he would lie down on the floor, kick his feet in the air, cry for it, and get it. When the little deaf boy wanted something, he would plan a way to earn the money, then buy it for himself, and he still follows that plan. Truly, my own son has taught me that handicaps can be converted into stepping stones on which one may climb towards some worthy goal unless they are accepted as obstacles and used as alibis. The little deaf boy went through the grades, high school and college, without being able to hear his teachers, excepting when they shouted loudly at close range. He did not go to a school for the deaf. We would not permit him to learn the sign language. We were determined that he should live a normal life and associate with normal children, and we stood by that decision, although it cost us many heated debates with different school officials. While he was in high school, he tried an electrical hearing aid, but it was of no value to him, due, we believe, to a condition that was disclosed when the child was six by Dr. J. Gordon Wilson of Chicago when he operated on one side of the boy's head and discovered that there was no sign of natural hearing equipment. During his last week in college, 18 years after the operation, something happened which marked the most important turning point of his life. Through what seemed to be mere chance, he came into possession of another electrical hearing device which was sent to him on trial. He was slow about testing it due to his disappointment with a similar device. Finally, he picked the instrument up and more or less carelessly placed it on his head, hooked up the battery, and lo, as if by a stroke of magic, his lifelong desire for normal hearing became a reality. For the first time in his life, he heard practically as well as any person with normal hearing. God moves in mysterious ways, his wonders to perform. Overjoyed because of the changed world which had been brought to him through this hearing device, he rushed to the telephone, called his mother, and heard her voice perfectly. The next day, he plainly heard the voices of his professors in class for the first time in his life. Previously, he could hear them only when they shouted at short range. He heard the radio. He heard the talking pictures. For the first time in his life, he could converse freely with other people 
without the necessity of their having to speak loudly. Truly he'd come into possession of a changed world. We had refused to accept nature's error, and by persistent desire we had induced nature to correct that error through the only practical means available. Desire had commenced to pay dividends, but the victory was not yet complete. The boy still had to find a definite and practical way to convert his handicap into an equivalent asset. Hardly realizing the significance of what had already been accomplished, but intoxicated with the joy of his newly discovered world of sound, he wrote a letter to the manufacturer of the hearing aid, enthusiastically describing his experience. Something in his letter, something perhaps which was not written on the lines but back of them, caused the company to invite him to New York. When he arrived, he was escorted through the factory, and while talking with the chief engineer, telling him about his changed world, a hunch, an idea, or an inspiration, call it what you wish, flashed into his mind. It was this impulse of thought which converted his affliction into an asset, destined to pay dividends in both money and happiness to thousands for all time to come. The sum and substance of that impulse of thought was this. It occurred to him that he might be of help to the millions of deafened people who go through life without the benefit of hearing devices. If he could find a way to tell them the story of his changed world, then and there he reached a decision to devote the remainder of his life to rendering useful service to the hard of hearing. For an entire month he carried on an intensive research, during which he analyzed the entire marketing system of the manufacturer of the hearing device, and he created ways and means of communicating with the hard of hearing all over the world for the purpose of sharing with them his newly discovered changed world. When this was done, he put in writing a two-year plan based upon his findings. When he presented the plan to the company, he was instantly given a position for the purpose of carrying out his ambition. Little did he dream when he went to work that he was destined to bring hope and practical relief to thousands of deafened people who, without his help, would have been doomed forever to deaf mutism. Shortly after he became associated with the manufacture of his hearing aid, he invited me to attend a class conducted by his company for the purpose of teaching deaf mutes to hear and to speak. I had never heard of such a form of education, therefore I visited the class, skeptical, but hopeful that my time would not be entirely wasted. Here I saw a demonstration which gave me a greatly enlarged vision of what I had done to arouse and keep alive in my son's mind the desire for normal hearing. I saw deaf mutes actually being taught to hear and to speak through application of the self-same principle I had used more than 20 years previously in saving my son from deaf mutism. Thus through some strange turn of the wheel of fate, my son Blair and I have been destined to aid in correcting deaf mutism for those as yet unborn, because we are the only living human beings, as far as I know, who have established definitely the fact that deaf mutism can be corrected to the extent of restoring to normal life those who suffer with this affliction. It has been done for one, and it will be done for others. There is no doubt in my mind that Blair would have been a deaf mute all of his life if his mother and I had not managed to shape his mind as we did. The doctor who attended at his birth told us, confidentially, the child might never hear or speak. A few weeks ago, Dr. Irving Voorhees, a noted specialist on such cases, examined Blair very thoroughly. He was astounded when he learned how well my son now hears and speaks, and said his examination indicated that, theoretically, the boy should not be able to hear at all. But the lad does hear, despite the fact that X-ray pictures show there is no opening in the skull whatsoever from where his ears should be to the brain. When I planted in his mind the desire to hear and talk and live as a normal person, there went with that impulse some strange influence which caused nature to become bridge builder and span the gulf of silence between his brain and the outer world by some means which the keenest medical specialists have not been able to interpret. It would be sacrilege for me to even conjecture as to how nature performed this miracle. It would be unforgivable if I neglected to tell the world as much as I know of the humble part I assumed in the strange experience. It is my duty and privilege to say, I believe, and not without reason, that nothing is impossible to the person who backs desire with enduring faith. Verily, a burning desire has devious ways of transmuting itself into its physical equivalent. Blair desired normal hearing, now he has it. He was born with a handicap which might easily have sent one with a less defined desire 
to the street with a bundle of pencils and a tin cup. That handicap now promises to serve as the medium by which he will render useful service to many millions of hard of hearing, also to give him useful employment at adequate financial compensation for the remainder of his life. The little white lies that I planted in his mind when he was a child, by leading him to believe his affliction would become a great asset, which he could capitalize, has now justified itself. Verily, there is nothing right or wrong which belief plus burning desire cannot make real. These qualities are free to everyone. In all my experience in dealing with men and women who had personal problems, I never handled a single case which more definitely demonstrates the power of desire. Authors sometimes make the mistake of writing of subjects which they have but superficial or very elementary knowledge. It has been my good fortune to have had the privilege of testing the soundness of the power of desire through the affliction of my own son. Perhaps it was providential that the experience came as it did, for surely no one is better prepared than he to serve as an example of what happens when desire is put to the test. If Mother Nature bends to the will of desire, is it logical that mere men can defeat a burning desire? Strange and imponderable is the power of the human mind. We do not understand the method by which it uses every circumstance, every individual, every physical thing within its reach as a means of transmuting desire into its physical counterpart. Perhaps science will uncover this secret. I planted in my son's mind the desire to hear and to speak as normal person hears and speaks. That desire has now become a reality. I planted in his mind the desire to convert his greatest handicap into his greatest asset. That desire has been realized. The modus operandi by which this astounding result was achieved is not hard to describe. It consisted of three very definite facts. First, I mixed faith with the desire for normal hearing, which I passed on to my son. Second, I communicated my desire to him in every conceivable way available through persistent, continuous effort over a period of years. And third, he believed me. As this chapter was being completed, news came of the death of Madame Schumann Heink. One short paragraph in the news dispatch gave the clue to this unusual woman's stupendous success as a singer. I quote the paragraph because the clue it contains is none other than desire. Early in her career, Madame Schumann Heink visited the director of the Vienna Court Opera to have him test her voice. But he did not test it. After taking one look at the awkward and poorly dressed girl, he exclaimed none too gently, With such a face and with no personality at all, how can you ever expect to succeed in opera? My good child, give up the idea. Buy a sewing machine and go to work. You can never be a singer. Never is a long time. The director of the Vienna Court Opera knew much about the technique of singing. He knew little about the power of desire when it assumes the proportion of an obsession. If he had known more of that power, he would not have made the mistake of condemning genius without giving it an opportunity. Several years ago, one of my business associates became ill. He became worse as time went on and finally was taken to the hospital for an operation. Just before he was wheeled into the operating room, I took a look at him, and I wondered how anyone as thin and emaciated as he could possibly go through a major operation successfully. The doctor warned me that there was little, if any, chance of my ever seeing him alive again. But that was the doctor's opinion. It was not the opinion of the patient. Just before he was wheeled away, he whispered feebly, Do not be disturbed, chief. I'll be out of here in a few days. The attending nurse looked at me with pity. But the patient did come through safely. After it was all over, his physician said, Nothing but his own desire to live saved him. He never would have pulled through if he had not refused to accept the possibility of death. I believe in the power of desire backed by faith because I have seen this power lift men from lowly beginnings to places of power and wealth. I have seen it rob the grave of its victims. I have seen it serve as the medium by which men staged a comeback after having been defeated in a hundred different ways. I have seen it provide my own son with a normal, happy, successful life despite nature's having sent him into a world without ears. How can one harness and use the power of desire? This has been answered through this and the subsequent chapters of this book. This message is going out to the world at the end of the longest and perhaps the most devastating depression that America has ever known. 
It is reasonable to presume that the message may come to the attention of many who have been wounded by the Depression, those who have lost their fortunes, others who have lost their positions, and great numbers who must reorganize their plans and stage a comeback. To all these, I wish to convey the thought that all achievement, no matter what may be, its nature or its purpose, must begin with an intense, burning desire for something definite. Through some strange and powerful principle of mental chemistry, which she has never divulged, nature wraps up in the impulse of strong desire that something which recognizes no such word as impossible and accepts no such reality as failure. Chapter 3 Faith Visualization of and Belief in Attainment of Desire The Second Step Toward Riches Faith is the head chemist of the mind. When faith is blended with the vibration of thought, the subconscious mind instantly picks up the vibration, translates it into its spiritual equivalent, and then transmits it to infinite intelligence, as in the case of prayer. The emotions of faith, love, and sex are the most powerful of all of the major positive emotions. When the three are blended, they have the effect of coloring the vibration of thought in such a way that it instantly reaches the subconscious mind, where it is changed into its spiritual equivalent, the only form that induces a response from infinite intelligence. Love and faith are psychic, related to the spiritual side of man. Sex is purely biological and related only to the physical. The mixing or blending of these three emotions has the effect of opening a direct line of communication between the finite thinking mind of man and the infinite intelligence. How to develop faith? Well, there comes now a statement which will give a better understanding of the importance of the principle of auto-suggestion and assumes in the transmutation of desire into its physical or monetary equivalent, namely that faith is a state of mind which may be induced or created by affirmation or repeated instructions to the subconscious mind through the principle of auto-suggestion. As an illustration, consider the purpose for which you are presumably reading this book. The object is, naturally, to acquire the ability to transmute the intangible thought impulse of desire into its physical counterpart, money. By following the instructions laid down in the chapters on auto-suggestion and the subconscious mind as summarized in the chapter on auto-suggestion, you may convince the subconscious mind that you believe you will receive that for which you ask, and it will act upon that belief which your subconscious mind passes back to you in the form of faith followed by definite plans for procuring that which you desire. The method by which one develops faith where it does not already exist is extremely difficult to describe, almost as difficult, in fact, as it would be to describe the color of red to a blind man who has never seen color and has nothing with which to compare what you describe to him. Faith is a state of mind which you may develop at will after you have mastered the 13 principles because it is a state of mind which develops voluntarily through application and the use of these principles. Repetition of affirmation of orders to your subconscious mind is the only known method of voluntary development of the emotion of faith. Perhaps the meaning may be made clearer through the following explanation as to the way men sometimes become criminals. Stated in the words of a famous criminologist, when men first come into contact with crime, they abhor it. If they remain in contact with crime for a long time, they become accustomed to it and endure it. If they remain in contact with it long enough, they finally embrace it and become influenced by it. This is the equivalent of saying that any impulse of thought which is repeatedly passed on to the subconscious mind is finally accepted and acted upon by the subconscious mind, which proceeds to translate that impulse into its physical equivalent by the most practical procedure available. In connection with this, consider again the statement, all thoughts which have been emotionalized and mixed with faith begin immediately to translate themselves into their physical equivalent or counterpart. The emotions or the feeling portion of thoughts are the factors which give thoughts vitality, life, and action. The emotions of faith, love, and sex, when mixed with any thought impulse, give it greater action than any of these emotions can do singly. Not only thought impulses which have been mixed with faith, but those which have been mixed with any of the positive emotions or any of the negative emotions may reach and influence the subconscious mind. From this statement, you'll understand that the subconscious mind will translate into its physical equivalent 
a thought impulse of a negative or destructive nature, just as readily as it will act upon thought impulses of a positive or constructive nature. This accounts for the strange phenomenon which so many millions of people experience, referred to as misfortune or bad luck. There are millions of people who believe themselves doomed to poverty and failure because of some strange force over which they believe they have no control. They are the creators of their own misfortunes because of this negative belief which is picked up by the subconscious mind and translated into its physical equivalent. This is an appropriate place at which to suggest again that you may benefit by passing on to your subconscious mind any desire which you wish translated into its physical or monetary equivalent in a state of expectancy or belief that the transmutation will actually take place. Your belief or faith is the element which determines the action of your subconscious mind. There is nothing to hinder you from deceiving your subconscious mind when giving it instructions through auto-suggestion as I have deceived my own son's subconscious mind. To make this deceit more realistic, conduct yourself just as you would if you were already in possession of the material thing which you are demanding when you call upon your subconscious mind. The subconscious mind will transmute into its physical equivalent by the most direct and practical media available, any order which is given to it in a state of belief or faith that the order will be carried out. Surely enough has been stated to give a starting point from which one may, through experiment and practice, acquire the ability to mix faith with any order given to the subconscious mind. Perfection will come through practice. It cannot come by merely reading instructions. If it be true that one may become a criminal by association with crime, and this is a known fact, it is equally true that one may develop faith by voluntarily suggesting to the subconscious mind that one has faith. The mind comes finally to take on the nature of the influences which dominate it. Understand this truth and you will know why it is essential for you to encourage the positive emotions as dominating forces of your mind and discourage and eliminate negative emotions. A mind dominated by positive emotions becomes a favorable abode for the state of mind known as faith. A mind so dominated may at will give the subconscious mind instructions which it will accept and act upon immediately. Faith is a state of mind which may be induced by auto-suggestion. All down the ages, the religionists have admonished struggling humanity to have faith in this, that, and other dogma or creed, but they've failed to tell people how to have faith. They have not stated that faith is a state of mind and that it may be induced by self-suggestion. In language which any normal human being can understand, we will describe all that is known about the principle through which faith may be developed, where it does not already exist. Have faith in yourself, faith in the infinite. Before we begin, you should be reminded once again that faith is the eternal elixir, which gives life, power, and action to the impulse of thought. The foregoing sentence is worth reading a second time and a third and a fourth. It is worth reading aloud. Faith is the starting point of all accumulation of riches. Faith is the basis of all miracles and all mysteries which cannot be analyzed by the rules of science. Faith is the only known antidote for failure. Faith is the element, the chemical, which, when mixed with prayer, gives one direct communication with infinite intelligence. Faith is the element which transforms the ordinary vibration of thought created by the finite mind of man into the spiritual equivalent. Faith is the only agency through which the cosmic force of infinite intelligence can be harnessed and used by men. Every one of the foregoing statements is capable of proof. The proof is simple and easily demonstrated. It is wrapped up in the principle of auto-suggestion. Let us center our attention, therefore, upon the subject of self-suggestion and find out what it is and what it is capable of achieving. It's a well-known fact that one comes finally to believe whatever one repeats to oneself, whether the statement be true or false. If a man repeats a lie over and over, he will eventually accept the lie as truth. Moreover, he will believe it to be the truth. Every man is what he is because of the dominating thoughts which he permits to occupy his mind. Thoughts which a man deliberately places in his own mind and encourages with sympathy and with which he mixes any one or more of the emotions constitutes the motivating forces which direct and control his every movement, act, and deed. Comes now a very significant statement of truth. Thoughts which are mixed with any of the feelings of emotions constitute a magnetic force 
which attracts from the vibrations of the ether other similar or related thoughts. A thought thus magnetized with emotion may be compared to a seed which, when planted in fertile soil, germinates, grows, and multiplies itself over and over again until that which was originally one small seed becomes countless millions of seed of the same brand. The ether is a great cosmic mass of eternal forces of vibration. It is made up of both destructive vibrations and constructive vibrations. It carries at all times vibrations of fear, poverty, disease, failure, misery, and vibrations of prosperity, health, success, and happiness, just as surely as it carries the sound of hundreds of orchestrations of music and hundreds of human voices, all of which maintain their own individuality and means of identification through the medium of radio. From the great storehouse of the ether, the human mind is constantly attracting vibrations which harmonize with that which dominates the human mind. Any thought, idea, plan, or purpose which one holds in one's mind attracts from the vibrations of the ether a host of its relatives, adds these relatives to its own force, then grows until it becomes the dominating, motivating master of the individual in whose mind it has been housed. Now let's go back to the starting point and become informed as to how the original seed of an idea, plan, or a purpose may be planted in the mind. The information is easily conveyed. Any idea, plan, or purpose may be placed in the mind through repetition of thought. This is why you are asked to write out a statement of your major purpose or definite chief aim. Commit it to memory and repeat it in audible words day after day until these vibrations of sound have reached your subconscious mind. We are what we are because of the vibrations of thought which we pick up and register through the stimuli of our daily environment. Resolve to throw off the influences of any unfortunate environment and to build your own life to order. Taking inventory of mental assets and liabilities, you will discover that your greatest weakness is lack of self-confidence. This handicap can be surmounted and timidity translated into courage through the aid of the principle of auto-suggestion. The application of this principle may be made through a simple arrangement of positive thought impulses stated in writing, memorized and repeated, until they become a part of the working equipment of the subconscious faculty of your mind. Self-Confidence Formula First, I know that I have the ability to achieve the object of my definite purpose in life. Therefore, I demand of myself persistent, continuous action toward its attainment, and I here and now promise to render such action. Second, I realize the dominating thoughts of my mind will eventually reproduce themselves in outward physical action and gradually transform themselves into physical reality. Therefore, I will concentrate my thoughts for 30 minutes daily upon the task of thinking of the person I intend to become, thereby creating my mind in a clear mental picture of that person. Third, I know through the principle of auto-suggestion any desire that I persistently hold in my mind will eventually seek expression through some practical means of attaining the object back of it. Therefore, I will devote 10 minutes daily to demanding of myself the development of self-confidence. Fourth, I have clearly written down a description of my definite chief aim in life, and I will never stop trying until I shall have developed sufficient self-confidence for its attainment. Fifth, I fully realize that no wealth or position can long endure unless built upon truth and justice. Therefore, I will engage in no transaction which does not benefit all whom it affects. I will succeed by attracting to myself the forces I wish to use and the cooperation of other people. I will induce others to serve me because of my willingness to serve others. I will eliminate hatred, envy, jealousy, selfishness, and cynicism by developing love for all humanity because I know that a negative attitude toward others can never bring me success. I will cause others to believe in me because I will believe in them and in myself. I will sign my name to this formula, commit it to memory, and repeat it aloud once a day with full faith that it will gradually influence my thoughts and actions so that I will become a self-reliant and successful person. Back of this formula is a law of nature which no man has yet been able to explain. It has baffled the scientists of all ages. The psychologists have named this law auto-suggestion and they let it go at that. The name by which one calls this law is of little importance. The important fact about it is it works for the glory and success of mankind if it is used constructively, that is. On the other hand, if it is used destructively, 
it will destroy just as readily. In this statement may be found a very significant truth, namely that those who go down in defeat and end their lives in poverty, misery, and distress do so because of negative application of the principle of auto-suggestion. The cause may be found in the fact that all impulses of thought have a tendency to clothe themselves in their physical equivalent. The subconscious mind, which is the chemical laboratory in which all thought impulses are combined and made ready for translation into physical reality, makes no distinction between constructive and destructive thought impulses. It works with the material that we feed it through our thought impulses. The subconscious mind will translate into reality a thought driven by fear just as readily as it will translate into reality a thought driven by courage or faith. The pages of medical history are rich with illustrations of cases of suggestive suicide. A man may commit suicide through negative suggestion just as effectively as by any other means. In a Midwestern city, a man by the name of Joseph Grant, a bank official, borrowed a large sum of the bank's money without the consent of the directors. He lost the money through gambling. One afternoon, the bank examiner came and began to check the accounts. Grant left the bank, took a room in a local hotel, and when they found him three days later, he was lying in bed, wailing and moaning, repeating over and over these words, My God, this will kill me. I cannot stand the disgrace. In a short time, he was dead. The doctors pronounced the case one of mental suicide. Just as electricity will turn the wheels of industry and render useful service if used constructively, or snuff out life if wrongly used, so will the law of auto-suggestion lead you to peace and prosperity, or down into the valley of misery, failure, and death, according to your degree of understanding and application of it. If you fill your mind with fear, doubt, and unbelief in your ability to connect with and use the forces of infinite intelligence, the law of auto-suggestion will take that spirit of unbelief and use it as a pattern by which your subconscious mind will translate it into its physical equivalent. This statement is as true as the statement that two and two are four. Like the wind which carries one ship east and another west, the law of auto-suggestion will lift you up or pull you down according to the way you set your sails of thought. The law of auto-suggestion through which any person may rise to altitudes of achievement which stagger the imagination is well described in the following verse. If you think you are beaten, you are. If you think you dare not, you don't. If you like to win but you think you can't, it's almost certain you won't. If you think you'll lose, you're lost. For out of the world we find, success begins with a fellow's will. It's all in the state of mind. If you think you're outclassed, you are. You've got to think high to rise. You've got to be sure of yourself before you can ever win the prize. Life's battles don't always go to the stronger or faster man. But sooner or later, the man who wins is the man who thinks he can. Observe the words which have been emphasized, and you will catch the deep meaning which the poet had in mind. Somewhere in your makeup, perhaps in the cells of your brain, there lies sleeping the seed of achievement which, if aroused and put into action, would carry you to heights such as you may never have hoped to attain. Just as a master musician may cause the most beautiful strains of music to pour forth from the strings of a violin, so may you arouse the genius which lies asleep in your brain and cause it to drive you upward to whatever goal you may wish to achieve. Abraham Lincoln was a failure at everything he tried until he was well past the age of 40. He was a Mr. Nobody from nowhere until a great experience came into his life, aroused the sleeping genius within his heart and brain, and gave the world one of its really great men. That experience was mixed with the emotions of sorrow and love. It came to him through Anne Rutledge, the only woman whom Lincoln ever truly loved. It's a known fact that the emotion of love is closely akin to the state of mind known as faith, and this for the reason that love comes very near to translating one's thought impulses into their spiritual equivalent. During his work of research, the author discovered from the analysis of the life work and achievements of hundreds of men of outstanding accomplishment that there was the influence of a woman's love back of nearly every one of them. The emotion of love in the human heart and brain creates a favorable field of magnetic attraction, which causes an influx of the higher and finer vibrations which are afloat in the ether. If you wish evidence of the power of faith, study the achievements of men and women who have employed it. At the head of the list comes the Nazarene. Christianity is the greatest single force which influences the minds of men. The basis of Christianity is faith. 
no matter how many people have perverted or misinterpreted the meaning of this great force, and no matter how many dogmas and creeds have been created in its name which do not reflect its tenets. The sum and substance of the teachings and the achievements of Christ, which may have been interpreted as miracles, were nothing more nor less than faith. If there are any such phenomena as miracles, they are produced only through the state of mind known as faith. Some teachers of religion and many who call themselves Christians neither understand nor practice faith. Let us consider the power of faith as it is now being demonstrated by a man who is well known to all of civilization, Mahatma Gandhi of India. In this man the world has one of the most astounding examples known to civilization of the possibilities of faith. Gandhi wields more potential power than any man living at this time and this despite the fact that he has none of the orthodox tools of power such as money, battleships, soldiers, and materials of warfare. Gandhi has no money, he has no home, he does not own a suit of clothes, but he does have power. How does he come by that power? He created it out of his understanding of the principle of faith and through his ability to transplant that faith into the minds of 200 million people. Gandhi has accomplished through the influence of faith that which the strongest military power on earth could not and never will accomplish through soldiers and military equipment. He has accomplished the astounding feat of influencing 200 million minds to coalesce and move in unison as a single mind. What other force on earth, except faith, could do as much? There will come a day when employees, as well as employers, will discover the possibilities of faith. That day is dawning. The whole world has had ample opportunity during the recent business depression to witness what the lack of faith will do to business. Surely civilization has produced a sufficient number of intelligent human beings to make use of this great lesson which the depression has taught the world. During this depression the world had evidence in abundance that widespread fear will paralyze the wheels of industry and business. Out of this experience will arise leaders in business and industry who will profit by the example which Gandhi has set for the world, and they will apply to business the same tactics which he has used in building the greatest following known in the history of the world. These leaders will come from the rank and file of the unknown men who now labor in the steel plants or the coal mines, the automobile factories, and in the small towns and cities of America. Business is due for a reform. Make no mistake about this. The methods of the past, based upon economic combinations of force and fear, will be supplanted by the better principles of faith and cooperation. Men who labor will receive more than daily wages. They will receive dividends from the business, the same as those who supply the capital for business. But first, they must give more to their employers and stop this bickering and bargaining by force at the expense of the public. They must earn the right to dividends. Moreover, and this is the most important thing of all, they will be led by leaders who will understand and apply the principles employed by Mahatma Gandhi. Only in this way may leaders get from their followers the spirit of full cooperation, which constitutes power in its highest and most enduring form. This stupendous machine age in which we live and from which we are just emerging has taken the soul out of men. Its leaders have driven men as though they were pieces of cold machinery. They were forced to do so by the employees who have bargained at the expense of all concerned to get and not to give. The watchword of the future will be human happiness and contentment, and when this state of mind shall have been attained, the production will take care of itself more effectively than anything that has ever been accomplished where men did not and could not mix faith and individual interest with their labor. Because of the need for faith and cooperation in operating business and industry, it will be both interesting and profitable to analyze an event which provides an excellent understanding of the method by which industrialists and businessmen accumulate great fortunes by giving before they try to get. The event chosen for this illustration dates back to 1900 when the United States Steel Corporation was being formed. As you read the story, keep in mind these fundamental facts and you will understand how ideas have been converted into huge fortunes. First, the huge United States Steel Corporation was born in the mind of Charles M. Schwab in the form of an idea that he created through his imagination. Second, he mixed faith with his idea. Third, he formulated a plan for the transformation of his idea into physical and financial reality. Fourth, he put his plan into action with his famous speech at the university club. Fifth, 
He applied and followed through on his plan with persistence and backed it with firm decision until it had been fully carried out. Sixth, he prepared the way for success by a burning desire for success. If you're one of those who have often wondered how great fortunes are accumulated, the story of the creation of the United States Steel Corporation will be enlightening. If you have any doubt that men can think and grow rich, this story should dispel that doubt because you can plainly see in the story of the United States Steel the application of a major portion of the 13 principles described in this book. This astounding description of the power of an idea was dramatically told by John Lowell in the New York World Telegram with whose courtesy it is here reprinted. A pretty after-dinner speech for a billion dollars. When on the evening of December 12, 1900, some 80 of the nation's financial nobility gathered in the banquet hall of the University Club on Fifth Avenue to do honor to a young man from out of the West, not half a dozen of the guests realized they were to witness the most significant episode in American industrial history. J. Edward Simmons and Charles Stuart Smith, their hearts full of gratitude for the lavish hospitality bestowed on them by Charles M. Schwab during a recent visit to Pittsburgh, had arranged the dinner to introduce the 38-year-old steel man to Eastern Banking Society. But they did not expect him to stampede the convention. They warned him, in fact, that the bosoms within New York stuffed shirts would not be responsive to oratory, and that if he did not want to bore the still hands and the Harrimans and Vanderbilts, he'd better limit himself to 15 or 20 minutes of polite vaporings and then let it go at that. Even John Pierpont Morgan, sitting on the right hand of Schwab as became his imperial dignity, intended to grace the banquet table with his presence only briefly. And so far as the press and public were concerned, the whole affair was of so little moment that no mention of it found its way into print the next day. So the two hosts and their distinguished guests ate their way through the usual seven or eight courses. There was little conversation, and what there was of it was restrained. Few of the bankers and brokers had met Schwab, whose career had flowered along the banks of the Monongahela, and none knew him very well. But before the evening was over, they and with them Money Master Morgan were to be swept off their feet and a billion-dollar baby, the United States Steel Corporation, was to be conceived. It is perhaps unfortunate for the sake of history that no record of Charlie Schwab's speech at the dinner was ever made. He repeated some parts of it at a later date during a similar meeting of Chicago bankers, and still later when the government brought suit to dissolve the Steel Trust, he gave his own version from the witness stand of the remark. It is probable, however, that it was a homely speech, somewhat ungrammatical for the niceties of language never bothered Schwab, full of epigram and threaded with wit. But aside from that, it had a galvanic force and effect upon the five billions of estimated capital that was represented by the diners. After it was over and the gathering was still under its spell, although Schwab had talked for 90 minutes, Morgan led the orator to a recessed window where, dangling their legs from the high, uncomfortable seat, they talked for an hour or more. The magic of the Schwab personality had been turned on, full force, but what was more important and lasting was the full-fledged, clear-cut program he laid down for the aggrandizement of steel. Many other men had tried to interest Morgan in slapping together a steel trust after the pattern of the biscuit, wire, and hoop, sugar, rubber, whiskey, oil, or chewing gum combinations. John W. Gates, the gambler, had urged it, but Morgan distrusted him. The Moore boys, Bill and Jim, Chicago stock jobbers who had glued together a match trust and a cracker corporation, had urged it and failed. Albert H. Gary, the sanctimonious country lawyer, wanted to foster it, but he wasn't big enough to be impressive. Until Schwab's eloquence took J.P. Morgan to the heights from which he could visualize the solid results of the most daring financial undertaking ever conceived, the project was regarded as a delirious dream of easy money crackpots. The financial magnetism that began a generation ago to attract thousands of small and sometimes inefficiently managed companies into large and competition-crushing combinations had become operative in the steel world through the devices of that jovial business pirate, John W. Gates. Gates had already formed the American Steel and Wire Company out of a chain of small concerns, and together the National Tube and American Bridge Companies were two more Morgan concerns, and the Moore brothers had forsaken the match and cookie business to form the American Group, Tin Plate, Steel Hoop, Sheet Steel, and the National Steel Company. But by the side of Andrew Carnegie's gigantic vertical trust, a trust owned and operated by 53 partners, those other combinations were picayune. 
They might combine to their heart's content, but the whole lot of them could not make a dent in the Carnegie organization, and Morgan knew it. The eccentric old Scott knew it, too. From the magnificent heights of Skibo Castle, he had viewed first with amusement and then with resentment the attempts of Morgan's smaller companies to cut into his business. When the attempts became too bold, Carnegie's temper was translated into anger and retaliation. He decided to duplicate every mill owned by his rivals. Hitherto, he had not been interested in wire, pipe, hoops, or sheet. Instead, he was content to sell such companies the raw steel and let them work it into whatever shape they wanted. Now with Schwab as his chief and able lieutenant, he planned to drive his enemies to the wall. So it was in that speech of Charles M. Schwab, Morgan saw the answer to his problem of combination. A trust without Carnegie, giant of them all, would be no trust at all. A plum pudding, as one writer said, without the plums. Schwab's speech on the night of December 12, 1900, undoubtedly carried the inference, though not the pledge, that the vast Carnegie enterprise could be brought under the Morgan tent. He talked of the world future for steel, of reorganization for efficiency, of specialization, of the scrapping of unsuccessful mills, and the concentration of effort on the... F More than that, he told the buccaneers among them wherein lay the errors of their customary piracy. Their purposes, he inferred, had been to create monopolies, raise prices, and pay themselves fat dividends out of privilege. Schwab condemned the system in his hardiest manner. The short-sightedness of such a policy, he told his hearers, lay in the fact that it restricted the market in an era when everything cried for expansion. By cheapening the cost of steel, he argued, an ever-expanding market would be created, more uses for steel would be devised, and a goodly portion of the world trade could be captured. Actually, though, he did not know it, Schwab was an apostle of modern mass production. So the dinner at the university club came to an end. Morgan went home to think about Schwab's rosy predictions. Schwab went back to Pittsburgh to run the steel business for We Andre Carnegie, while Gary and the rest went back to their stock tickers to fiddle around in anticipation of the next move. It was not long coming. It took Morgan about one week to digest the feast of reason that Schwab had placed before him. When he had assured himself that no financial indigestion was to result, he sent for Schwab and found that the young man rather coy. Mr. Carnegie, Schwab indicated, might not like it if he found his trusted company president had been flirting with the Emperor of Wall Street, the street upon which Carnegie was resolved never to tread. Then it was suggested by John W. Gates, the go-between, that if Schwab happened to be in the Bellevue Hotel in Philadelphia, J.P. Morgan might also happen to be there. When Schwab arrived, however, Morgan was inconveniently ill at his New York home, and so on the elder man's pressing invitation, Schwab went to New York and presented himself at the door of the financier's library. Now, certain economic historians have professed the belief that from the beginning to the end of the drama, the stage was set by Andrew Carnegie, that the dinner to Schwab, the famous speech, the Sunday night conference between Schwab and the Money King were events arranged by the canny Scott. But the truth is exactly the opposite. When Schwab was called in to consummate the deal, he didn't even know whether the little boss, as Andrew was called, would so much as listen to an offer to sell, particularly to a group of men whom Andrew regarded as being endowed with something less than holiness. But Schwab did take into the conference with him, in his own handwriting, six sheets of copper plate figures, representing to his mind the physical worth and the potential earning capacity of every steel company he regarded as an essential star in the new metal firmament. Four men pondered over these figures all night. The chief, of course, was Morgan, steadfast in his belief in the divine right of money. With him was his aristocratic partner, Robert Bacon, a scholar and a gentleman. The third was John W. Gates, whom Morgan scorned as a gambler and used as a tool. The fourth was Schwab, who knew more about the processes of making and selling steel than any whole group of men then living. Throughout that conference, the Pittsburghers' figures were never questioned. If he said a company was worth so much, then it was worth that much and no more. He was insistent, too, upon including in the combination only those concerns he nominated. He had conceived a corporation in which there would be no duplication, not even to satisfy the greed of friends who wanted to unload their companies upon the broad Morgan shoulders. This he left out by design. A number of the larger concerns upon the walruses and carpenters of Wall Street had cast hungry eyes. When dawn finally came, Morgan rose and straightened his back. Only one question remained. Do you think you can persuade Andrew Carnegie to sell? he asked. I can try, said Schwab. 
If you get him to sell, I will undertake the matter, said Morgan. So far so good, but would Carnegie sell? How much would he demand? Schwab thought about $320 million. What would he take payment in? Common or preferred stocks? Bonds? Cash? Nobody could raise a third of a billion dollars in cash. There was a golf game in January on the frost-cracking heath of the St. Andrews Links in Westchester, with Andrew bundled up in sweaters against the cold and Charlie talking volubly as usual to keep his spirits up. But no word of business was mentioned until the pair sat down in the cozy warmth of the Carnegie Cottage hard by. Then, with the same persuasiveness that had hypnotized 80 millionaires at the university club, Schwab poured out the glittering promises of retirement in comfort, of untold millions to satisfy the old man's social caprices. Carnegie capitulated, wrote a figure on a slip of paper, handed it to Schwab, and said, All right, that's what we'll sell it for. The figure was approximately $400 million and was reached by taking the $320 million mentioned by Schwab as a basic figure and adding to it $80 million to represent the increased capital value over the previous two years. Later on the deck of a transatlantic liner, the Scotsman said ruefully to Morgan, I wish I had asked you for $100 million more. If you'd have asked for it, you'd have gotten it, Morgan told him cheerfully. There was an uproar, of course. A British correspondent cabled that the foreign steel world was appalled by the gigantic combination. President Hadley of Yale declared that unless trusts were regulated, the country might expect an emperor in Washington within the next 25 years. But that able stock manipulator Keene went at his work of shoving the new stock at the public, and he was so vigorous that all the excess water estimated by some nearly at $600 million was absorbed in a twinkling. So Carnegie has his millions, and the Morgan Syndicate had $62 million for all its trouble, and the boys from Gates to Gary had their millions. The 38-year-old Schwab had his reward. He was made president of the new corporation and remained in control until 1930. The dramatic story of big business which you have just finished was included in this book because it's a perfect illustration of the method by which desire can be transmuted into its physical equivalent. I imagine some readers will question the statement that a mere intangible desire can be converted into its physical equivalent. Doubtless some will say, you cannot convert nothing into something. The answer is in the story of the United States Steel Corporation. That giant organization was created in the mind of one man. The plan by which the organization was provided with the steel mills that gave it financial stability was created in the mind of the same man. His faith, his desire, his imagination, his persistence were the real ingredients that went into United States Steel. The steel mills and mechanical equipment acquired by the corporation after it had been brought into legal existence were incidental. But careful analysis will disclose the fact that the appraised value of the properties acquired by the corporation increased in value by an estimated $600 million by the mere transaction, which consolidated them under one management. In other words, Charles M. Schwab's idea, plus the faith with which he conveyed it to the minds of J.P. Morgan and the others, was marketed for a profit of approximately $600 million. Not an insignificant sum for a single idea. What happened to some of the men who took their share of the millions of dollars of profit made by this transaction is a matter with which we are not now concerned. The important feature of the astounding achievement is that it serves as unquestionable evidence of the soundness of the philosophy described in this book, because this philosophy was the warp and the woof of the entire transaction. Moreover, the practicability of the philosophy has been established by the fact that the United States Steel Corporation prospered and became one of the richest and most powerful corporations in America, employing thousands of people, developing new uses for steel and opening new markets, thus proving that the $600 million in profit which the Schwab idea produced was earned. Riches begin in the form of thought. The amount is limited only by the persons in whose mind the thought is put into motion. Faith removes limitations. Remember this when you're ready to bargain with life for whatever it is that you ask as your price for having passed this way. Remember also that the man who created the United States Steel Corporation was practically unknown at the time. He was merely Andrew Carnegie's Man Friday until he gave birth to his famous idea. After that, he quickly rose to a positive position of power, fame, and riches. There are no limitations to the mind except those we acknowledge. Both poverty and riches are the offspring of thought. Chapter 4 Auto-suggestion, the medium for influencing the subconscious mind. 
the third step toward riches. Autosuggestion is a term which applies to all suggestions and all self-administered stimuli, which reaches one's mind through the five senses. Stated in another way, autosuggestion is self-suggestion. It's the agency of communication between that part of the mind where conscious thought takes place and that which serves as the seat of action for the subconscious mind. Through the dominating thoughts which one permits to remain in the conscious mind, whether these thoughts be negative or positive is immaterial, the principle of autosuggestion voluntarily reaches the subconscious mind and influences it with these thoughts. No thought, whether it be negative or positive, can enter the subconscious mind without the aid of the principle of autosuggestion, with the exception of thoughts picked up from the ether. Stated differently, all sense impressions which are perceived through the five senses are stopped by the conscious thinking mind and may be either passed on to the subconscious or rejected at will. The conscious faculty serves, therefore, as an outer guard to the approach of the subconscious. Nature has so built man that he has absolute control over the material which reaches his subconscious mind through his five senses, although this is not meant to be construed as a statement that man always exercises this control. In the great majority of instances, he does not exercise it, which explains why so many people go through life in poverty. Recall what has been said about the subconscious mind resembling a fertile garden spot in which weeds will grow in abundance if the seeds of more desirable crops are not sown therein. Autosuggestion is the agency of control through which an individual may voluntarily feed his subconscious mind on thoughts of a creative nature or by neglect permit thoughts of a destructive nature to find their way into this rich garden of the mind. You were instructed in the last of the six steps described in the chapter on desire to read aloud twice daily the written statement of your desire for money and to see and feel yourself already in possession of that money. By following these instructions, you communicate the object of your desire directly to your subconscious mind in a spirit of absolute faith. Through repetition of this procedure, you voluntarily create thought habits which are favorable to your efforts to transmute desire into its monetary equivalent. Go back to these six steps described in Chapter 2 and read them again very carefully before you proceed further. Then, when you come to it, read very carefully the four instructions for the organization of your mastermind group described in the chapter on organized planning. By comparing these two sets of instructions with that which has been stated on auto-suggestion, you, of course, will see that the instructions involve the application of the principle of auto-suggestion. Remember, therefore, when reading aloud the statement of your desire, through which you are endeavoring to develop a money consciousness, that the mere reading of the words is of no consequence unless you mix emotion or feeling with your words. If you repeat a million times the famous Emil Coye formula, Day by day, in every way, I am getting better and better. Without mixing emotion and faith with your words, you will experience no desirable results. Your subconscious mind recognizes and acts only upon thoughts which have been well mixed with emotion or feeling. This is a fact of such importance as to warrant repetition in practically every chapter, because the lack of understanding of this is the main reason the majority of people who try to apply the principle of autosuggestion get no desirable results. Plain, unemotional words do not influence the subconscious mind. You'll get no appreciable results until you learn to reach your subconscious mind with thoughts or spoken words which have been well emotionalized with belief. Do not become discouraged if you cannot control and direct your emotions the first time you try to do so. Remember there's no such possibility as something for nothing. Ability to reach and influence your subconscious mind has its price, and you must pay that price. You cannot cheat, even if you desire to do so. The price of ability to influence your subconscious mind is everlasting. Persistence in applying the principle describes here. You cannot develop the desired ability for a lower price. You and you alone must decide whether or not the reward for which you are striving, that's the money consciousness, is worth the price you must pay for it in effort. Wisdom and cleverness alone will not attract and retain money except in a very few rare instances where the law of averages favors the attraction of money through these sources. The method of attracting money described here does not depend upon the law of averages. Moreover, the method plays no favorites. It will work for one person as effectively as it will for another. 
Where failure is experienced, it is the individual, not the method, which has failed. If you try and fail, make another effort, and still another, and another, until you succeed. Your ability to use the principle of auto-suggestion will depend very largely upon your capacity to concentrate upon a given desire until that desire becomes a burning obsession. When you begin to carry out the instructions in connection with the six steps described in the second chapter, it will be necessary for you to make use of the principle of concentration. Let us here offer suggestions for the effective use of concentration. When you begin to carry out the first of the six steps, which instructs you to fix in your own mind the exact amount of money you desire, hold your thoughts on that amount of money by concentration or fixation of attention with your eyes closed until you can actually see the physical appearance of the money. Do this at least once each day. As you go through these exercises, follow the instructions given in the chapter on faith and see yourself actually in possession of the money. Here is a most significant fact. The subconscious mind takes any orders given it in a spirit of absolute faith, and it acts upon those orders, although the orders often have to be presented over and over again through repetition before they are interpreted by the subconscious mind. Following the preceding statement, consider the possibility of playing a perfectly legitimate trick on your subconscious mind by making it believe that the money is already awaiting your claim, that the subconscious mind must hand over to you practical plans for acquiring the money which is yours. Hand over the thought suggested in the preceding paragraph to your imagination and see what your imagination can or will do to create practical plans for the accumulation of money through transmutation of your desire. Don't wait for a definite plan through which you intend to exchange services or merchandise in return for the money that you are visualizing, but begin at once to see yourself in possession of the money, demanding and expecting, meanwhile, that your subconscious mind will hand over the plan or plans you need. Be on the alert for these plans, and when they appear, put them into action immediately. When the plans appear, they will probably flash into your mind through the sixth sense in the form of an inspiration. This inspiration may be considered a direct telegram or a message from infinite intelligence. Treat it with respect and act upon it as soon as you receive it. Failure to do this will be fatal to your success. In the fourth of six steps, you are instructed to create a definite plan for carrying out your desire and begin at once to put this plan into action. You should follow this instruction in the manner described in the preceding paragraph. Do not trust to your reason when creating your plan for accumulating money through the transmutation of desire. Your reason is faulty. Moreover, your reasoning faculty may be lazy, and if you depend entirely upon it to serve you, it may disappoint you. When visualizing the money you intend to accumulate with closed eyes, see yourself rendering the service or delivering the merchandise you intend to give in return for this money. This is important. The fact that you're reading this book is an indication that you earnestly seek knowledge. It is also an indication that you're a student of this subject. If you're only a student, there is a chance that you may learn much that you did not know, but you will learn only by assuming an attitude of humility. If you choose to follow some of the instructions but neglect or refuse to follow others, you're going to fail. To get satisfactory results, you must follow all instructions in a spirit of faith. The instructions given in connection with the six steps in the second chapter will now be summarized and blended with the principles covered by this chapter as follows. First, go into some quiet spot, preferably in bed at night, where you won't be disturbed or interrupted. Close your eyes and repeat aloud, so you may hear your own words, the written statement of the amount of money you intend to accumulate, the time limit for its accumulation, and a description of the service or merchandise that you intend to give in return for the money. As you carry out these instructions, see yourself already in possession of the money. For example, suppose that you intend to accumulate $50,000 by the 1st of January, five years hence, that you intend to give personal services in return for the money in the capacity of a salesman. Your written statement of your purpose should be similar to the following. By the first day of January 19th, I will have in my possession $50,000, which will come to me in various amounts from time to time during the interim. In return for this money, I will give the most efficient service of which I am capable, rendering the fullest possible quantity and the best possible quality of service in the capacity of salesman of describe the service or merchandise that you intend to sell. 
I believe that I will have this money in my possession. My faith is so strong that I can now see this money before my eyes. I can touch it with my hands. It is now awaiting transfer to me at the time, and in the proportion that I deliver the service, I intend to render in return for it. I am awaiting a plan by which to accumulate this money, and I will follow that plan when it is received. Second, repeat this program night and morning until you can see in your imagination the money that you intend to accumulate. Third, place a written copy of your statement where you can see it night and morning and read it just before retiring and again upon arising until it's been memorized. Remember as you carry out these instructions that you are applying the principle of auto-suggestion for the purpose of giving orders to your subconscious mind. Remember also that your subconscious mind will act only upon instructions which are emotionalized and handed over to it with feeling. Faith is the strongest and most productive of the emotions. Follow the instructions given in the chapter on faith. These instructions may at first seem abstract. Don't let this disturb you. Follow the instructions no matter how abstract or impractical they may at first appear to be. The time will soon come if you do as you've been instructed, in spirit as well as in act, when a whole new universe of power will unfold to you. Skepticism in connection with all new ideas is characteristic of all human beings. But if you follow the instructions outlined, your skepticism will soon be replaced by belief, and this, in turn, will soon become crystallized into absolute faith. Then you will have arrived at the point where you may truly say, I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. Many philosophers have made the statement that man is the master of his own earthly destiny. But most of them have failed to say why he is the master. The reason that man may be the master of his own earthly status, and especially his financial status, is thoroughly explained in this chapter. Man may become the master of himself and of his environment because he has the power to influence his own subconscious mind, and through it, gain the cooperation of infinite intelligence. You're now reading the chapter which represents the keystone to the arch of this philosophy. The instructions contained in this chapter must be understood and applied with persistence if you succeed in transmuting desire into money. The actual performance of transmuting desire into money involves the use of auto-suggestion as an agency by which one may reach and influence the subconscious mind. The other principles are simply tools with which to apply auto-suggestion. Keep this thought in mind, and you will at times be conscious of the important part of the principle of auto-suggestion. It's to play in your efforts to accumulate money through the methods described in this book. Carry out these instructions as though you were a small child. Inject into your efforts something of the faith of a child. The author has been most careful to see that no impractical instructions were included because of his sincere desire to be helpful. After you have read the entire book, come back to this chapter and follow in spirit and in action this instruction. Read the entire chapter aloud once every night until you become thoroughly convinced that the principle of auto-suggestion is sound, that it will accomplish for you all that has been claimed for it. As you read, underscore with a pencil every sentence which impresses you favorably. Follow the foregoing instruction to the letter and it will open the way for a complete understanding and mastery of the principles of success. Chapter 5. Specialized Knowledge, Personal Experiences or Observations. The fourth step toward riches. There are two kinds of knowledge. One is general, the other is specialized. General knowledge, no matter how great in quantity or variety it may be, is of but little use in the accumulation of money. The faculties of the great universities possess in the aggregate practically every form of general knowledge known to civilization. Most of the professors have but little or no money. They specialize on teaching knowledge, but they do not specialize on the organization or the use of knowledge. Knowledge will not attract money unless it is organized and intelligently directed through practical plans of action to the definite end of accumulation of money. Lack of understanding of this fact has been the source of confusion to millions of people who falsely believe that knowledge is power. It is nothing of the sort. Knowledge is only potential power. It becomes power only when and if it is organized into definite plans of action and directed to a definite end. This missing link in all systems of education known to civilization today may be found in the failure of educational institutions 
to teach their students how to organize and use knowledge after they acquire it. Many people make the mistake of assuming that because Henry Ford had but little schooling, he is not a man of education. Those who make this mistake don't know Henry Ford, nor do they understand the real meaning of the word educate. That word is derived from the Latin word educo, meaning to educe, to draw out, to develop from within. An educated man is not necessarily one who has an abundance of general or specialized knowledge. An educated man is one who has so developed the faculties of his mind that he may acquire anything he wants or its equivalent without violating the rights of others. Henry Ford comes well within the meaning of this definition. During the World War, a Chicago newspaper published certain editorials in which, among other statements, Henry Ford was called an ignorant pacifist. Mr. Ford objected to those statements and brought suit against the paper for libeling him. When the suit was tried in the courts, the attorneys for the paper pleaded justification and placed Mr. Ford himself on the witness stand for the purpose of proving to the jury that he was ignorant. The attorneys asked Mr. Ford a great variety of questions, all of them intended to prove by his own evidence that while he might possess considerable specialized knowledge pertaining to the manufacturing of automobiles, he was, in the main, ignorant. Mr. Ford was plied with such questions as the following. Who was Benedict Arnold? And how many soldiers did the British send over to America to put down the rebellion of 1776? In answer to the last question, Mr. Ford replied, I do not know the exact number of soldiers the British sent over, but I have heard that it was a considerably larger number than ever went back. Finally, Mr. Ford became tired of this line of questioning, and in reply to a particularly offensive question, he leaned over, pointed his finger at the lawyer who had asked the question, and said, If I should really want to answer the foolish question you've just asked, or any of the other questions you've been asking me, let me remind you that I have a row of electric push buttons on my desk, and by pushing the right button I can summon to my aid men who can answer any question I desire to ask concerning the business to which I am devoting most of my efforts. Now will you kindly tell me why I should clutter up my mind with general knowledge for the purpose of being able to answer questions when I have men around me who can supply any knowledge I require? Well, there certainly was good logic to that reply. That answer floored the lawyer. Every person in the courtroom realized it was the answer not of an ignorant man, but of a man of education. Any man is educated who knows where to get knowledge when he needs it, and how to organize that knowledge into definite plans of action. Through the assistance of his mastermind group, Henry Ford had at his command all of the specialized knowledge he needed to enable him to become one of the wealthiest men in America. It wasn't essential that he have this knowledge in his own mind. Surely no person who has sufficient inclination and intelligence to read a book of this nature can possibly miss the significance of this illustration. Before you can be sure of your ability to transmute desire into its monetary equivalent, you will require specialized knowledge of the service, merchandise, or profession which you intend to offer in return for fortune. Perhaps you may need much more specialized knowledge than you have the ability or the inclination to acquire, and if this should be true, you may bridge your weakness through the aid of your mastermind group. Andrew Carnegie stated that he personally knew nothing about the technical end of the steel business. Moreover, he did not particularly care to know anything about it. The specialized knowledge which he required for the manufacture and marketing of steel he found available through the individual units of his mastermind group. The accumulation of great fortune calls for power, and power is acquired through highly organized and intelligently directed specialized knowledge, but that knowledge does not necessarily have to be in the possession of the man who accumulates the fortune. The preceding paragraph should give hope and encouragement to the man with ambition to accumulate a fortune who has not possessed himself of the necessary education to supply such specialized knowledge as he may require. Men sometimes go through life suffering from inferiority complexes because they are not men of education. The man who can organize and direct a mastermind group of men who possess knowledge useful in the accumulation of money is just as much a man of education as any man in the group. Remember this, if you suffer from a feeling of inferiority because your schooling has been limited. Thomas A. Edison had only three months of schooling during his entire life. He did not lack education, neither did he die poor. Henry Ford had less than a sixth grade schooling, but he's managed to do pretty well by himself financially. 
Specialized knowledge is among the most plentiful and the cheapest forms of service which may be had. If you doubt this, consult the payroll of any university. First of all, decide the sort of specialized knowledge that you require and the purpose for which it is needed. To a large extent, your major purpose in life, the goal toward which you are working will help determine what knowledge you need. With this question settled, your next move requires that you have accurate information concerning dependable sources of knowledge. The more important of these are a. One's own experience and education. b. Experience and education available through cooperation of others. That's your mastermind alliance. c. Colleges and universities. d. Public libraries through books and periodicals in which may be found all of the knowledge organized by civilization. and e. Special training courses through night schools and home study schools in particular. As knowledge is acquired, it must be organized and put into use for a definite purpose through practical plans. Knowledge has no value except that which can be gained from its application toward some worthy end. This is one reason why college degrees are not valued more highly. They represent nothing but miscellaneous knowledge. If you contemplate taking additional schooling, first determine the purpose for which you want the knowledge that you're seeking, then learn where this particular sort of knowledge can be obtained from reliable sources. Successful men in all callings never stop acquiring specialized knowledge related to their major purpose, business, or profession. Those who are not successful usually make the mistake of believing that the knowledge acquiring period ends when one finishes school. The truth is that schooling does but little more than to put one in the way of learning how to acquire practical knowledge. With this changed world which began at the end of the economic collapse came also astounding changes in educational requirements. The order of the day is specialization. This truth was emphasized by Robert P. Moore, Secretary of Appointments of Columbia University. Specialists most sought after. Particularly sought after by employing companies are candidates who have specialized in some field business school graduates with training in accounting and statistics, engineers of all varieties, journalists, architects, chemists, and also outstanding leaders and activity men of the senior class. The man who has been active on the campus, whose personality is such that he gets along with all kinds of people and who has done an adequate job with his studies, has a most decided edge over the strictly academic student. Some of these, because of their all-around qualifications, have received several offers of positions, a few of them as many as six. In departing from the conception that the straight-A student was invariably the one to get the choice of the better jobs, Mr. Moore said that most companies look not only to academic records, but to activity records and personalities of the students. One of the largest industrial companies, the leader in its field, in writing to Mr. Moore concerning prospective seniors at the college said, we are interested primarily in finding men who can make exceptional progress in management work. For this reason, we emphasize qualities of character, intelligence, and personality far more than specific educational background. Proposing a system of apprenticing students in offices, stores, and industrial occupations during the summer vacation, Mr. Moore asserts that after the first two or three years of college, every student should be asked to choose a definite future course and to call a halt if he has been merely pleasantly drifting without purpose through an unspecialized academic curriculum. Colleges and universities must face the practical consideration that all professions and occupations now demand specialists. He said urging that educational institutions accept more direct responsibility for vocational guidance. One of the most reliable and practical sources of knowledge available to those who need specialized schooling is the night schools operated in most large cities. The correspondent schools give specialized training anywhere in the United States where the mail goes on all subjects that can be taught by the extension method. One advantage of home study training is the flexibility of the study program, which permits one to study during spare time. Another stupendous advantage of home study training, if the school is carefully chosen, is the fact that most courses offered by home study schools carry with them generous privileges of consultation, which can be of priceless value to those needing specialized knowledge no matter where you live you can share the benefits anything acquired without effort and without cost is generally unappreciated often discredited perhaps this is why we get so little from our marvelous opportunity in public schools 
The self-discipline one receives from a definite program of specialized study makes up to some extent for the wasted opportunity when knowledge was available without cost. Correspondence schools are highly organized business institutions. Their tuition fees are so low that they are forced to insist upon prompt payments. Being asked to pay whether the student makes good grades or poor has the effect of causing one to follow through with the course when he would otherwise drop it. The correspondence schools have not stressed this point sufficiently, for the truth is that their collection departments constitute the very finest sort of training on decision promptness, action, and the habit of finishing that which one begins. I learned this from experience more than 25 years ago. I enrolled for a home study course in advertising. After completing eight or ten lessons, I stopped studying, but the school did not stop sending me bills. Moreover, it insisted upon payment whether I kept up my studies or not. I decided that if I had to pay for the course, which I had legally obligated myself to do, I should complete the lessons and get my money's worth. I felt at the time that the collection system of the school was somewhat too well organized, but I learned later in life that it was a valuable part of my training for which no charge had been made. Being forced to pay, I went ahead and completed the course. Later in life, I discovered that the efficient collection system of that school had been worth much in the form of money earned because of the training and advertising I had so reluctantly taken. We have in this country what is said to be the greatest public school system in the world. We've invested fabulous sums for fine buildings. We've provided convenient transportation for children living in the rural districts so they may attend the best schools. But there is one astounding weakness to this marvelous system. It's free. One of the strange things about human beings is that they value only that which has a price. The free schools of America and the free public libraries do not impress people because they are free. This is the major reason why so many people find it necessary to acquire additional training after they quit school and go to work. It's also one of the major reasons why employers give greater consideration to employees who take home study courses. They have learned from experience that any person who has the ambition to give up a part of his spare time to studying at home has in him those qualities which make for him leadership. This recognition is not a charitable gesture. It is just sound business judgment upon the part of the employers. There is one weakness in people for which there is no remedy. It's the universal weakness of lack of ambition. Persons, especially salaried people, who schedule their spare time to provide for home study seldom remain at the bottom very long. Their action opens the way for the upward climb, removes many obstacles from their path, and gains the friendly interest of those who have the power to put them in the way of opportunity. The home study method of training is especially suited to the needs of employed people who find after leaving school that they must acquire additional specialized knowledge but cannot spare the time to go back to school. The changed economic conditions prevailing since the Depression have made it necessary for thousands of people to find additional or new sources of income. For the majority of these, the solution to their problem may be found only by acquiring specialized knowledge. Many will be forced to change their occupations entirely. When a merchant finds that a certain line of merchandise is not selling, he usually supplants it with another that is in demand. The person whose business is that of marketing personal services must also be an efficient merchant. If his services do not bring adequate returns in one occupation, he must change to another where broader opportunities are available. Stuart Austin Weir prepared himself as a construction engineer and followed this line of work until the depression limited his market to where it did not give him the income that he required. He took inventory of himself, decided to change his profession to law. He went back to school and took special courses by which he prepared himself as a corporation lawyer. Despite the fact the depression had not ended, he completed his training, passed the bar examination, and quickly built a lucrative law practice in Dallas, Texas. In fact, he is turning away clients. Just to keep the record straight and to anticipate the alibis of those who will say, I couldn't go to school because I have a family to support, or I'm too old, I will add the information that Mr. Weir was past 40 and married when he went back to school. Moreover, by carefully selecting highly specialized courses in colleges best prepared to teach the subjects chosen, Mr. Weir completed in two years the work for which the majority of law students require four years. It pays to know how to purchase knowledge. 
The person who stops studying merely because he's finished school is forever hopelessly doomed to mediocrity, no matter what may be his calling. The way of success is the way of continuous pursuit of knowledge. Let's consider a specific instance. During the Depression, a salesman in a grocery store found himself without a position. Having had some bookkeeping experience, he took a special course in accounting. He familiarized himself with all the latest bookkeeping and office equipment and went into business for himself. Starting with the grocer for whom he had formerly worked, he made contracts with more than a hundred small merchants to keep their books at a very nominal monthly fee. His idea was so practical that he soon found it necessary to set up a portable office in a light delivery truck, which he equipped with modern bookkeeping machinery. He now has a fleet of these bookkeeping offices on wheels, and he employs a large staff of assistants, thus providing small merchants with accounting services equal to the best that money can buy at a very nominal cost. Specialized knowledge plus imagination were the ingredients that went into this unique and successful business. Last year, the owner of that business paid an income tax of almost 10 times as much as he was paid by the merchant for whom he worked when the Depression forced upon him a temporary adversity, which proved to be a blessing in disguise. The beginning of this successful business was an idea. Inasmuch as I had the privilege of supplying the unemployed salesman with that idea, I now assume the further privilege of suggesting another idea, which has within it the possibility of even greater income. Also the possibility of rendering useful service to thousands of people who badly need that service. The idea was suggested by the salesman who gave up selling and went into the business of keeping books on a wholesale basis. When the plan was suggested as a solution of his unemployment problem, he quickly exclaimed, I like the idea, but I would not know how to turn it into cash. In other words, he complained he would not know how to market his bookkeeping knowledge after he acquired it. So that brought up another problem which had to be solved. With the aid of a young woman typist, clever at hand lettering, and who could put the story together, a very attractive book was prepared describing the advantages of the new system of bookkeeping. The pages were neatly typed and pasted in an ordinary scrapbook which was used as a silent salesman with which the story of this new business was so effectively told that its owner soon had more accounts than he could handle. There are thousands of people all over the country who need the services of a merchandising specialist capable of preparing an attractive brief for use in marketing personal services. The aggregate annual income from such a service might easily exceed that received by the largest employment agency and the benefits of the service might be made far greater to the purchaser than any to be obtained from an employment agency. The idea here described was born of necessity to bridge an emergency which had to be covered but it did not stop by merely serving one person. The woman who created the idea has a keen imagination. She saw in her newly born brainchild the making of a new profession, one that is destined to render valuable service to thousands of people who need practical guidance in marketing personal services. Spurred to action by the instantaneous success of her first prepared plan to market personal services, this energetic woman turned next to the solution of a similar problem for her son who had just finished college but he had been totally unable to find a market for his services. The plan that she originated for his use was the finest specimen of merchandising of personal services that I have ever seen. When the plan book had been completed it contained nearly 50 pages of beautifully typed properly organized information telling the story of her son's native ability, schooling, personal experiences, and a great variety of other information too extensive for description. The plan book also contained a complete description of the position her son desired, together with a marvelous word picture of the exact plan that he would use in filling the position. The preparation of the plan book required several weeks labor, during which time its creator sent her son to the public library almost daily to procure data needed in selling his services to best advantage. She sent him also to all the competitors of his prospective employer and gathered from them vital information concerning their business methods, which was of great value in the formation of the plan that he intended to use in filling the position that he sought. When the plan had been finished, it contained more than half a dozen very fine suggestions for the use and benefit of the prospective employer. The suggestions were put into use by the company. One may be inclined to ask, why go to all this trouble to secure a job? The answer is straight to the point. Also, it is dramatic because it deals with a subject which assumes the proportion of a tragedy 
with millions of men and women whose sole source of income is personal services? The answer is, doing a thing well never is trouble. The plan prepared by this woman for the benefit of her son helped him get the job for which he applied, at the first interview and at a salary fixed by himself. Moreover, and this too is important, the position did not require the young man to start at the bottom. He began as a junior executive at an executive's salary. Why go to all this trouble? Do you ask me that? Well, for one thing, the planned presentation of this young man's application for a position clipped off no less than 10 years of time that he would have required to get to where he began had he started at the bottom and worked his way up. The idea of starting at the bottom and working one's way up may appear to be sound, but the major objection to it is this. Too many of those who begin at the bottom never manage to lift their heads high enough to be seen by opportunity, so they remain at the bottom. It should be remembered also that the outlook from the bottom is not so very bright or encouraging. It has a tendency to kill off ambition. We call it getting into a rut, which means that we accept our fate because we form the habit of daily routine, a habit that finally becomes so strong we cease to try to throw it off. And that's another reason why it pays to start one or two steps above the bottom. By so doing, one forms the habit of looking around, of observing how others get ahead, of seeing opportunity, and of embracing it without hesitation. Dan Halpin is a splendid example of what I mean. During his college days, he was a manager of the famous 1930 National Championship Notre Dame football team when it was under the direction of the late Knut Rockne. Perhaps he was inspired by the great football coach to aim high and not mistake temporary defeat for failure, just as Andrew Carnegie, the great industrial leader, inspired his young business lieutenants to set high goals for themselves. At any rate, young Halpin finished college at a mighty unfavorable time when the Depression had made jobs very scarce. So after a fling at investment banking and motion pictures, he took the first opening with a potential future he could find selling electrical hearing aids on a commission basis. Anyone could start in that sort of a job, and Halpin knew it, but it was enough to open the door of opportunity to him. For almost two years, he continued in a job not to his liking, and he would never have risen above that job if he had not done something about his dissatisfaction. He aimed first at the job of assistant sales manager of his company, and he got the job. That one step upward placed him high enough above the crowd to enable him to see still greater opportunity. Also, it placed him where opportunity could see him. He made such a fine record selling hearing aids that A.M. Andrews, chairman of the board of the Dictograph Products Company, a business competitor of the company for which Halpin worked, wanted to know something about that man, Dan Halpin, who was taking big sales away from the long-established Dictograph Company. He sent for Halpin. When the interview was over, Halpin was the new sales manager in charge of Acousticon Division. Then to test young Halpin's mettle, Mr. Andrews went away to Florida for three months, leaving him to sink or swim in his new job. He did not sink. Rockney's spirit of all the world loves a winner and has no time for a loser inspired him to put so much into his job that he was recently elected vice president of the company and general manager of the Acousticon and Silent Radio Division, a job which most men would be proud to earn through ten years of loyal effort. Halpin turned the trick in little more than six months. It's difficult to say whether Mr. Andrews or Mr. Halpin is more deserving of eulogy for the reason that both showed evidence of having an abundance of that very rare quality known as imagination. Mr. Andrews deserves credit for seeing in young Halpin a go-getter of the highest order. Halpin deserves credit for refusing to compromise with life by accepting and keeping a job he did not want. That's one of the major points that I'm trying to emphasize through this entire philosophy, that we rise to high positions or remain at the bottom because of conditions we can control if we desire to control them. I'm also trying to emphasize another point, namely that both success and failure are largely the result of habit. I have not the slightest doubt that Dan Halpin's close association with the great football coach planted in his mind the same brand of desire to excel which made the Notre Dame football team world famous. Now truly there's something to the idea that hero worship is helpful, provided one worships a winner. Halpin tells me that Rockne was one of the world's greatest leaders of men in all history. My belief is in the theory that business associations are vital factors, 
both in failure and in success, and it was recently demonstrated when my son Blair was negotiating with Dan Halpin for a position. Mr. Halpin offered him a beginning salary of about one-half what he could have gotten from a rival company. I brought parental pressure to bear and induced him to accept the place with Mr. Halpin because I believe that close association with one who refuses to compromise with circumstances he does not like is an asset that can never be measured in terms of money. The bottom is a monotonous, dreary, unprofitable place for any person. That's why I've taken the time to describe how lowly beginnings may be circumvented by proper planning. Also, that is why so much space has been devoted to a description of this new profession, created by a woman who was inspired to do a fine job of planning because she wanted her son to have a favorable break. With the changed conditions ushered in by the world economic collapse, came also the need for newer and better ways of marketing personal services. It's hard to determine why someone had not previously discovered this stupendous need in view of the fact that more money changes hands in return for personal services than for any other purpose. The sum paid out monthly to people who work for wages and salaries is so huge that it runs into hundreds of millions and the annual distribution amounts to billions. Perhaps some will find in the idea here, briefly described, the nucleus of the riches they desire. Ideas with much less merit have been the seedlings from which great fortunes have grown. Woolworth's five and ten cent store idea, for example, had far less merit, but it piled up a fortune for its creator. Those seeing opportunity lurking in this suggestion will find valuable aid in the chapter on organized planning. Incidentally, an efficient merchandiser of personal services would find a growing demand for his services wherever there are men and women who seek better markets for their services. By applying the mastermind principle, a few people with suitable talent could form an alliance and have a paying business very quickly. One would need to be a fair writer with a flair for advertising and selling, one handy at typing and hand lettering, and one should be a first-class business getter who would let the world know all about the service. If one person possessed all of these abilities, he might carry on the business alone until it outgrew him. The woman who prepared the personal service sales plan for her son now receives requests from all parts of the country for her cooperation in preparing similar plans for others who desire to market their personal services for more money. She has a staff of expert typists, artists, and writers who have the ability to dramatize the case history so effectively that one's personal services can be marketed for much more money than the prevailing wages for similar services. She is so confident of her ability that she accepts as the major portion of her fee a percentage of the increased pay she helps her clients to earn. It must not be supposed that her plan merely consists of clever salesmanship by which she helps men and women to demand and receive more money for the same services they formerly sold for less pay. She looks after the interests of the purchaser as well as the seller of personal services and so prepares her plans that the employer receives full value for the additional money that he pays. The method by which she accomplishes this astonishing result is a professional secret which she discloses to no one excepting her own clients. If you have the imagination and seek a more profitable outlet for your personal services, this suggestion may be the stimulus for which you've been searching. The idea is capable of yielding an income far greater than that of the average doctor, lawyer, or engineer whose education required several years in college. The idea is saleable to those seeking new positions in practically all positions calling for managerial or executive ability and those desiring rearrangement of incomes in their present positions. There is no fixed price for sound ideas. Back of all ideas is specialized knowledge. Unfortunately for those who do not find riches in abundance, specialized knowledge is more abundant and more easily acquired than ideas. Because of this very truth, there is a universal demand and an ever-increasing opportunity for the person capable of helping men and women to sell their personal services advantageously. Capability means imagination, the one quality needed to combine specialized knowledge with ideas in the form of organized plans designed to yield riches. If you have imagination, this chapter may present you with an idea sufficient to serve as the beginning of the riches you desire. Remember, the idea is the main thing. Specialized knowledge may be found just around the corner, any corner.
Chapter 6, Imagination, the Workshop of the Mind, the Fifth Step Toward Riches. The imagination is literally the workshop wherein are fashioned all plans created by man. The impulse and the desire is given shape, form, and action through the aid of the imaginative faculty of the mind. It's been said that man can create anything which he can imagine. Of all of the ages of civilization, this is the most favorable for the development of the imagination, because it is the age of rapid change. On every hand, one may contact stimuli which develop the imagination. Through the aid of his imaginative faculty, man has discovered and harnessed more of nature's forces during the past 50 years than during the entire history of the human race previous to that time. He has conquered the air so completely that the birds are a poor match for him in flying. He has harnessed the ether and made it serve as a means of instantaneous communication with any part of the world. He has analyzed and weighed the sun at a distance of millions of miles and has determined through the aid of imagination the elements of which it consists. He has discovered that his own brain is both a broadcasting and a receiving station for the vibration of thought and he is beginning now to learn how to make practical use of this discovery. He has increased the speed of locomotion until he may now travel at a speed of more than 300 miles an hour. The time will soon come when a man may breakfast in New York and lunch in San Francisco. Man's only limitation within reason lies in his development and use of his imagination. He has not yet reached the apex of development in the use of his imaginative faculty. He has merely discovered that he has an imagination and has commenced to use it in a very elementary way. The imaginative faculty functions in two forms. One is known as synthetic imagination and the other as creative imagination. Synthetic imagination, through this faculty, one may arrange old concepts, ideas, or plans into new combinations. This faculty creates nothing. It merely works with the material of experience, education, and observation with which it is fed. It is the faculty used most by the inventor, with the exception of the who draws upon the creative imagination when he cannot solve his problem through synthetic imagination. Creative imagination is through the faculty of creative imagination, the finite mind of man, having direct communication with infinite intelligent. It is a faculty through which hunches and inspirations are received. It is by this faculty that all basic or new ideas are handed over to man. It is through this faculty that thought vibrations from the minds of others are received. It is through this faculty that one individual may tune in or communicate with the subconscious minds of other men. The creative imagination works automatically in the manner described in subsequent pages. This faculty functions only when the conscious mind is vibrating at an exceedingly rapid rate, as for example, when the conscious mind is stimulated through the emotion of a strong desire. The creative faculty becomes more alert, more receptive to vibrations from the sources mentioned in proportion to its development through use. This statement is significant. Ponder over it before passing on. Keep in mind as you follow these principles that the entire story of how one may convert desire into money cannot be told in one statement. The story will be complete only when one has mastered, assimilated, and begun to make use of all of the principles. The great leaders of business, industry, finance, and the great artists, musicians, poets, and writers became great because they developed the faculty of creative imagination. Both the synthetic and creative faculties of imagination become more alert with use, just as any muscle or organ of the body develops through use. Desire is only a thought, an impulse. It is nebulous and ephemeral. It is abstract and of no value until it has been transformed into its physical counterpart. While the synthetic imagination is the one which will be used most frequently in the process of transforming the impulse of desire into money, you must keep in mind the fact that you may face circumstances and situations which demand use of the creative imagination as well. Your imaginative faculty may have become weak through inaction. It can be revived and made alert through use. This faculty doesn't die, though it may become quiescent through lack of use. Center your attention for the time being on the development of the synthetic imagination because this is the faculty which you will use more often in the process of converting desire into money. Transformation of the intangible impulse of desire into the tangible reality of money calls for the use of a plan or plans. These plans must be formed with the aid of the imagination and mainly 
with the synthetic faculty. Read the entire book through, then come back to this chapter and begin at once to put your imagination to work on the building of a plan or plans for the transformation of your desire into money. Detailed instructions for the building of plans have been given in almost every chapter. Carry out the instructions best suited to your needs. Reduce your plan to writing if you've not already done so. The moment you complete this, you will have definitely given concrete form to the intangible. Desire. Read the preceding sentence once more. Read it aloud, very slowly. And as you do so, remember that the moment you reduce the statements of your desire and a plan for its realization to writing, you have actually taken the first of a series of steps which will enable you to convert the thought into its physical counterpart. The earth on which you live, you, yourself, and every other material thing are the result of evolutionary change through which microscopic bits of matter have been organized and arranged in an orderly fashion. Moreover, and this statement is of stupendous importance, this earth, every one of the billions of individual cells of your body, and every atom of matter began as an intangible form of energy. Desire is thought impulse. Thought impulses are forms of energy. When you begin with a thought impulse, desire, to accumulate money, you are drafting into your service the same stuff that nature used in creating this earth, and every material form in the universe, including the body and brain, in which the thought impulses function. As far as science has been able to determine, the entire universe consists of but two elements, matter and energy. Through the combination of energy and matter, has been created everything perceptible to man, from the largest star which floats in the heavens, down to and including man himself. You are now engaged in the task of trying to profit by nature's method. You are, sincerely and earnestly we hope, trying to adapt yourself to nature's laws by endeavoring to convert desire into its physical or monetary equivalent. You can do it. It has been done before. You can build a fortune through the aid of laws which are immutable, but first you must become familiar with these laws and learn to use them. Through repetition and by approaching the description of these principles from every conceivable angle, the author hopes to reveal to you the secret through which every great fortune has been accumulated. Strange and paradoxical as it may seem, the secret is not a secret of nature. Nature advertises herself in the earth on which we live, the stars, the planets, suspended within our view, in the elements above and around us, in every blade of grass, and every form of life within our vision. Nature advertises this secret in the terms of biology, in the conversion of a tiny cell so small that it may be lost on the point of a pin, into the human being now reading this line. The conversion of desire into its physical equivalent is certainly no more miraculous. Now don't become discouraged if you don't fully comprehend all that has been stated. Unless you have been long a student of the mind, it is not to be expected that you will assimilate all that is in this chapter upon a first reading. But you will in time make very good progress. The principles which follow will open the way for understanding of imagination. Assimilate that which you understand as you read this philosophy for the first time. Then, when you reread it and study it, you'll discover that something has happened to clarify it and give you a broader understanding of the whole. Above all, do not stop nor hesitate in your study of these principles until you have read the book at least three times, for then you will not want to stop. How to make practical use of imagination. Ideas are the beginning points of all fortunes. Ideas are the products of the imagination. Let us examine a few well-known ideas which have yielded huge fortunes with the hope that these illustrations will convey definite information concerning the method by which imagination may be used in accumulating riches. The Enchanted Kettle Fifty years ago, an old country doctor drove to town, hitched his horse, quietly slipped into a drugstore by the back door, and began dickering with the young drug clerk. His mission was destined to yield great wealth to many people. It was destined to bring to the South the most far-flung benefit since the Civil War. For more than an hour behind the prescription counter, the old doctor and the clerk talked in low tones, and then the doctor left. He went out to the buggy and brought back a large old-fashioned kettle, a big wooden paddle used for stirring the contents of the kettle, and deposited them in the back of the store. The clerk inspected the kettle, reached into his inside pocket, took out a roll of bills, and handed it over to the doctor. The roll contained exactly five hundred dollars, the clerk's entire savings. The doctor handed over a small slip of paper on which was written a secret formula. The words on that small slip of paper were worth a king's ransom, 
but not to the doctor. Those magic words were needed to start the kettle to boiling, but neither the doctor nor the young clerk knew what fabulous fortunes were destined to flow from that kettle. The old doctor was glad to sell the outfit for $500. The money would pay off his debts and give him freedom of mind. The clerk was taking a big chance by staking his entire life savings on a mere scrap of paper and an old kettle. He never dreamed his investment would start a kettle to overflowing with gold that would surpass the miraculous performance of Aladdin's lamp. What the clerk really purchased was an idea. The old kettle and the wooden paddle and the secret message on a slip of paper were just incidental. The strange performance of that kettle began to take place after the new owner mixed with the secret instructions and ingredient of which the doctor knew nothing. Read this story carefully. Give your imagination a test. See if you can discover what it was that the young man added to the secret message which caused the kettle to overflow with gold. Remember as you read that this is not a story from the Arabian Nights. Here you have a story of fact, stranger than fiction, facts which began in the form of an idea. Let's take a look at the vast fortunes of gold this idea has produced. It has paid and still pays huge fortunes to men and women all over the world who distribute the contents of the kettle to millions of people. The old kettle is now one of the world's largest consumers of sugar, thus providing jobs of a permanent nature to thousands of men and women engaged in growing sugar cane and in refining and marketing sugar. The old kettle consumes annually millions of glass bottles, providing jobs to huge numbers of glass workers. The old kettle gives employment to an army of clerks, stenographers, copywriters, and advertising experts throughout the nation. It has brought fame and fortune to scores of artists who have created magnificent pictures describing the product. The old kettle was converted in a small southern city into the business capital of the South, where it now benefits directly or indirectly every business and practically every resident of that city. The influence of the idea now benefits every civilized country in the world, pouring out a continuous stream of gold to all who touch it. Gold from the kettle built and maintains one of the most prominent colleges of the South, where thousands of young people receive the training essentials for success. The old kettle has done other marvelous things. All through the world, the Depression, when factories, banks, and business houses were folding up and quitting by the thousands, the owner of this enchanted kettle went marching on, giving continuous employment to an army of men and women all over the world and paying out extra portions of gold to those who long ago had faith in the idea. If the product of that old brass kettle could talk, it would tell thrilling tales of romance in every language. Romances of love, romances of business, romances of professional men and women who are daily being stimulated by it. The author is sure of at least one such romance, for he was part of it, and it all began not very far from the spot on which that drug clerk purchased the old kettle. It was here that the author met his wife, and it was she who first told him of the enchanted kettle. It was the product of that kettle they were drinking when he asked her to accept him for better or worse. Now that you know the content of the enchanted kettle is a world-famous drink, it's fitting that the author confess that the home city of the drink supplied him with a wife, also that the drink itself provides him with stimulation of thought without intoxication, and thereby it serves to give the refreshment of mind which an author must have to do his best work. Whoever you are, wherever you may live, whatever your occupation you may be engaged in, just remember in the future every time you see the words Coca-Cola that its vast empire of wealth and influence grew out of a single idea and that the mysterious ingredient the drug clerk, Asa Candler, mixed with a secret formula was imagination. Stop and think of that just for a moment. Remember also that the 13 steps to riches described in this book were the media through which the influence of Coca-Cola has been extended to every city, town, village, and crossroads of the world, and that any idea you may create will be good and meritorious as is Coca-Cola and has the possibility of duplicating the stupendous record of this worldwide thirst killer. Truly thoughts are things, and their scope of operation is the world itself. What I would do if I had a million dollars. This story proves the truth of that old saying, where there's a will, there's a way. It was told to me by that beloved educator and clergyman, the late Frank W. Gonzalez, who began his preaching career in the stockyard regions of South Chicago. While Dr. Gonzalez was going through college, he observed many defects in our educational system, defects which he believed he could correct if he were the head of a college. His deepest desire was to become the directing head of an educational institution in which young men and women would be taught to learn by doing. 
He made up his mind to organize a new college in which he could carry out his ideas without being handicapped by orthodox methods of education. He needed $1 million to put the project across. Where was he to lay his hands on so large a sum of money? That was the question that absorbed most of this ambitious young preacher's thought. But he couldn't seem to make any progress. Every night he took that thought to bed with him. He got up with it in the morning. He took it with him everywhere he went. He turned it over and over in his mind until it became a consuming obsession with him. A million dollars is a lot of money. He recognized that fact, but he also recognized the truth that the only limitation is that which one sets up in one's own mind. Being a philosopher as well as a preacher, Dr. Gonzalez recognized, as do all who succeed in life, that definiteness of purpose is the starting point from which one must begin. He recognized, too, that definiteness of purpose takes on animation, life, and power when backed by a burning desire to translate that purpose into its material equivalent. He knew all these truths, yet he did not know where or how to lay his hands on a million dollars. The natural procedure would have been to give up and quit by saying, Ah, well, my idea's a good one, but I can't do anything with it because I never can procure the necessary million dollars. That's exactly what the majority of people would have said, but it's not what Dr. Gonzalez said. What he said and what he did are so important that I now introduce him and let him speak for himself. One Saturday afternoon, I sat in my room thinking of ways and means of raising the money to carry out my plans. For nearly two years, I'd been thinking, but I had done nothing but think. The time had come for action. I made up my mind then and there that I would get the necessary million dollars within a week. How? I wasn't concerned about that. The main thing of importance was the decision to get the money within a specified time. And I want to tell you that the moment I reached the definite decision to get the money within a specified time, a strange feeling of assurance came over me, such as I had never before experienced. Something inside me seemed to say, Why didn't you reach that decision a long time ago? The money was waiting for you all the time. Things began to happen in a hurry. I called the newspapers and announced I would preach a sermon the following morning entitled, What I Would Do If I Had a Million Dollars. I went to work on the sermon immediately, but I must tell you frankly, the task was not difficult because I had been preparing that sermon for almost two years. The spirit back of it was a part of me. Long before midnight, I had finished writing the sermon. I went to bed and slept with a feeling of confidence, for I could see myself already in possession of the million dollars. Next morning, I arose early, went into the bathroom, read the sermon, and then knelt on my knees and asked that my sermon might come to the attention of someone who would supply the needed money. While I was praying, I again had that feeling of assurance that the money would be forthcoming. In my excitement, I walked out without my sermon and did not discover the oversight until I was in my pulpit and about ready to begin delivering it. It was too late to go back for my notes, and what a blessing that I couldn't go back. Instead, my own subconscious mind yielded the material I needed. When I arose to begin my sermon, I closed my eyes, and I spoke with all of my heart and soul of my dreams. I not only talked to my audience, but I fancy I talked to God also. I told what I would do with a million dollars if that amount were placed in my hands. I described the plan I had in mind for organizing a great educational institution where young people would learn to do practical things and at the same time develop their minds. When I had finished and sat down, a man slowly arose from his seat about three rows from the rear and made his way toward the pulpit. I wondered what he was going to do. He came into the pulpit and extended his hand and said, Reverend, I liked your sermon. I believe you can do everything you said, if you would, if you had but a million dollars. To prove that, I believe in you and your sermon. If you will come to my office tomorrow, I will give you the million dollars. My name is Philip D. Armour. Young Gonzales went to Mr. Armour's office, and the million dollars was presented to him. With the money, he founded the Armour Institute of Technology. Now, that's more money than the majority of preachers ever see in an entire lifetime, yet the thought impulse back of the money was created from the young preacher's mind in a fraction of a minute. The necessary million dollars came as a result of an idea. Back of the idea was a desire which young Gonzales had been nursing in his mind for almost two years. Observe this important fact. He got the money within 36 hours after he reached a definite decision in his own mind to get it, and decided upon a definite plan for getting it. There's nothing new or unique about young Gonzales' vague thinking about a million dollars and weakly hoping for it. Others before him and many since his time have had similar thoughts. 
But there was something very unique and different about the decision he reached on that memorable Saturday when he put vagueness into the background and definitely said, I will get that money within a week. God seems to throw himself on the side of the man who knows exactly what he wants if he's determined to get just that. Moreover, the principle through which Dr. Gonzalez got his million dollars is still alive. It is available to you. This universal law is as workable today as it was when the young preacher made use of it so successfully. This book describes, step by step, the 13 elements of this great law and suggests how they may be put to use. Observe that Asa Candler and Dr. Frank Gonzalez had one characteristic in common. Both knew the astounding truth that ideas can be transmuted into cash through the power of definite purpose plus definite plans. If you're one of those who believe that hard work and honesty alone will bring riches, perish the thought. It just is not true. Riches, when they come in huge quantities, are never the result of hard work. Riches come, if they come at all, in response to definite demands based upon the application of definite principles, and not by chance or luck. Generally speaking, an idea is an impulse of thought that impels action by an appeal to the imagination. All master salesmen know that ideas can be sold wherever merchandise cannot be. Ordinary salesmen do not know this. That is why they are ordinary. A publisher of books which sell for a nickel made a discovery that should be worth much to publishers generally. He learned that many people buy titles and not contents of books. By merely changing the name of one book that was not moving, his sales on that book jumped upward more than a million copies. The inside of the book was not changed in any way. He merely ripped off the cover bearing the title that did not sell and put on a new cover with a title that had box office value. That, as simple as it may seem, was an idea. It was imagination. There's no standard price on ideas. The creator of ideas makes his own price, and if he is smart, he gets it. The moving picture industry created a whole flock of millionaires. Most of them were men who couldn't create ideas, but they had the imagination to recognize ideas when they saw them. The next flock of millionaires will grow out of the radio business, which is new and not overburdened with men of keen imagination. The money will be made by those who discover or create new and more meritorious radio programs and have the imagination to recognize merit and to give the radio listeners a chance to profit by it. The sponsor, that unfortunate victim who now pays the cost of all radio entertainment, soon will become idea conscious and demand something for his money. The man who beats the sponsor to the draw and supplies programs that render useful service is the man who will become rich in this new industry. Crooners and light chatter artists who now pollute the air with wisecracks and silly giggles will go the way of all light timbers and their places will be taken by real artists who interpret carefully planned programs which have been designed to service the minds of men as well as provide entertainment. Here is a wide open field of opportunity screaming its protest at the way it's being butchered because of lack of imagination and begging for rescue at any price. Above all, the thing that radio needs is new ideas. If this field of opportunity intrigues you, perhaps you might profit by the suggestion that the successful radio programs of the future will give more attention to creating buyer audiences and less attention to listener audiences. Stated more plainly, the builder of radio programs who succeeds in the future must find practical ways to convert listeners into buyers. Moreover, the successful producer of radio programs in the future must key his features so that he can definitely show its effect upon the audience. Sponsors are becoming a bit wary of buying glib selling talks based upon statements grabbed out of thin air. They want, and in the future will demand, indisputable proof that the Who's It program not only gives millions of people the silliest giggle ever, but that the silly giggler can sell merchandise. Another thing that might as well be understood by those who contemplate entering this new field of opportunity, radio advertising is going to be handled by an entirely new group of advertising experts, separate and distinct from the old-time newspaper and magazine advertising agency men. The old-timers in the advertising game cannot read the modern radio scripts because they've been schooled to see ideas. The new radio technique demands men who can interpret ideas from a written manuscript in terms of sound. It cost the author a year of hard labor and many thousands of dollars to learn this. Radio right now is about where the moving pictures were when Mary Pickford and her curls first appeared on the screen. There is plenty of room in radio for those who can produce or recognize ideas. If the foregoing comment on the opportunities of radio has not started your idea factory to work, then you'd better forget it. 
your opportunity is in some other field. If the comment intrigued you in the slightest degree, then go further into it, and you may find the one idea that you need to round out your career. Never let it discourage you if you have no experience in radio. Andrew Carnegie knew very little about making steel. I have Carnegie's own words for this, but he made practical use of two of the principles described in this book and made the steel business yield him a fortune. The story of practically every great fortune starts with the day when a creator of ideas and a seller of ideas got together and worked in harmony. Carnegie surrounded himself with men who could do all that he could not do, men who created ideas and men who put ideas into operation and made himself and the others fabulously rich. Millions of people go through life hoping for favorable breaks. Perhaps a favorable break can get one an opportunity, but the safest plan is not to depend upon luck. It was a favorable break that gave me the biggest opportunity of my life, but 25 years of determined effort had to be devoted to that opportunity before it became an asset. The break consisted of my good fortune in meeting and gaining the cooperation of Andrew Carnegie. On that occasion, Carnegie planted in my mind the idea of organizing the principles of achievement into a philosophy of success. Thousands of people have profited by the discoveries made in the 25 years of research, and several fortunes have been accumulated through the application of the philosophy. The beginning was simple. It was an idea which anyone might have developed. The favorable break came through Carnegie. But what about the determination, definiteness of purpose, and the desire to attain the goal and the persistent effort of 25 years? It was no ordinary desire that survived disappointment, discourage, temporary defeat, criticism, and the constant reminding of waste of time. It was a burning desire, an obsession. When the idea was first planted in my mind by Mr. Carnegie, it was coaxed, nursed, and enticed to remain alive. Gradually, the idea became a giant under its own power, and it coaxed, nursed, and drove me. Ideas are like that. First you give life and action and guidance to ideas, then they take on power of their own and they sweep aside all opposition. Ideas are intangible forces, but they have more power than the physical brains that give birth to them. They have the power to live on after the brain that creates them has returned to dust. For example, take the power of Christianity. That began with a simple idea born in the brain of Christ. Its chief tenet was, do unto others as you would have others do unto you. Christ has gone back to the source from whence he came, but his idea goes marching on. Someday it may grow up and come into its own. Then it will have fulfilled Christ's deepest desire. The idea has been developing only 2,000 years. Give it time. Success requires no explanations, and failure permits no alibis. Chapter 7, Organized Planning, the Crystallization of Desire into Action, the Sixth Step Toward Riches. You've learned that everything man creates or acquires begins in the form of desire. The desire is taken on the first lap of its journey from the abstract to the concrete, into the workshop of the imagination, where plans for its transition are created and organized. In Chapter 2, you were instructed to take six definite practical steps as your first move in translating the desire for money into its monetary equivalent. One of these steps is the formation of a definite practical plan or plans through which this transformation may be made. You'll now be instructed on how to build plans which will be practical. A. Ally yourself with a group of as many people as you may need for the creation and carrying out of your plan or plans for the accumulation of money making. Use the mastermind principles described in a later chapter. Compliance with this instruction is absolutely essential. Do not neglect it. B. Before forming your mastermind alliance, decide what advantages and benefits you may offer the individual members of your group in return for their cooperation. No one will work indefinitely without some form of compensation. No intelligent person will either request or expect another to work without adequate compensation, although this may not always be in the form of money. C. Arrange to meet with the members of your mastermind group at least twice a week and more often if possible until you have jointly perfected the necessary plan or plans for the accumulation of money. D. Maintain perfect harmony between yourself and every member of your mastermind group. If you fail to carry out this instruction to the letter, you may expect to meet with failure. The mastermind principle cannot obtain where perfect harmony does not prevail. Keep in mind these facts. First, 
you are engaged in an undertaking of major importance to you. To be sure of success, you must have plans which are faultless. Second, you must have the advantage of the experience, education, native ability, and imagination of other minds. This is in harmony with the methods followed by every person who has accumulated a great fortune. No individual has sufficient experience, education, native ability, and knowledge to ensure the accumulation of a great fortune without the cooperation of other people. Every plan you adopt in your endeavor to accumulate wealth should be the joint creation of yourself and every other member of your mastermind group. You may originate your own plans, either in whole or in part, but see that those plans are checked and approved by the members of your mastermind alliance. If the first plan which you adopt does not work successfully, replace it with a new plan. If that one fails to work, replace it, in turn with still another and so on, until you find a plan which does work. Right here is the point at which the majority of men meet with failure. Because of their lack of persistence in creating new plans to take the place of those which fail. The most intelligent man living cannot succeed in accumulating money nor in any other undertaking without plans which are practical and workable. Just keep this fact in mind and remember when your plans fail that temporary defeat is not permanent failure. It may only mean that your plans have not been sound. Build other plans. Start all over again. Thomas Edison failed 10,000 times before he perfected the incandescent electric light bulb. That is, he met with temporary defeat 10,000 times before his efforts were crowned with success. Temporary defeat should mean only one thing the certain knowledge that there is something wrong with your plan. Millions of men go through life in misery and poverty because they lack a sound plan through which to accumulate a fortune. Henry Ford accumulated a fortune not because of his superior mind, but because he adopted and followed a plan which proved to be sound. A thousand men could be pointed out, each with better education than Ford's, yet each of whom lives in poverty because he does not possess the right plan for the accumulation of money. Your achievement can be no greater than your plans are sound. That may seem to be an axiomatic statement, but it's true. Samuel Insull lost his fortune of over $100 million. The Insull fortune was built on plans which were sound. The business depression forced Mr. Insull to change his plans, and the change brought temporary defeat. Because his new plans were not sound, Mr. Insull is now an old man. He may consequently accept failure instead of temporary defeat. But if his experience turns out to be failure... It will be for the reason that he lacks the fire of persistence to rebuild his plans. No man is ever whipped until he quits in his own mind. This fact will be repeated many times because it's so easy to take the count at the first sign of defeat. James J. Hill met with temporary defeat when he first endeavored to raise the necessary capital to build a railroad from east to the west. But he too turned defeat into victory through new plans. Henry Ford met with temporary defeat not only at the beginning of his automobile career, but after he had gone far toward the top, he created new plans and went marching on to financial victory. We see men who have accumulated great fortunes, but we often recognize only their triumph overlooking the temporary defeats which they had to surmount before arriving. No follower of this philosophy can reasonably expect to accumulate a fortune without experiencing temporary defeat. When defeat comes, accept it as a signal that your plans are not sound. Rebuild those plans and set sail once more toward your coveted goal. If you give up before your goal has been reached, you're a quitter. A quitter never wins and a winner never quits. Lift this sentence out. Write it on a piece of paper in letters an inch high and place it where you will. See it every night before you go to sleep and every morning before you will go to work. When you begin to select members for your mastermind group, endeavor to select those who do not take defeat seriously. Some people foolishly believe that only money can make money. Well, that's not true. Desire transmuted into its monetary equivalent through the principles laid down here is the agency through which money is made. Money of itself is nothing but inert matter. It cannot move, think, or talk, but it can hear when a man who desires it calls it to come. Planning the Sale of Services the remainder of this chapter has been given over to a description of ways and means of marketing personal services. The information here conveyed will be of practical help to any person having any form of personal services to market, but it will be of priceless benefit to those who aspire to leadership in their chosen occupations. Intelligent planning is essential for success in any undertaking designed to accumulate riches. 
Here will be found detailed instructions to those who must begin the accumulation of riches by selling personal services. It should be encouraging to know that practically all of the great fortunes began in the form of compensation for personal services or from the sale of ideas. What else except ideas and personal services would one not possessed of poverty have to give in return for riches? Broadly speaking, there are two types of people in the world. One type is known as leaders and the other as followers. Decide at the outset whether you intend to become a leader in your chosen calling or remain a follower. The difference in compensation is vast. The follower cannot reasonably expect the compensation to which a leader is entitled, although many followers make the mistake of expecting such pay. It's no disgrace to be a follower. On the other hand, it's no credit to remain a follower either. Most great leaders begin in the capacity of followers. They became great leaders because they were intelligent followers. With few exceptions, the man who cannot follow a leader intelligently cannot become an efficient leader. The man who can follow a leader most efficiently is usually the man who develops into leadership most rapidly. An intelligent follower has many advantages among them, the opportunity to acquire knowledge from his leader. The major attributes of leadership. The following are important factors of leadership. Number one, unwavering courage based upon knowledge of self and of one's occupation. No follower wishes to be dominated by a leader who lacks self-confidence and courage. No intelligent follower will be dominated by such a leader for very long. Number two, self-control. The man who cannot control himself can never control others. Self-control sets a mighty example for one's followers, which the more intelligent will emulate. Number three, a keen sense of justice. Without a sense of fairness and justice, no leader can command and retain the respect of his followers. Four, definiteness of decision. The man who wavers in his decisions shows that he's not sure of himself. He cannot lead others successfully. Number five, definiteness of plans. The successful leader must plan his work and work his plan. A leader who moves by guesswork without practical definite plans is comparable to a ship without a rudder. Sooner or later, he will land on the rocks. Number six, the habit of doing more than paid for. One of the penalties of leadership is the necessity of willingness upon the part of the leader to do more than he requires of his followers. Number seven, a pleasing personality. No slovenly careless person can become a successful leader. Leadership calls for respect. Followers will not respect a leader who does not grade high on all of the factors of a pleasing personality. Number eight, sympathy and understanding. The successful leader must be in sympathy with his followers. Moreover, he must understand them and their problems. Number nine, mastery of detail. Successful leadership calls for mastery of detail of the leader's position. Number 10, willingness to assume full responsibility. The successful leader must be willing to assume responsibility for the mistakes and the shortcomings of his followers. If he tries to shift this responsibility, he will not remain the leader. If one of his followers makes a mistake and shows himself incompetent, the leader must consider that it is he who has failed. Number 11, cooperation. The successful leader must understand and apply the principle of cooperative effort and be able to induce his followers to do the same. Leadership calls for power, and power calls for cooperation. There are two forms of leadership. The first, and by far the most effective, is leadership by consent of and with the sympathy of the followers. The second is leadership by force without the consent and sympathy of the followers. History is filled with evidences that leadership by force cannot endure. The downfall and disappearance of dictators and kings is significant. It means that people will not follow forced leadership indefinitely. The world has just entered a new era of relationships between leaders and followers, which is very clearly calling for new leaders and a new brand of leadership in business and in industry. Those who belong to the old school of leadership by force must acquire an understanding of the new brand of leadership, cooperation, or be relegated to the rank and file of the followers. There is no other way out for them. The relationship of employer and employee, or of leader and follower, in the future will be one of mutual cooperation based upon an equitable division of the profits of business. In the future, the relationship of employer and employee will be more like a partnership than it has been in the past. Napoleon Kaiser Wilhelm of Germany, the Tsar of Russia, and the King of Spain were examples of leadership by force. Their leadership passed 
Without much difficulty, one might point to the prototypes of these ex-leaders among the business, financial, and labor leaders of America who have been dethroned or slated to go. Leadership by consent of the followers is the only brand which can endure. Men may follow the forced leadership temporarily, but they will not do so willingly. The new brand of leadership will embrace the 11 factors of leadership described in this chapter, as well as some other factors. The man who makes these the basis of his leadership will find abundant opportunity to lead in any walk of life. The Depression was prolonged largely because the world lacked leadership of the new brand. At the end of the Depression, the demand for leaders who are competent to apply the new methods of leadership has greatly exceeded the supply. Some of the old type of leaders will reform and adapt themselves to the new brand of leadership, but generally speaking, the world will have to look for a new timber for its leadership. The necessity may be your opportunity. The 10 Major Causes of Failure in Leadership We come now to the major faults of leaders who fail because it is just as essential to know what not to do as it is to know what to do. Number 1. Inability to Organize Details Efficient leadership calls for ability to organize and master details. No genuine leader is ever too busy to do anything which may be required of him in his capacity as a leader. When a man, whether he's a leader or follower, admits that he's too busy to change his plans or to give attention to any emergency, he admits his inefficiency. The successful leader must be the master of all details connected with his position. That means, of course, that he must acquire the habit of relegating details to capable lieutenants. Number two, unwillingness to render humble service. Truly great leaders are willing, when occasion demands, to perform any sort of labor which they would ask another to perform. The greatest among ye shall be the servant of all, is a truth which all able leaders observe and respect. Number three, expectation of pay for what they know instead of what they do with that which they know. The world does not pay men for that which they know. It pays them for what they do or what they induce others to do. Number four, fear of competition from followers. The leader who fears that one of his followers may take his position is practically sure to realize that fear sooner or later. The able leader trains understudies to Chapter 8. Decision. The Mastery of Procrastination. The Seventh Step Toward Riches. Accurate analysis of over 25,000 men and women who had experienced failure disclosed the fact that lack of decision was near the head of the list of the 30 major causes of failure. This is no mere statement of a theory. It is a fact. Procrastination, the opposite of decision, is a common enemy which practically every man must conquer. You'll have an opportunity to test your capacity to reach quick and definite decisions when you finish reading this book and are ready to begin putting into action the principles which it describes. Analysis of 700 people who had accumulated fortunes well beyond the million dollar mark disclosed the fact that every one of them had the habit of reaching decisions promptly and of changing these decisions slowly if and when they were changed. People who fail to accumulate money without exception have the habit of reaching decisions, if at all, very slowly, and of changing these decisions quickly and often. One of Henry Ford's most outstanding qualities is his habit of reaching decisions quickly and definitely, and changing them slowly. This quality is so pronounced in Mr. Ford that it's given him the reputation of being obstinate. It was this quality which prompted Mr. Ford to continue to manufacture his famous Model T, the world's ugliest car, when all of his advisors and many of the purchasers of the car were urging him to change it. Perhaps Mr. Ford delayed too long in making the change, but the other side of the story is that Mr. Ford's firmness of decision yielded a huge fortune before the change in model became necessary. There is but little doubt that Mr. Ford's habit of definiteness of decision assumes the proportion of obstinacy, but this quality is preferable to slowness in reaching decisions and quickness in changing them. The majority of people who fail to accumulate money sufficient for their needs are generally easily influenced by the opinions of others. They permit the newspapers and the gossiping neighbors to do their thinking for them. 
Opinions are the cheapest commodities on earth. Everyone has a flock of opinions ready to be wished upon anyone who will accept them. If you are influenced by opinions when you reach decisions, you will not succeed in any undertaking, much less in that of transmuting your own desire into money. If you're influenced by the opinions of others, you will have no desire of your own. Keep your own counsel when you begin to put into practice the principles described here by reaching your own decisions and following them. Take no one into your confidence except the members of your mastermind group. And be very sure in your selection of this group that you choose only those who will be in complete sympathy and harmony with your purpose. Close friends and relatives, while not meaning to do so, often handicap one through opinions and sometimes through ridicule, which is meant to be humorous. Thousands of men and women carry inferiority complexes with them all through life because some well-meaning but ignorant person destroy their confidence through opinions or ridicule. You have a brain and a mind of your own. Use it and reach your own decisions. If you need facts or information from other people to enable you to reach decisions, as you probably will in many instances, acquire these facts or secure the information you need quietly without disclosing your purpose. It's characteristic of people who have but a smattering of veneer of knowledge to try to give the impression that they have much knowledge. Such people generally do too much talking and too little listening. Keep your ears and your eyes wide open and your mouth closed if you wish to acquire the habit of prompt decision. Those who talk too much do little else. If you talk more than you listen, you not only deprive yourself of many opportunities to accumulate useful knowledge, but you also disclose your plans and purposes to people who will take great delight in defeating you because they envy you. Remember also that every time you open your mouth in the presence of a person who has an abundance of knowledge, you display to that person your exact stock of knowledge, or your lack of it. Genuine wisdom is usually conspicuous through modesty and silence. Keep in mind the fact that every person with whom you associate is like yourself, seeking the opportunity to accumulate money. If you talk about your plans too freely, you may be surprised when you learn that some other person has beaten you to your goal by putting into action ahead of you the plans of which you talked unwisely. Let one of your first decisions be to keep a closed mouth and open ears and eyes. As a reminder to yourself to follow this advice, it will be helpful if you copy the following epigram in large letters and place it where you will see it daily. Tell the world what you intend to do, but first show it. This is the equivalent of saying that deeds and not words are what count most. The value of decisions depends upon the courage required to render them. The great decisions which served as the foundation of civilization were reached by assuming great risks. Often, they met the possibility of death. Lincoln's decision to issue his famous Proclamation of Emancipation, which gave freedom to the colored people of America, was rendered with full understanding that his act would turn thousands of friends and political supporters against him. He knew, too, that carrying out of that proclamation would mean death to thousands of men on the battlefield. In the end, it cost Lincoln his life. That required courage. Socrates' decision to drink the cup of poison, rather than compromise in his personal belief, was a decision of courage. It turned time ahead a thousand years and gave to people then unborn the right to freedom of thought and of speech. The decision of General Robert E. Lee when he came to the parting of the way with the Union and took up the cause of the South was a big decision of courage, for he well knew that it might cost him his own life and that it would surely cost the lives of others. But the greatest decision of all time, as far as any American citizen is concerned, was reached in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, July 4, 1776, when 56 men signed their names to a document which they well knew would bring freedom to all Americans or leave every one of the 56 hanging from the gallows. You've heard of this famous document, but you may not have drawn from it the great lesson in personal achievement so plainly taught. We all remember the date of this momentous decision, but few of us realize what courage that decision required. We remember our history as it was taught. We remember dates and the names of the men who fought. We remember Valley Forge and Yorktown. We remember George Washington and Lord Cornwallis. But we know little of the real forces back of these names, dates, and places. We know still less of that intangible power which ensured us freedom long before Washington's armies reached Yorktown. 
We read the history of the Revolution and falsely imagine that George Washington was the father of our country, that it was he who won our freedom, while the truth is, Washington was only an accessory after the fact, because victory for his armies had been ensured long before Lord Cornwallis surrendered. This is not intended to rob Washington of any glory he so richly merited. Its purpose, rather, is to give greater attention to the astounding power that was the real cause of this victory. It is nothing short of tragedy that the writers of history have missed entirely even the slightest reference to the irresistible power which gave birth and freedom to the nation destined to set up new standards of independence for all of the peoples of earth. I say it's a tragedy because it's the same self-power which must be used by every individual who surmounts the difficulties of life and forces life to pay the price asked. Let's briefly review the events which gave birth to this power. The story begins with an incident in Boston, March 5, 1770. British soldiers were patrolling the streets by their presence, openly threatening the citizens. The colonists resented armed men marching in their midst. They began to express their resentment openly, hurling stones as well as epithets at the marching soldiers until the commanding officer gave orders. Fix bayonets! Charge! The battle was on. It resulted in the death and the injury of many. The incident aroused such resentment that the provincial assembly, made up of prominent colonists, called a meeting for the purpose of taking definite action. Two of the members of that assembly were John Hancock and Samuel Adams. Long live their names. They spoke up courageously and declared that a move must be made to eject all British soldiers from Boston. Remember, this decision in the minds of two men might properly be called the beginning of the freedom which we of the United States now enjoy. Remember, too, that that decision of these two men called for faith and courage because it was dangerous. Before the assembly adjourned, Samuel Adams was appointed to call on the governor of the province, Hutchinson, and demand the withdrawal of the British troops. The request was granted. The troops were removed from Boston, but the incident was not closed. It had caused a situation destined to change the entire trend of civilization. Strange, it is not how the great changes, such as the American Revolution and the World War, often have their beginnings in circumstances which seem very unimportant. It is interesting also to observe that these important changes usually begin in the form of a definite decision in the minds of a relatively small number of people. Few of us know the history of our country well enough to realize that John Hancock, Samuel Adams, and Richard Henry Lee of Virginia were the real fathers of our country. Richard Henry Lee became an important factor in this story by reason of the fact that he and Samuel Adams communicated frequently by correspondence, sharing freely their fears and their hopes concerning the welfare of the people of their provinces. From this practice, Adams conceived the idea that a mutual exchange of letters between the 13 colonies might help to bring about the coordination of efforts so badly needed in connection with the solution of their problems. Two years after the clash with the soldiers in Boston on March of 1772, Adams presented this idea to the assembly in the form of a motion that a correspondence committee be established among the colonies, with definitely appointed correspondents in each colony, for the purpose of friendly cooperation for the betterment of the colonies of British America. Mark well this incident, it was the beginning of the organization of the far-flung power destined to give freedom to you and to me. The mastermind had already been organized. It consisted of Adams, Lee, and Hancock. I tell you further that if two of you agree upon the earth concerning anything for which you ask, it will come to you from my Father, who is in heaven. The Committee of Correspondence was organized. Observe that this move provided the way for increasing the power of the mastermind by adding to it men from all the colonies. Take the notice that this procedure constituted the first organized planning of the disgruntled colonists. In union, there is strength. The citizens of the colonies had been waging disorganized warfare against the British soldiers through incidents similar to the Boston riot, but nothing of benefit had been accomplished. Their individual grievances had not been consolidated under one master mind. No group of individuals had put their hearts, minds, souls, and bodies together in one definite decision to settle their difficulty with the British once and for all, until Adams, Hancock, and Lee all got together. Meanwhile, the British were not idle. They, too, were doing some planning and masterminding on their own account 
with the advantage of having back of them money and organized soldiery. The Crown appointed Gage to supplant Hutchison as the governor of Massachusetts. One of the new governor's first acts was to send a messenger to call on Samuel Adams for the purpose of endeavoring to stop his opposition by fear. We can best understand the spirit of what happened by quoting the conversation between Colonel Fenton, the messenger sent by Gage, and Samuel Adams. Colonel Fenton. I have been authorized by Governor Gage to assure you, Mr. Adams, that the governor has been empowered to confer upon you such benefits as would be satisfactory, upon the condition that you engaged in ceasing in your opposition to the measures of the government. It is the governor's advice to you, sir, not to incur the further displeasure of his majesty. Your conduct has been such as makes you liable to penalties of an edict of Henry the Eighth, by which persons can be sent to England for trial for treason, or miss prison of treason at the discretion of a governor of a province. But by changing your political course, you will not only receive great personal advantages, but you will make your peace with the king. Samuel Adams had the choice of two decisions. He could cease his opposition and receive personal bribes, or he could continue and run the risk of being hanged. Clearly the time had come when Adams was forced to reach instantly a decision, which could have cost him his life. The majority of men would have found it difficult to reach just such a decision. The majority would have sent back an evasive reply, but not Adams. He insisted upon Colonel Fenton's word of honor that the colonel would deliver to the governor the answer exactly as Adams would give it to him. Adams' answer was, Then you may tell Governor Gage that I trust I have long since made my peace with the King of Kings. No personal consideration shall induce me to abandon the righteous cause of my country. And tell Governor Gage it is the advice of Samuel Adams to him to no longer insult the feelings of an exasperated people. Comment as to the character of this man seems unnecessary. It must be obvious to all who read this astounding message that its sender possessed loyalty of the highest order. This is important. Racketeers and dishonest politicians have prostituted the honor for which such men as Adams died. When Governor Gage received Adams' caustic reply, he flew into a rage and issued a proclamation which read, I do hereby, in His Majesty's name, offer and promise His most gracious pardon to all persons who shall forthwith lay down their arms and return to the duties of peaceable subjects, excepting only from the benefit of such pardon Samuel Adams and John Hancock, whose offenses are of too flagrant a nature to admit of any other consideration but that of condemned punishment. As one might say in modest slang, Adams and Hancock were on the spot. The threat of the irate governor forced the two men to reach another decision equally as dangerous. They hurriedly called a secret meeting of their staunchest followers. Here the mastermind began to take on momentum. After the meeting had been called to order, Adams locked the door, placed the key in his pocket, and informed all present that it was imperative that a congress of the colonists be organized, and that no man should leave the room until the decision for such a congress had been reached. Great excitement followed. Some weighed the possible consequences of such radicalism, old man fear. Some expressed grave doubt as to the wisdom of so definite a decision in defiance of the crown. Locked in that room were two men immune to fear, blind to the possibility of failure, Hancock and Adams. Through the influence of their minds, the others were induced to agree that through the Correspondence Committee, arrangements should be made for a meeting of the First Continental Congress to be held in Philadelphia September 5, 1774. Remember this date. It's actually more important than July 4, 1776. If there had been no decision to hold a Continental Congress, there could have been no signing of the Declaration of Independence. Before the first meeting of the new Congress, another leader in a different section of the country was deep in the throes of publishing a summary view of the rights of British America. He was Thomas Jefferson of the province of Virginia, whose relationship to Lord Dunmore, the representative of the Crown in Virginia, was as strained as that of Hancock and Adams were with their governor. Shortly after his famous Summary of Rights was published, Jefferson was informed that he was subject to prosecution for high treason against His Majesty's government. Inspired by the threat, one of Jefferson's colleagues, Patrick Henry, boldly spoke his mind, concluding his remarks with a sentence which shall remain forever a classic. 
If this be treason, then make the most of it. It was such men as these who, without power, without authority, without military strength, without money, sat in solemn consideration of the destiny of the colonies, beginning at the opening of the First Continental Congress and continuing at intervals for two years, until on June 7, 1776, Richard Henry Lee arose, addressed the chair, and to the startled assembly made this motion. Gentlemen, I make the motion that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states, that they be absolved from all allegiance to the British crown, and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved. Lee's astounding motion was discussed fervently and at such length that he began to lose patience. Finally, after days of arguments, he again took the floor and declared in a clear, firm voice, Mr. President, we have discussed this issue for days. It is the only course for us to follow. Why then, sir, do we longer delay? Why still deliberate? Let this happy day give birth to an American republic. Let her arise, not to devastate and to conquer, but to reestablish the reign of peace and of law. The eyes of Europe are fixed upon us. She demands of us a living example of freedom that may exhibit a contrast in the felicity of the citizen to the ever-increasing tyranny. Before his motion was finally voted upon, Lee was called back to Virginia because of a serious family illness. But before leaving, he placed his cause in the hands of his friend Thomas Jefferson, who promised to fight until favorable action was taken. Shortly thereafter, the president of the Congress, John Hancock, appointed Jefferson as chairman of a committee to draw up a Declaration of Independence. Long and hard the committee labored on a document which would mean, when accepted by the Congress, that every man who signed it would be signing his own death warrant should the colonies lose in the fight with Great Britain which was sure to follow. The document was drawn, and on June 28th, the original draft was read before the Congress. For several days it was discussed, altered, and made ready. On July 4th, 1776, Thomas Jefferson stood before the assembly and fearlessly read the most momentous decision ever placed upon paper. What in the course of human events, it is necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another, and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind, requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. When Jefferson finished the document was voted upon, accepted, and signed by the fifty-six men, every one staking his own life upon his decision to write his name. By that decision came into existence a nation destined to bring to mankind forever the privilege of making decisions. By decisions made in a similar spirit of faith and only by such decisions can men solve their personal problems and win for themselves high estates of material and spiritual wealth. Let us not forget this. Analyze the events which led to the Declaration of Independence and be convinced that this nation which now holds a position of commanding respect and power among all nations of the world was born of a decision created by a mastermind, consisting of fifty-six men. Note well the fact that it was their decision which ensured the success of Washington's armies, because the spirit of that decision was in the heart of every soldier who fought with him, and served as a spiritual power which recognizes no such thing as failure. Note also, with great personal benefit, that the power which gave this nation its freedom is the self-same power that must be used by every individual who becomes self-determining. This power is made up of the principles described in this book. It will not be difficult to detect in the story of the Declaration of Independence at least six of these principles, desire, decision, faith, persistence, the mastermind, and organized planning. Throughout this philosophy will be found the suggestion that thought, backed by strong desire, has a tendency to transmute itself into its physical equivalent. Before passing on, I wish to leave with you the suggestion that one may find in this story, and in the story of the Organization of the United States Steel Corporation, a perfect description of the method by which thought makes this astounding transformation. In your search for the secret of the method, don't look for a miracle because you'll not find it. You will find only the eternal laws of nature. 
These laws are available to every person who has the faith and the courage to use them. They may be used to bring freedom to a nation or to accumulate riches. There is no charge save the time necessary to understand and appropriate them. Those who reach decisions promptly and definitely know what they want, and they generally get it. The leaders in every walk of life decide quickly and firmly. That is the major reason why they are leaders. The world has the habit of making room for the man whose words and actions show that he knows where he's going. Indecision is a habit which usually begins in youth. The habit takes on permanency as the youth goes through grade school, high school, and even through college without definiteness of purpose. The major weakness of all educational systems is that they neither teach nor encourage the habit of definite decision. It would be beneficial if no college would permit the enrollment of any student unless and until the student declared his major purpose in matriculating. It would be of still greater benefit if every student who enters the grade schools were compelled to accept training in the habit of decision and forced to pass a satisfactory examination on this very subject before being permitted to advance in the grades. The habit of indecision acquired because of the deficiencies of our school systems goes with the student into the occupation he chooses, if in fact he chooses his occupation. Generally, the youth just out of school seeks any job that can be found. He takes the first place he finds because he's fallen into the habit of indecision. 98 out of every 100 people working for wages today are in the positions they hold because they lack the definiteness of decision to plan a definite position and the knowledge of how to choose an employer. Definiteness of decision always requires courage, sometimes very great courage. The 56 men who signed the Declaration of Independence staked their lives on that decision to affix their signatures to that document. The person who reaches a definite decision to procure the particular job and make life pay the price that he asks does not stake his life on that decision. He stakes his economic freedom. Financial independence, riches, desirable business, and professional positions are not within reach of the person who neglects or refuses to expect, plan, and demand. The person who desires riches in the same spirit that Samuel Adams desired freedom for the colonies is sure to accumulate wealth. In the chapter on organized planning, you'll find complete instructions for marketing every type of personal service. You'll find also detailed information on how to choose the employer you prefer and the particular job you desire. These instructions will be of no value to you unless you definitely decide to organize them into a plan of action. Chapter 9. Persistence, the sustained effort necessary to induce faith, which is the eighth step toward riches. Persistence is an essential factor in the procedure of transmuting desire into its monetary equivalent. The basis of persistence is the power of will. Willpower and desire, when properly combined, make an irresistible pair. Men who accumulate great fortunes are generally known as cold-blooded and sometimes ruthless. Often they're misunderstood. What they have is willpower, which they mix with persistence and place back of their desires to ensure the attainment of their objective. Henry Ford has been generally misunderstood to be ruthless and cold-blooded. This misconception grew out of Ford's habit of following through in all of his plans with persistence. The majority of people are ready to throw their aims and purposes overboard and give up at the first sign of opposition or misfortune. A few carry on despite all opposition until they attain their goal. These few are the Fords, the Carnegies, Rockefellers, and Edisons. There may be no heroic connotation to the word persistence, but the quality is to the character of man what carbon is to steel. The building of fortune generally involves the application of the entire 13 factors of this philosophy. These principles must be understood. They must be applied with persistence by all who accumulate money. If you're following this book with the intention of applying the knowledge it conveys, your first test as to your persistence will come when you begin to follow the six steps described in the second chapter. Unless you're one of the two out of every 100 who already have a definite goal at which you're aiming, and a definite plan for its attainment, you may read the instructions and then pass on with your daily routine and never comply with those instructions. The author is checking up on you at this point because lack of persistence is one of the major causes of failure. Moreover, experience with thousands of people has proven that lack of persistence is a weakness common to the majority of men. It's a weakness which may be overcome by effort. 
the ease with which lack of persistence may be conquered, will depend entirely upon the intensity of one's desire. The starting point of all achievement is desire. Keep this constantly in mind. Weak desires bring weak results, just as small amounts of fire make small amounts of heat. If you find yourself lacking in persistence, this weakness may be remedied by building a stronger fire under your desires. Continue to read through to the end, then go back to chapter 2 and start immediately to carry out the instructions given in connection with the six steps. The eagerness with which you follow these instructions will indicate clearly how much or how little you really desire to accumulate money. If you find that you are indifferent, you may be sure that you've not yet acquired the money consciousness which you must possess before you can be sure of accumulating a fortune. Fortunes gravitate to men whose minds have been prepared to attract them, just as surely as water gravitates to the ocean. In this book may be found all of the stimuli necessary to attune any normal mind to the vibrations which will attract the object of one's desires. If you find your weak in persistence, center your attention upon the instructions contained in the chapter on power. Surround yourself with a master mind group, and through the cooperative efforts of the members of this group, you can develop persistence. You will find additional instructions for the development of persistence in the chapters on auto-suggestion and the subconscious mind. Follow the instructions outlined in these chapters until your habit nature hands over to your subconscious mind a clear picture of the object of your desire. From that point on, you'll not be handicapped by lack of persistence. Your subconscious mind works continuously while you're awake and while you're asleep. Spasmodic or occasional effort to apply the rules will be of no value to you. To get results, you must apply all of the rules until their application becomes a fixed habit with you. In no other way can you develop the necessary money consciousness. Poverty is attracted to the one whose mind is favorable to it, as money is attracted to him whose mind has been deliberately prepared to attract it, and through the same laws, poverty consciousness will voluntarily seize the mind which is not occupied with the money consciousness. A poverty consciousness develops without conscious application of habits favorable to it. The money consciousness must be created to order unless one is born with such a consciousness. Catch the full significance of the statements in the preceding paragraph and you'll understand the importance of persistence in the accumulation of a fortune. Without persistence, you'll be defeated even before you start. With persistence, you will win. If you've ever experienced a nightmare, you'll realize the value of persistence. You're lying in bed, half awake, with a feeling that you're about to smother. You are unable to turn over or to move a muscle. You realize that you must begin to regain control over your muscles. Through persistent effort of willpower, you finally manage to move the fingers of one hand. By continuing to move your fingers, you extend your control to the muscles of one arm until you can lift it. Then you gain control of the other arm in the same manner. You finally gain control over the muscles of one leg and then extend it to the other leg. Then, with one supreme effort of will, you regain complete control over your muscular system and snap out of your nightmare. The trick has been turned step by step. You may find it necessary to snap out of your mental inertia through a similar procedure, moving slowly at first and then increasing your speed until you gain complete control over your will. Be persistent, no matter how slowly you may at first have to move. With persistence will come success. If you select your mastermind group with care, you'll have in it at least one person who will aid you in the development of persistence. Some men who have accumulated great fortunes did so because of necessity. They developed the habit of persistence because they were so closely driven by circumstances that they had to become persistent. There is no substitute for persistence. It cannot be supplanted by any other quality. Remember this, and it will hearten you in the beginning when the going may seem difficult and slow. Those who have cultivated the habit of persistence seem to enjoy insurance against failure. No matter how many times they are defeated, they finally arrive up toward the top of the ladder. Sometimes it appears that there is a hidden guide whose duty is to test men through all sorts of discouraging experiences. Those who pick themselves up after defeat and keep on trying arrive, and the world cries, Bravo! I knew you could do it! The hidden guide lets no one enjoy great achievement without passing the persistence test. Those who can't take it simply don't make the grade. Those who can take it are bountifully rewarded for their persistence. 
They receive as their compensation whatever goal they're pursuing. That's not all. They receive something infinitely more important than material compensation, the knowledge that every failure brings with it the seed of an equivalent advantage. There are exceptions to this rule. A few people know from experience the soundness of persistence. They are the ones who have not accepted defeat as being anything more than temporary. They're the ones whose desires are so persistently applied that defeat is finally changed into victory. We who stand on the sidelines of life see the overwhelmingly large number who go down in defeat never to rise again. We see the few who take the punishment of defeat as an urge to greater effort. These fortunately never learn to accept life's reverse gear. But what we do not see, what most of us never suspect of existing, is the silent but irresistible power which comes to the rescue of those who fight in the face of discouragement. If we speak of this power at all, we call it persistence and we let it go at that. One thing we all know, if one does not possess persistence, one does not achieve noteworthy success in any calling. As these lines are being written, I look up from my work and see before me, less than a block away, the great mysterious Broadway, the graveyard of dead hopes, and the front porch of opportunity. From all over the world, people have come to Broadway seeking fame, fortune, power, love, or whatever it is that human beings call success. Once in a great while, someone steps out from the long procession of seekers, and the world hears that another person has mastered Broadway. But Broadway is not easily nor quickly conquered. She acknowledges talent, recognizes genius, pays off in money, only after one has refused to quit. Then we know he has discovered the secret of how to conquer Broadway. The secret is always inseparably attached to one word, persistence. The secret is told in the struggle of Fanny Hurst, whose persistence conquered the Great White Way. She came to New York in 1915 to convert writing into riches. The conversion did not come quickly, but it came. For four years, Miss Hirsch learned about the sidewalks of New York from first-hand experience. She spent her days laboring and her nights hoping. When hope grew dim, she did not say, All right, Broadway, you win. She said, Very well, Broadway. You may whip some, but not me. I'm going to force you to give up. One publisher, the Saturday Evening Post, sent her 36 rejection slips before she broke the ice and got a story across. The average writer, like the average in other walks of life, would have given up the job when the first rejection slip came. She pounded the pavements for four years to the tune of the publisher's no, because she was determined to win. Then came the payoff. The spell had been broken. The unseen guide had tested Fanny, and she could take it. From that time on, publishers made a beaten path to her door. Money came so fast that she hardly had time to count it. Then the moving picture men discovered her, and money came not in small change, but in floods. The moving picture rights to her latest novel, Great Laughter, brought $100,000, said to be the highest price ever paid for a story before publication. Her royalties from the sale of the book probably will run much more. Briefly, you have a description of what persistence is capable of achieving. Fanny Hurst is no exception. Wherever men and women accumulate great riches, you may be sure they first acquired persistence, Broadway will give any beggar a cup of coffee and a sandwich, but it demands persistence of those who go after the big stakes. Kate Smith will say amen when she reads this. For years she sang without money and without price before any microphone she could reach. Broadway said to her, come and get it if you can take it. She did take it until one happy day Broadway got tired and said, ah, what's the use? You don't know when you're whipped, so name your price and go to work in earnest. Miss Smith named her price. And it was plenty, a way up in figures so high that one week's salary is far more than most people make in a whole year. Verily, it pays to be persistent. And here's an encouraging statement which carries with it a suggestion of great significance. Thousands of singers who excel like Kate Smith are walking up and down Broadway looking for a break without success. Countless others have come and gone. Many of them sang well enough but they failed to make the grade because they lacked the courage to keep on keeping on until Broadway became tired of turning them away. Persistence is a state of mind, therefore, it can be cultivated. Like all states of mind, persistence is based upon definite causes, among them these. Definiteness of purpose. Knowing what one wants is the first and perhaps the most important step toward the development of persistence. A strong motive forces one to surmount many difficulties. Desire. 
it is comparatively easy to acquire and to maintain persistence in pursuing the object of intense desire. Self-reliance. Believe in one's ability to carry out a plan encourages one to follow the plan through with persistence. Self-reliance can be developed through the principle described in the chapter on auto-suggestion. Definiteness of plans. Organized plans, even though they may be weak and entirely impractical, encourage persistence. Accurate knowledge. Knowing that one's plans are sound based upon experience or observation encourages persistence. Guessing instead of knowing destroys persistence. Cooperation. Sympathy, understanding, and harmonious cooperation with others tend to develop persistence. Willpower. The habit of concentrating one's thoughts upon the building of plans for the attainment of a definite purpose leads to persistence. Habit. Persistence is the direct result of habit. The mind absorbs and becomes a part of the daily experiences upon which it feeds. Fear, which is the worst of all enemies, can be effectively cured by forced repetition of the words courage. Everyone who has seen active service in war knows this. Before leaving the subject of persistence, take inventory of yourself and determine in what particular, if any, you're lacking in this essential quality. Measure yourself courageously, point by point, and see how many of the eight factors of persistence that you lack. The analysis may lead to discoveries that will give you a new grip on yourself. Here you'll find the real enemies which stand between you and noteworthy achievement. Here you'll find not only the symptoms indicating weakness of persistence, but also the deeply seated subconscious causes of this weakness. Study the list carefully and face yourself squarely. If you really wish to know who you are and what you are capable of doing, these are the weaknesses which must be mastered by all who will accumulate riches. Failure to recognize and to clearly define exactly what one wants. Procrastination with or without cause, usually backed up with a formidable array of alibis and excuses. Lack of interest in acquiring specialized knowledge. Indecision, the habit of passing the buck on all occasions instead of facing issues squarely, also backed by alibis. The habit of relying upon alibis instead of creating definite plans for the solution of problems. Self-satisfaction. There is but little remedy for this affliction and no hope for those who suffer from it. Indifference. Usually reflected in one's readiness to compromise on all occasions rather than meet opposition and fight it. The habit of blaming others for one's mistakes and accepting unfavorable circumstances as being unavoidable. Weakness of desire due to neglect in the choice of motives that impel action. Willingness, even eagerness to quit at the first sign of defeat, based upon one or more of the six basic fears. Lack of organized plans, placed in writing where they may be analyzed. The habit of neglecting to move on ideas or to grasp opportunity when it presents itself. Wishing instead of willing. The habit of compromising with poverty instead of aiming at riches. General absence of ambition to be, to do, and to own. Searching for all of the shortcuts to riches, trying to get without giving, a fair equivalent, usually reflected in the habit of gambling, endeavoring to drive sharp bargains. Fear of criticism. Failure to create plans and to put them into action because of what other people will think, do, or say. This enemy belongs at the head of the list because it generally exists in one subconscious mind where its presence is not recognized. See the six basic fears in a later chapter. Let's examine some of the symptoms of the fear of criticism. The majority of people permit relatives, friends, and the public at large to so influence them that they can't live their own lives because they fear criticism. Huge numbers of people make mistakes in marriage, stand by the bargain, and go through life miserable and unhappy because they fear criticism which may follow if they correct the mistake. Anyone who has submitted to this form of fear knows the irreparable damage it does by destroying ambition, self-reliance, and the desire to achieve. Millions of people neglect to acquire belated educations after having left school because they fear criticism. Countless numbers of men and women, both young and old, permit relatives to wreck their lives in the name of duty because they fear criticism. Duty does not require any person to submit to the destruction of his personal ambitions and the right to live his own life in his own way. People refuse to take chances in business because they fear the criticism which may follow if they fail. The fear of criticism in such cases is stronger than the desire to succeed. 
Too many people refuse to set high goals for themselves or even neglect selecting a career because they fear the criticism of relatives and friends who may say, don't aim so high, people will think you're crazy. When Andrew Carnegie suggested that I devote 20 years to the organization of a philosophy of individual achievement, my first impulse of thought was fear of what people might say. The suggestion set up a goal for me, far out of proportion to any I had ever conceived. As quick as a flash, my mind began to create alibis and excuses, all of them traceable to the inherent fear of criticism. Something inside of me said, you can't do it. The job is too big and it requires too much time. What will your relatives think of you? How will you earn a living? No one has ever organized a philosophy of success. What right have you to believe you can do it? Who are you, anyway, to aim so high? Remember your humble birth? What do you know about philosophy? People will think you're crazy, and they did. Why hasn't some other person done this before now? These and many other questions flashed into my mind and demanded attention. It seemed as if the whole world had suddenly turned its attention to me with the purpose of ridiculing me into giving up all desire to carry out Mr. Carnegie's suggestion. I had a fine opportunity then and there to kill off ambition before it gained control of me. Later in life, after having analyzed thousands of people, I discovered that most ideas are stillborn and need the breath of life injected into them through definite plans of immediate action. The time to nurse an idea is at the time of its birth. Every minute it lives, it gives a better chance of surviving. The fear of criticism is at the bottom of the destruction of most ideas which never reach the planning and action stage. Many people believe that material success is the result of favorable breaks. There's an element of ground for the belief, but those depending entirely upon luck are nearly always disappointed because they overlook another important factor which must be present before one can be sure of success. It's the knowledge with which favorable breaks can be made to order. During the Depression, W.C. Fields, the comedian, lost all of his money and found himself without income, without a job, and without his means of earning a living, vaudeville, which no longer existed. Moreover, he was past 60 when many men consider themselves old. He was so eager to stage a comeback that he offered to work without pay in a new field, which was movies. In addition to his other troubles, he fell and injured his neck. To many, that would have been the place to give up and quit, but Fields was persistent. He knew that if he carried on, he would get the breaks sooner or later, and he did get them, but not by chance. Marie Dressler found herself down and out with her money gone with no job when she was about 60. She too went after the breaks and got them. Her persistence brought an astounding triumph late in life, long before the age when most men and women are done with ambition to achieve. Eddie Cantor lost his money in the 1929 stock crash, but he still had his persistence and his courage. With these plus two prominent eyes, he exploited himself back into an income of $10,000 a week. Verily, if one has persistence, one can get along very well without many other qualities. The only break anyone can afford to rely upon is a self-made break. These come through the application of persistence. The starting point is definiteness of purpose. Examine the first hundred people you meet. Ask them what they want most in life, and 98 of them will not be able to tell you. If you press them for an answer, some will say security. Many will say money. A few will say happiness. Others will say fame and power, and still others will say social recognition, ease in living, ability to sing and dance, or write. But none of them will be able to define these terms or give the slightest indication of a plan by which they hope to attain these vaguely expressed wishes. Riches do not respond to wishes. They respond only to definite plans, backed by definite desires, through constant persistence. There are four simple steps which leads to the habit of persistence. They call for no great amount of intelligence, no particular amount of education, and but little time or effort. The necessary steps are a definite purpose backed by burning desire for its fulfillment, a definite plan expressed in continuous action, a mind closed tightly against all negative and discouraging influences, including negative suggestions of relatives, friends, and acquaintances, a friendly alliance with one or more persons who will encourage one to follow through with both plan and purpose. These four steps are essential for success in all walks of life. The entire purpose of the 13 principles of this philosophy is to enable one to take these four steps as a matter of habit. These are the steps by which one may control one's economic destiny. 
They are the steps that lead to freedom and independence of thought. They are the steps that lead to riches in small or great quantities. They lead the way to power, fame, and worldly recognition. They are the four steps which guarantee favorable breaks. They are the steps that convert dreams into physical realities. They lead also to the mastery of fear, discouragement, and indifference. There's a magnificent reward for all who learn to take these four steps. It's the privilege of writing one's own ticket and of making life yield whatever price is asked. I have no way of knowing the facts, but I venture to conjecture that Mrs. Wallace Simpson's great love for a man was not accidental nor the result of favorable breaks alone. There was a burning desire and careful searching at every step of the way. Her first duty was to love. What is the greatest thing on earth? The master called it love, not man-made rules, criticism, bitterness, slander, or political marriages, but love. She knew what she wanted, not after she met the Prince of Wales, but long before that. Twice when she had failed to find it, she had the courage to continue her search. To thine own self be true, and it must follow as the night the day, thou canst not then be false to any man. Her rise from obscurity was one of the slow, progressive, persistent order, but it was sure. She triumphed over unbelievably long odds, and no matter who you are or what you may think of Wallace Simpson or the king who gave up his crown for her, she is an astounding example of applied persistence, an instructor on the rules of self-determination, from whom the entire world might profitably take lessons. When you think of Wallace Simpson, think of one who knew what she wanted and shook the greatest empire on earth to get it. Women who complain that this is a man's world, that women do not have an equal chance to win, owe it to themselves to study carefully the life of this unusual woman, who, at an age which most women consider old, captured the affections of the most desirable bachelor in the entire world. And what of King Edward? What lesson may we learn from his part in the world's greatest drama of recent times? Did he pay too high a price for the affections of the woman of his choice? Surely no one can give the correct answer. The rest of us can only conjecture. This much we know. The king came into the world without his own consent. He was born to great riches without requesting them. He was persistently sought in marriage. Politicians and statesmen throughout Europe tossed dowagers and princesses at his feet. Because he was the firstborn of his parents, he inherited a crown which he did not seek and perhaps did not desire. For more than 40 years, he was not a free agent, could not live his life in his own way, had but little privacy, and finally assumed duties inflicted upon him when he ascended the throne. Some will say with all these blessings, King Edward should have found peace of mind, contentment, and joy of living. The truth is that back of all the privileges of a crown, all the money, the fame, and the power inherited by King Edward, there was an emptiness which could be filled only by love. His greatest desire was for love. Long before he met Wallace Simpson, he doubtless felt this great universal emotion, tugging at the strings of his heart, beating upon the door of his soul, and crying out for expression. And when he met a kindred spirit, crying out for the same holy privilege of expression, he recognized it, and without fear or apology, he opened his heart, and he bade it enter. All the scandal mongers in the world cannot destroy the beauty of this international drama through which two people found love and had the courage to face open criticism, renounce all else to give it holy expression. King Edward's decision to give up the crown of the world's most powerful empire for the privilege of going the remainder of the way through life with the woman of his choice was a decision that required courage. The decision also had a price, but who has the right to say the price was too great? Surely not he who said, He among you who is without sin, let him cast the first stone. As a suggestion to any evil-minded person who chooses to find fault with the Duke of Windsor, because his desire was for love, and for openly declaring his love for Wallace Simpson, and giving up his throne for her, let it be remembered that the open declaration was not essential. He could have followed the custom of clandestine liaison, which has prevailed in Europe for centuries without giving up either his throne or the woman of his choice, and there would have been no complaint from either church or latte. But this unusual man was built of sterner stuff. His love was clean. It was deep and sincere. It represented the one thing which, above all else, he truly desired. Therefore, he took what he wanted and paid the price that was demanded. If Europe had been blessed with more rulers with the human heart and the traits of honesty of ex-King Edward for the past century, 
That unfortunate hemisphere now seething with greed, hate, lust, political connivance, and threats of war would have a different and a better story to tell, a story in which love and not hate would rule. In the words of Stuart Austin Weir, we raise our cup and drink this toast to ex-King Edward and Wallace Simpson. Blessed is the man who has come to know that our muted thoughts are our sweetest thoughts. Blessed is the man who, from the blackest depths, can see the luminous figure of love and sing, sing, and singing say, Sweeter far than uttered lays are the thoughts I have of you. In these words would we pay tribute to the two people who, more than all others of modern times, have been the victims of criticism and the recipients of abuse, because they found life's greatest treasure and claimed it. Mrs. Simpson read and approved this analysis. Most of the world will applaud the Duke of Windsor and Wallace Simpson because of their persistence in searching until they found life's greatest reward. All of us can profit by following their example in our own search for that which we demand of life. What mystical power gives to men of persistence the capacity to master difficulties? Does the quality of persistence set up in one's mind form of a spiritual, mental, or chemical activity which gives one access to supernatural forces? Does infinite intelligence throw itself on the side of the person who still fights on after the battle has been lost, with the whole world on the opposing side? These and many other similar questions have arisen in my mind, as I have observed men like Henry Ford, who started at scratch and built an industrial empire of huge proportions, with little else in the way of the beginning but persistence. Or Thomas Edison, who with less than three months of schooling became the world's leading inventor and converted persistence into the talking machine, the moving picture machine, and the incandescent light, to say nothing of half a hundred other useful inventions. I had the happy privilege of analyzing both Mr. Edison and Mr. Ford, year by year, over a long period of years, and therefore the opportunity to study them at close range, so I speak from actual knowledge when I say that I found no quality save persistence in either of them that even remotely suggested the major source of their stupendous achievements. As one makes an impartial study of the prophets, philosophers, the miracle men, and religious leaders of the past, one is drawn to the inevitable conclusion that persistence, concentration of effort, and definiteness of purpose were the major sources of their achievements. Consider, for example, the strange and fascinating story of Muhammad. Analyze his life. Compare him with men of achievement in this modern age of industry and finance, and observe how they have one outstanding trait in common, persistence. If you are keenly interested in studying the strange power which gives potency to persistence, read a biography of Muhammad, especially the one by Esed Bey. This brief review of that book by Thomas Segru in the Herald Tribune will provide a preview of that rare treat in store for those who take the time to read the entire story of one of the most astounding examples of the power of persistence known to civilization. The Last Great Prophet, reviewed by Thomas Segru. Muhammad was a prophet, but he never performed a miracle. He was not a mystic. He had no formal schooling. He did not begin his mission until he was forty. When he announced that he was the messenger of God, bringing word of the true religion, he was ridiculed and labeled a lunatic. Children would trip him, and women threw filth upon him. He was banished from his native city, Mecca, and his followers were stripped of their worldly goods and sent into the desert after him. When he had been preaching ten years, he had nothing to show for it but banishment, poverty, and ridicule. Yet before another ten years had passed, he was the dictator of all Arabia, ruler of Mecca, and the head of a new world religion, which was to sweep to the Danube and the Pyrenees before exhausting the impetus he gave it. That impetus was threefold, the power of words, the efficacy of prayer, and man's kinship with God. His career never made sense. Mohammed was born to impoverished members of a leading family of Mecca, because Mecca, the crossroads of the world, home of the magic stone called the Kaaba, great city of trade and the center of trade routes, was unsanitary. Its children were sent to be raised in the desert by Bedouins. Mohammed was thus nurtured, drawing strength and health from the milk of nomad vicarious mothers. He tended sheep and soon hired out to a rich widow as leader of her caravans. He traveled to all parts of the Eastern world, talked with many men of diverse beliefs, and observed the decline of Christianity into warring sects. When he was twenty-eight, Khadija, the widow, looked upon him with favor and married him. Her father would have objected to such a marriage, so she got him drunk and held him up while he gave the paternal blessing. 
For the next 12 years, Muhammad lived as a rich and respected and very shrewd trader. Then he took to wandering in the desert, and one day he returned with the first verse of the Quran and called Khadijah that the archangel Gabriel had appeared to him and said that he was to be the messenger of God. The Quran then revealed word of God was the closest thing to a miracle in Muhammad's life. He had not been a poet. He had no gift of words. Yet the verse of the Quran, as he received them and recited them to the faithful, were better than any verses which the professional poets of the tribes could produce. This to the Arabs was a miracle. To them the gift of words was the greatest gift. The poet was all-powerful. In addition, the Quran said that all men were equal before God, that the world should be a democratic state, Islam. It was this political heresy, plus Muhammad's desire to destroy all the 360 idols in the courtyard of the Kaaba, which brought about his banishment. The idols brought the desert tribes to Mecca, and that meant trade. So the businessmen of Mecca, the capitalists of which he had been one, set upon Muhammad. Then he retreated to the desert and demanded sovereignty over the world. The rise of Islam began. Out of the desert came a flame which would not be extinguished, a democratic army fighting as a unit and prepared to die without wincing. Muhammad had invited the Jews and Christians to join him, for he was not building a new religion. He was calling all who believed in one God to join in a single faith. If the Jews and Christians had accepted his invitation, Islam would have conquered the world. They didn't. They would not even accept Muhammad's innovation of humane warfare. When the armies of the Prophet entered Jerusalem, not a single person was killed because of his faith. When the Crusaders entered the city centuries later, not a Muslim man, woman, or child was spared. But the Christians did accept one Muslim idea, the place of learning, the university. Chapter 10. Power of the Master Mind, the Driving Force, the Ninth Step Toward Riches. Power is essential for success in the accumulation of money. Plans are inert and useless without sufficient power to translate them into action. This chapter will describe the method by which an individual may attain and apply power. Power may be defined as organized and intelligently directed knowledge. Power, as the term is here used, refers to organized effort sufficient to enable an individual to transmute desire into its monetary equivalent. Organized effort is produced through the coordination of effort of two or more people who work toward a definite end in a spirit of harmony. Power is required for the accumulation of money. Power is necessary for the retention of money after it's been accumulated. Let us ascertain how power may be acquired. If power is organized knowledge, let us examine the sources of knowledge. Infinite Intelligence this source of knowledge may be contacted through the procedure described in another chapter with the aid of creative imagination. Accumulated Experience The accumulated experience of man, or that portion of it which has been organized and recorded, may be found in any well-equipped public library. An important part of this accumulated experience is taught in public schools and colleges where it's been classified and organized. Experiment and Research in the field of science and in practically every other walk of life, men are gathering, classifying, and organizing new facts daily. This is the source to which one must turn when knowledge is not available through accumulated experience. Here, too, the creative imagination must often be used. Knowledge may be acquired from any of the foregoing sources. It may be converted into power by organizing it into definite plans and by expressing those plans in terms of action. Examination of the three major sources of knowledge will readily disclose the difficulty that an individual would have if he depended upon his efforts alone in assembling knowledge and expressing it through definite plans in terms of action. If his plans are comprehensive and if they contemplate large proportions, he must generally induce others to cooperate with him before he can inject into them the necessary element of power. Gaining power through the master mind. The master mind may be defined as coordination of knowledge and effort in a spirit of harmony between two or more people for the attainment of a definite purpose. No individual may have great power without availing himself of the master mind. In a preceding chapter, instructions were given for the creation of plans for the purpose of translating desire into its monetary equivalent. If you carry out these instructions with persistence and intelligence and use discrimination in the selection of your mastermind group, 
your objective will have been halfway reached even before you begin to recognize it. So you may better understand the intangible potentialities of power available to you through a properly chosen mastermind group. We will here explain the two characteristics of the mastermind principle, one of which is economic in nature and the other psychic. The economic feature is obvious. Economic advantages may be created by any person who surrounds himself with the advice, counsel, and personal cooperation of a group of men who are willing to lend him wholehearted aid in a spirit of perfect harmony. This form of cooperation alliance has been the basis of nearly every great fortune. Your understanding of this great truth may definitely determine your financial status. The psychic phase of the mastermind principle is much more abstract, much more difficult to comprehend, because it has reference to the spiritual forces with which the human race as a whole is not well acquainted. You may catch a significant suggestion from this statement, no two minds ever come together without thereby creating a third invisible intangible force which may be likened to a third mind. Keep in fact that there are only two known elements in the whole universe, energy and matter. It's a well-known fact that matter may be broken down into units of molecules, atoms, and electrons. There are units of matter which may be isolated, separated, and analyzed. Likewise, there are units of energy. The human mind is a form of energy, a part of it being spiritual in nature. When the minds of two people are coordinated in a spirit of harmony, the spiritual units of energy of each mind form an affinity which constitutes the psychic phase of the master mind. The mastermind principle, or rather the economic feature of it, was first called to my attention by Andrew Carnegie over 25 years ago. Discovery of this principle was responsible for the choice of my life's work. Mr. Carnegie's mastermind group consisted of a staff of approximately 50 men with whom he surrounded himself for the definite purpose of manufacturing and marketing steel. He attributed his entire fortune to the power that he accumulated through this mastermind. Analyze the record of any man who has accumulated a great fortune, and many of those who have accumulated modest fortunes, and you'll find that they have either consciously or unconsciously employed the mastermind principle. Great power can be accumulated through no other principle. Energy is nature's universal set of building blocks, out of which she constructs every material thing in the universe, including man, and every form of animal and vegetable life. Through a process which only nature completely understands, she translates energy into matter. Nature's building blocks are available to man in the energy involved in thinking. Man's brain may be compared to an electric battery. It absorbs energy from the ether which permeates every atom of matter and fills the entire universe. It's a well-known fact that a group of electric batteries will provide more energy than a single battery. It's also a well-known fact that an individual battery will provide energy in proportion to the number and capacity of the cells it contains. The brain functions in a similar fashion. This accounts for the fact that some brains are more efficient than others and leads to this significant statement, a group of brains coordinated or connected in a spirit of harmony will provide more thought energy than a single brain just as a group of electric batteries will provide more energy than a single battery. Through this metaphor, it becomes immediately obvious that the mastermind principle holds the secret of power wielded by men who surround themselves with other men of brains. There follows now another statement which will lead still nearer to an understanding of the psychic phase of the mastermind principle. When a group of individual brains are coordinated and function in harmony, the increased energy created through that alliance becomes available to every individual brain in the group. It's well known that Henry Ford began his business career under the handicap of poverty, illiteracy, and ignorance. It's an equally well-known fact that within the inconceivably short period of 10 years, Mr. Ford mastered these three handicaps and that within 25 years, he made himself one of the richest men in America. Connect with this fact, the additional knowledge that Mr. Ford's most rapid strides became noticeable from the time he became a personal friend of Thomas Edison and you'll begin to understand what the influence of one mind upon another can accomplish. Go a step farther and consider the fact that Mr. Ford's most outstanding achievements began from the time that he formed the acquaintances of Harvey Firestone, John Burroughs, and Luther Burbank, each a man of great brain capacity, and you'll have further evidence that power may be produced through friendly alliance of minds. 
There is little, if any, doubt that Henry Ford is one of the best informed men in the business and the industrial world. The question of his wealth needs no discussion. Analyze Mr. Ford's intimate personal friends, some of whom have already been mentioned, and you'll be prepared to understand the following statement. Men take on the nature and the habits and the power of thought of those with whom they associate in a spirit of sympathy and harmony. Henry Ford whipped poverty, illiteracy, and ignorance by allying himself with great minds, whose vibrations of thought he absorbed into his own mind. Through his association with Edison, Burbank, Burroughs, and Firestone, Mr. Ford added to his own brain power the sum and substance of the intelligence, experience, knowledge, and the spiritual forces of these four men. Moreover, he appropriated and made use of the master mind principle through the methods of procedure described in this book. The principle is available to you. We've already mentioned Mahatma Gandhi. Perhaps the majority of those who have heard of Gandhi look upon him as merely an eccentric little man who goes around without formal wearing apparel and makes trouble for the British government. In reality, Gandhi is not eccentric, but he is the most powerful man now living. Estimated by the number of his followers and their faith in their leader, moreover, he is probably the most powerful man who has ever lived. His power is passive, but it's real. Let us study the method by which he attained his stupendous power. It may be explained in a few words. He came by power through inducing over 200 million people to coordinate with mind and body in a spirit of harmony for a definite purpose. In brief, Gandhi has accomplished a miracle, for it is a miracle when 200 million people can be induced, not forced, to cooperate in a spirit of harmony for a limitless time. If you doubt that this is a miracle, try to induce any two people to cooperate in a spirit of harmony for any length of time. Every man who manages a business knows what a difficult matter it is to get employees to work together in a spirit even remotely resembling harmony. The list of the chief sources from which power may be attained is, as you have seen, headed by infinite intelligence. When two or more people coordinate in a spirit of harmony and work toward a definite objective, they place themselves in position through that alliance to absorb power directly from the great universal storehouse of infinite intelligence. This is the greatest of all sources of power. It is the source to which the genius turns. It is the source to which every great leader turns, whether he may be conscious of the fact or not. The other two major sources from which the knowledge necessary for the accumulation of power may be obtained are no more reliable than the five senses of man. The senses are not always reliable. Infinite intelligence does not err. In subsequent chapters, the methods by which infinite intelligence may be most readily contacted will be adequately described. This is not a course on religion. No fundamental principle described in this book should be interpreted as being intended to interfere either directly or indirectly with any man's religious habits. This book has been confined exclusively to instructing the reader how to transmute the definite purpose of desire for money into its monetary equivalent. Read, think, and meditate as you read. Soon the entire subject will unfold and you will see it in perspective. You are now seeing the detail of the individual chapters. Money is as shy and elusive as the old-time maiden. It must be wooed and won by methods not unlike those used by a determined lover in pursuit of the girl of his choice. And coincidental as it is, the power used in the wooing of money is not greatly different from that used in wooing a maiden. That power, when successfully used in the pursuit of money, must be mixed with faith. It must be mixed with desire. It must be mixed with persistence. It must be applied through a plan, and that plan must be set into action. When money comes in quantities known as the big money, it flows to the one who accumulates it as easily as water flows downhill. There exists a great unseen stream of power, which may be compared to a river, except that one side flows in one direction, carrying all who get into that side of the stream onward and upward to wealth, and the other side flows in the opposite direction, carrying all who are unfortunate enough to get into it and not able to extricate themselves from it, downward to misery and into poverty. Every man who has accumulated a great fortune has recognized the existence of this stream of life. It consists of one's thinking process. The positive emotions of thought form the side of the stream which carries one to fortune. The negative emotions form the side which carries one down to poverty. 
This carries a thought of stupendous importance to the person who is following this book with the object of accumulating a fortune. If you are in the side of the stream of power which leads to poverty, this may serve as an oar by which you may propel yourself over into the other side of the stream. It can serve you only through application and use. Merely reading and passing judgment on it either one way or another will in no way benefit you. Some people undergo the experience of alternating between the positive and negative sides of the stream, being at times on the positive side and at times on the negative side. The Wall Street crash of 1929 swept millions of people from the positive to the negative side of the stream. These millions are struggling, some of them in desperation and fear, to get back to the positive side of the stream. This book was written especially for those millions. Poverty and riches often change places. The crash taught the world this truth, although the world will not long remember the lesson. Poverty may and generally does voluntarily take the place of riches. When riches take the place of poverty, the change is usually brought about through well-conceived and carefully executed plans. Poverty needs no plan. It needs no one to aid it because it's bold and it's ruthless. Riches are shy and timid. They have to be attracted. Anybody can wish for riches, and most people do. But only a few know that a definite plan plus a burning desire for wealth are the only dependable means of accumulating wealth. Chapter 11. The Mystery of Sex. Transmutation. The Tenth Step Toward Riches. The meaning of the word transmute is, in simple language, the changing or transferring of one element or form of energy into another. The emotion of sex brings into being a state of mind. Because of ignorance on the subject, this state of mind is generally associated with the physical, and because of improper influences to which most people have been subjected, in acquiring knowledge of sex, things essentially physical have highly biased the mind. The emotion of sex has back of it the possibility of three constructive potentialities. They are, number one, the perpetuation of mankind. Number two, the maintenance of health. As a therapeutic agency, it has no equal. The transformation of mediocrity into genius through transmutation. Sex transmutation is simple and easily explained. It means the switching of the mind from thoughts of physical expression to thoughts of some other nature. Sex desire is the most powerful of all human desires. When driven by this desire, men develop keenness of imagination, courage, willpower, persistence, and creative ability unknown to them at other times. So strong and impelling is the desire for sexual contact that men freely run the risk of life and reputation to indulge it. When harnessed and redirected along other lines, this motivating force maintains all of its attributes of keenness, of imagination, courage, or etc., which may be used as powerful creative forces in literature, art, or any other profession or calling, including, of course, the accumulation of riches. The transmutation of sex energy calls for the exercise of willpower, to be sure, but the reward is worth the effort. The desire for sexual expression is inborn, and it's natural. The desire cannot and should not be submerged or eliminated, but it should be given an outlet through forms of expression which enrich the body, mind, and the spirit of man. If not given this form of outlet through transmutation, it will seek outlets through purely physical channels. A river may be dammed and its water controlled for a time, but eventually it will force an outlet. The same is true of the emotion of sex. It may be submerged and controlled for a time, but its very nature causes it to be ever-seeking means of expression. If it's not transmuted into some creative effort, it will find a less worthy outlet. Fortunate indeed is the person who has discovered how to give sex emotion an outlet through some form of creative effort, for he has, by that discovery, lifted himself to the status of a genius. Scientific research has disclosed these significant facts. The men of greatest achievement are men with highly developed sex natures, men who have learned the art of sex transmutation. The men who have accumulated great fortunes and achieved outstanding recognition in literature, art, industry, architecture, and the professions were motivated by the influence of a woman. The research from which these astounding discoveries were made went back through the pages of biography and history for more than 2,000 years. Wherever there was evidence available in connection with the lives of men and women of great achievement, it indicated most convincingly that they possessed highly developed sexual natures. 
The emotion of sex is an irresistible force against which there can be no such opposition as an immovable body. When driven by this emotion, men become gifted with a superpower for action. Understand this truth, and you'll catch the significance of the statement that sex transmutation will lift one to the status of a genius. The emotion of sex contains the secret of creative ability. Destroy the sex glands, whether in man or beast, and you've removed a major source of action. For proof of this, observe what happens to any animal after it's been castrated. A bull becomes as docile as a cow after it's been altered sexually. Sex alteration takes out of the male, whether man or beast, all of the fight that was in him. Sex alteration of the female has the same effect. The human mind responds to stimuli through which it may be keyed up to high rates of vibration, known as enthusiasm, creative imagination, intense desire, etc. The stimuli to which the mind responds most freely are the desire for sexual expression, love, a burning desire for fame, power, or financial gain, we mean money, and music. Friendship between either those of the same sex or those of the opposite sex. A mastermind alliance based upon the harmony of two or more people who ally themselves for spiritual or temporal advancement. Mutual suffering, such as that experienced by people who are persecuted. Auto-suggestion, fear, narcotics, and alcohol. The desire for sexual expression comes at the head of the list of stimuli which most effectively step up the vibrations of the mind and start the wheels of physical action. Eight of these stimuli are natural and constructive. Two are destructive. The list is here presented for the purpose of enabling you to make a comparative study of the major sources of mind stimulation. From this study, it will be readily seen that the emotion of sex is, by great odds, the most intense and powerful of all mind stimuli. This comparison is necessary as a foundation for proof of the statement that transmutation of sexual energy may lift one to the status of a genius. Let's find out what constitutes a genius. Some wiseacre has said that a genius is a man who wears long hair, eats queer food, lives alone, and serves as a target for the joke makers. A better definition of a genius is a man who has discovered how to increase the vibrations of thought to the point where he can freely communicate with sources of knowledge not available through the ordinary rate of vibration of thought. The person who thinks will want to ask some questions concerning this definition of genius. The first question will be, how may one communicate with sources of knowledge which are not available through the ordinary rate of vibration of thought? The next question will be, are there known sources of knowledge which are available only to genii? And if so, what are these sources and exactly how may they be reached? We'll offer proof of the soundness of some of the more important statements made in this book, or at least we shall offer evidence through which you may secure your own proof through experimentation. And in doing so, we shall answer both of these questions. The reality of a sixth sense has been fairly well established. The sixth sense is creative imagination. The faculty of creative imagination is one which the majority of people never use during an entire lifetime, and if used at all, it usually happens by mere accident. A relatively small number of people use, with deliberation and purpose of forethought, the faculty of creative imagination. Those who use this faculty voluntarily and with understanding of its functions are genii. The faculty of creative imagination is the direct link between the finite mind of man and infinite intelligence. All the so-called revelations referred to in the realm of religion and all discoveries of basic or new principles in the field of invention take place through the faculty of creative imagination. When ideas or concepts flash into one's mind through what is popularly called a hunch, they come from one or more of the following sources. Infinite intelligence. One subconscious mind wherein is stored every sense, impression, and thought impulse which ever reached the brain through any of the five senses. From the mind of some other person who has just released the thought, or picture of the idea or concept through conscious thought, or from the other person's subconscious storehouse, there are no other known sources from which inspired ideas or hunches may be received. The creative imagination functions best when the mind is vibrating, due to some form of mind stimulation, at an exceedingly high rate. That is, when the mind is functioning at a rate of vibration higher than that of ordinary, normal thought. When brain action has been stimulated through one or more of the ten mind stimulants, 
It has the effect of lifting the individual far above the horizon of ordinary thought and permits him to envision distance, scope, and quality of thoughts not available on the lower plane, such as that occupied while one is engaged in the solution of the problems of business and professional routine. When lifted to this higher level of thought through any form of mind stimulation, an individual occupies relatively the same position as one who has ascended in an airplane to a height from which he may see over and beyond the horizon line, which limits his vision, while on the ground. Moreover, while on this higher level of thought, the individual is not hampered or bound by any of the stimuli which circumscribe and limit his vision while wrestling with the problems of gaining the three basic necessities of food, clothing, and shelter. He is in a world of thought in which the ordinary workaday thoughts have been as effectively removed as are the hills and valleys and other limitations of physical vision when he rises in an airplane. While on this exalted plane of thought, the creative faculty of the mind is given freedom for action. The way has been cleared for the sixth sense to function. It becomes receptive to ideas which could not reach the individual under any other circumstances. The sixth sense is the faculty which marks the difference between a genius and an ordinary individual. The creative faculty becomes more alert and receptive to vibrations originating outside the individual's subconscious mind. The more this faculty is used and the more the individual relies upon it and makes demands upon it for thought impulses. This faculty can be cultivated and developed only through use. That which is known as one's conscience operates entirely through the faculty of the sixth sense. The great artists, writers, musicians, and poets become great because they acquire the habit of relying upon the still small voice which speaks from within through the faculty of creative imagination. It's a well-known fact to people who have keen imaginations that their best ideas come through so-called hunches. There's a great orator who does not attain to greatness until he closes his eyes and begins to rely entirely upon the faculty of creative imagination. When asked why he closed his eyes just before the climaxes of his oratory, he replied, I do it because then I speak through ideas which come to me from within. One of America's most successful and best known financiers followed the habit of closing his eyes for two or three minutes before making a decision. When asked why he did this, he replied, With my eyes closed, I am able to draw upon a source of superior intelligence. The late Dr. Elmer R. Gates of Chevy Chase, Maryland, created more than 200 useful patents, many of them basic, through the process of cultivating and using the creative faculty. His method is both significant and interesting to one interested in attaining to the status of genius, in which category Dr. Gates unquestionably belonged. Dr. Gates was one of the really great, though less publicized, scientists of the world. In his laboratory, he had what he called his personal communication room. It was practically soundproof and so arranged that all light could be shut out. It was equipped with a small table on which he kept a pad of writing paper. In front of the table, on the wall, was an electric push button which controlled the lights. When Dr. Gates desired to draw upon the forces available to him through his creative imagination, he would go into this room, seat himself at the table, shut off the lights, and concentrate upon the known factors of the invention on which he was working, remaining in that position until ideas began to flash into his mind in connection with the unknown factors of the invention. On one occasion, ideas came through so fast that he was forced to write for almost three hours. When the thoughts stopped flowing and he examined his notes, he found they contained a minute description of principles which had not a parallel among the known data of the scientific world. Moreover, the answer to his problem was intelligently presented in those notes. In this manner, Dr. Gates completed over 200 patents which had begun but not completed by half-baked brains. Evidence of the truth of this statement is in the United States Patent Office. Dr. Gates earned his living by sitting for ideas for individuals and corporations. Some of the largest corporations in America paid him substantial fees by the hour for sitting for ideas. The reasoning faculty is often faulty because it is largely guided by one's accumulated experience. Not all knowledge which one accumulates through experience is accurate. Ideas received through the creative faculty are much more reliable for the reason that they come from sources more reliable than any which are available to the reasoning faculty of the mind. The major difference between the genius and the ordinary crank inventor 
may be found in the fact that the genius works through his faculty of creative imagination, while the crank knows nothing of this faculty. The scientific inventor, like Mr. Edison and Dr. Gates, makes use of both the synthetic and the creative faculties of this imagination. For example, the scientific inventor, or genius, begins an invention by organizing and combining the known ideas or principles accumulated through experience through the synthetic faculty, the reasoning faculty. If he finds this accumulated knowledge to be insufficient for the completion of his invention, he then draws upon the source of knowledge available to him through his creative faculty. The method by which he does this varies with the individual, but this is the sum and substance of his procedure. He stimulates his mind so that it vibrates on a higher than average plane, using one or more of the ten mind stimulants or some other stimulant of his choice. He concentrates upon the known factors, the finished part of his invention, and creates in his mind a perfect picture of unknown factors, the unfinished part of his invention. He holds this picture in mind until it has been taken over by the subconscious mind, then relaxes by clearing his mind of all thought and waits for his answers to flash into his mind. Sometimes the results are both definite and immediate. At other times the results are negative, depending upon the state of development of the sixth sense, or creative faculty. Mr. Edison tried out more than 10,000 different combinations of ideas through the synthetic faculty of his imagination before he tuned in through the creative faculty and got the answer which perfected the incandescent light. His experience was similar when he produced the talking machine. There is plenty of reliable evidence that the faculty of creative imagination exists. This evidence is available through accurate analysis of men who have become leaders in their respective callings without having had extensive educations. Lincoln was a notable example of a great leader who achieved greatness through the discovery and use of his faculty of creative imagination. He discovered and began to use this faculty as the result of the stimulation of love which he experienced after he met Anne Rutledge, a statement of the highest significance in connection with the study of the source of genius. The pages of history are filled with the records of great leaders whose achievements may be traced directly to the influence of women who arouse the creative faculties of their minds through the stimulation of sexual desire. Napoleon Bonaparte was one of these. When inspired by his first wife, Josephine, he was irresistible and invincible. When his better judgment or reasoning faculty prompted him to put Josephine aside, he began to decline. His defeat and St. Helena were not far distant. If good taste would permit, we might easily mention scores of men well known to the American people who climbed to great heights of achievement under the stimulating influence of their wives only to drop back to destruction after money and power went to their heads and they put aside the old wife for a new one. Napoleon was not the only man to discover that sexual influence from the right source is more powerful than any substitute of expediency which may be created by mere reason. The human mind responds to stimulation. Among the greatest and most powerful of these stimuli is the urge of sex. When harnessed and transmuted, this driving force is capable of lifting men into that higher sphere of thought which enables them to master the sources of worry and petty annoyance which beset their pathway on the lower plane. Unfortunately, only those who are genius have made the discovery. Others have accepted the experience of sexual urge without discovering one of its major potentialities, a fact which accounts for the great number of others as compared to the limited number of those who are genius. For the purpose of refreshing the memory in connection with the facts available from the biographies of certain men, we here present the names of a few men of outstanding achievement, each of whom was known to have been of a highly sexual nature. The genius which was theirs undoubtedly found its source of power in transmuted sex energy. George Washington, Napoleon Bonaparte, William Shakespeare, Abraham Lincoln, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Robert Burns, Thomas Jefferson, Albert Hubbard, Albert H. Gary, Oscar Wilde, Woodrow Wilson, John H. Patterson, Andrew Jackson, Enrico Caruso. Your own knowledge of biography will enable you to add to this list. Find, if you can, a single man in all history of civilization who achieved outstanding success in any calling who was not driven by a well-developed sexual nature. If you don't wish to rely upon biographies of men not now living, take inventory of those whom you know to be men of great achievement and see if you can find one among them who is not highly sexed. Sex energy is the creative energy of all genius. There never has been and never will be a great leader, builder, or artist lacking in this driving force of sex. 
Surely no one will misunderstand these statements to mean that all who are highly sexed are genius. Man attains to the status of a genius only when and if he stimulates his mind so that it draws upon the forces available through the creative faculty of the imagination. Chief among the stimuli with which this stepping up of the vibrations may be produced is sexual energy. The mere possession of this energy is not sufficient to produce a genius. The energy must be transmuted from desire for physical contact into some other form of desire and action before it will lift one to the status of a genius. Far from becoming a genius because of great sexual desires, the majority of men lower themselves, through misunderstanding and misuse of this great force, to the status of the lower animals. I discovered from the analysis of over 25,000 people that men who succeed in an outstanding way seldom do so before the age of 40, and more often they don't strike their real pace until they're well beyond the age of 50. This fact was so astonishing that it prompted me to go to the study of its cause most carefully, carrying the investigation over a period of more than 12 years. The study disclosed the fact that the major reason why the majority of men who succeed do not begin to do so before the age of 40 to 50 is their tendency to dissipate their energies through overindulgence in physical expression of the emotion of sex. The majority of men never learn that the urge of sex has other possibilities which far transcend in importance that of mere physical expression. The majority of those who make this discovery do so having wasted many years at a period when the sexual energy is at its height, that's prior to the age of 45 to 50. This usually is followed by noteworthy achievement. The lives of many men, up to and sometimes well past the age of 40, reflect a continued dissipation of energies which could have been more profitably turned into better channels. Their finer and more powerful emotions are sown wildly to the four winds. Out of this habit of the male grew the term sowing his wild oats. The desire for sexual expression is by far the strongest and most impelling of all of the human emotions, and for this very reason this desire when harnessed and transmuted into action other than that of physical expression may raise one to the status of a genius. One of America's most able businessmen frankly admitted that his attractive secretary was responsible for most of the plans he created. He admitted that her presence lifted him to heights of creative imagination, such as he could experience under no other stimulus. One of the most successful men in America owes most of his success to the influence of a very charming young woman who has served as his source of inspiration for more than 12 years. Everyone knows the man to whom this reference is made, but not everyone knows the real source of his achievements. History is not lacking in examples of men who attain to the status of genius as the result of the use of artificial mind stimulants in the form of alcohol and narcotics. Edgar Allan Poe wrote The Raven while under the influence of liquor, dreaming dreams that mortal never dared to dream before. James Whitcomb Riley did his best writing while under the influence of alcohol. Perhaps it was thus he saw the ordered intermingling of the real and the dream, the mill above the river and the mist above the stream. Robert Burns wrote best when intoxicated, For all de lang syne, my dear, will take a cup of kindness yet, for all de lang syne. But let it be remembered that many such men have destroyed themselves in the end. Nature has prepared her own potions with which men may safely stimulate their minds, so they vibrate on a plane that enables them to tune in to fine and rare thoughts which come from no man knows where. No satisfactory substitute for nature's stimulants has ever been found. It's a well-known fact to psychologists that there's a very close relationship between sexual desires and spiritual urges, a fact which accounts for the peculiar behavior of people who participate in the orgies known as religious revivals, common among the primitive types. The world is ruled and the destiny of civilization is established by the human emotion. People are influenced in their actions not by reason so much as by feeling. The creative faculty of the mind is set into action entirely by emotions and not by cold reason. The most powerful of all human emotions is that of sex. There are other mind stimulants, some of which have been listed, but no one of them nor all of them combined can equal the driving power of sex. A mind stimulant is any influence which will either temporarily or permanently increase the vibrations of thought. The ten major stimulants described are the most common resorted to. Through these sources, one may commune with infinite intelligence or enter at will the storehouse of the subconscious mind, either one's own or that of another person, a procedure which is all there is of genius. 
A teacher who has trained and directed the efforts of more than 30,000 salespeople made the astounding discovery that highly sexed men are the most efficient salesmen. The explanation is that the factor of personality known as personal magnetism is nothing more or less than sexual energy. Highly sexed people always have a plentiful supply of imagination and magnetism. Through cultivation and understanding this vital force may be drawn upon and used to great advantage in the relationships between people. This energy may be communicated to others through the following media. The handshake. The touch of the hand indicates instantly the presence of magnetism or the lack of it. The tone of voice. Magnetism or sexual energy is the factor with which the voice may be colored or made musical and charming. Posture and carriage of the body. Highly sexed people move briskly and with grace and ease. The vibrations of thought. Highly sexed people mix the emotion of sex with their thoughts or may do so at will and in that way may influence those around them. Body adornment. People who are highly sexed are usually very careful about their personal appearance. They usually select clothing of a style becoming to their personality, physique, complexion, etc. When employing salesmen, the more capable sales manager looks for the quality of personal magnetism as the first requirement of a salesman. People who lack sexual energy will never become enthusiastic nor inspire others with enthusiasm, and enthusiasm is one of the most important requisites in salesmanship, no matter what one is selling. The public speaker, the orator, the preacher, lawyer, or salesman who is lacking in sex energy is a flop as far as being able to influence others is concerned. Couple with this the fact that most people can be influenced only through an appeal to their emotions, and you'll understand the importance of sexual energy as a part of the salesman's native ability. Master salesmen attain the status of mastery in selling because they either consciously or unconsciously transmute the energy of sex into sales enthusiasm. In this statement may be found a very practical suggestion as to the actual meaning of sex transmutation. The salesman who knows how to take his mind off the subject of sex and direct it in sales efforts with as much enthusiasm and determination as he would apply to its original purpose has acquired the art of sex transmutation whether he knows it or not. The majority of salesmen who transmute their sex energy do so without being in the least aware of what they're doing or how they're doing it. Transmutation of sexual energy calls for more willpower than the average person cares to use for this purpose. Those who find it difficult to summon willpower sufficient for transmutation may gradually acquire this ability. Though this requires willpower, the reward for the practice is more than worth the effort. The entire subject of sex is one with which the majority of people appear to be unpardonably ignorant. The urge of sex has been grossly misunderstood, slandered, and burlesqued by the ignorant and the evil-minded for so long that the very word sex is seldom used in polite society. Men and women who are known to be blessed, yes, blessed with highly sexual natures, are usually looked upon as being people who will bear watching. Instead of being called blessed, they are usually called cursed. Millions of people, even in this age of enlightenment, have inferiority complexes, which they developed because of this false belief that a highly sexual nature is a curse. These statements of the virtue of sex energy should not be construed as justification for the libertine. The emotion of sex is a virtue only when used intelligently and with discrimination. It may be misused, and often is, to such an extent that it debases instead of enriches both body and mind. The better use of this power is the burden of this chapter. It seemed quite significant to the author when he made the discovery that practically every great leader whom he had the privilege of analyzing was a man whose achievements were largely inspired by a woman. In many instances, the woman in the case was a modest, self-denying wife of whom the public had heard but little or nothing. In a few instances, the source of inspiration has been traced to the other woman. Perhaps such cases may not be entirely unknown to you. Intemperance in sexual habits is just as detrimental as intemperance in habits of drinking and eating. In this age in which we live, an age which began with the World War, intemperance in habits of sex is very common. The orgy of indulgence may account for the shortage of great leaders. No man can avail himself of the forces of his creative imagination while dissipating them. Man is the only creature on earth which violates nature's purpose in this connection. Every other animal indulges its sexual nature in moderation and with purpose which harmonizes with the laws of nature. Every other animal responds to the call of sex only in season. Man's inclination is to declare open season. 
Every intelligent person knows that stimulation in excess through alcoholic drink and narcotics is a form of intemperance which destroys the vital organs of the body, including the brain. Not every person knows, however, that overindulgence in sex expression may become a habit as destructive and as detrimental to creative effort as narcotics or liquor. A sex madman is not essentially different than a dope madman. Both have lost control over their faculties of reason and willpower. Sexual overindulgence may not only destroy reason and willpower, but it may also lead to either temporary or permanent insanity. Many cases of hypochondria, imaginary illnesses, grow out of habits developed in ignorance of the true function of sex. From these brief references to the subject, it may be readily seen that ignorance on the subject of sex transmutation forces stupendous penalties upon the ignorant on the one hand and withholds from them equally stupendous benefits on the other. Widespread ignorance on the subject of sex is due to the fact that the subject has been surrounded with mystery and be clouded by dark silence. The conspiracy of mystery and silence has had the same effect upon the minds of young people that the psychology of prohibition had. The result has been increased curiosity and desire to acquire more knowledge on this verboten subject, and to the shame of all lawmakers and most physicians by training, best qualified to educate youth on that subject, information has not been easily available. Seldom does an individual enter upon highly creative effort in any field of endeavor before the age of 40. The average man reaches the period of his greatest capacity to create between 40 and 60. These statements are based upon analysis of thousands of men and women who have been carefully observed. They should be encouraging to those who fail to arrive before the age of 40 and to those who become frightened as they approach old age, around the 40-year mark. The years between 40 and 50 are, as a rule, the most fruitful. Man should approach this age not with fear and trembling, but with hope and eager anticipation. If you want evidence that most men do not begin to do their best work before the age of 40, study the records of the most successful men known to the American people, and you'll find it. Henry Ford had not hit his pace of achievement until he had passed the age of 40. Andrew Carnegie was well past 40 before he began to reap the reward of his efforts. James J. Hill was still running a telegraph key at the age of 40. His stupendous achievements took place after that age. Biographies of American industrialists and financiers are filled with evidence that the period from 40 to 60 is the most productive age of man. Between the ages of 30 and 40, man begins to learn, if he ever learns, the art of sex transmutation. This discovery is generally accidental and more often than otherwise, the man who makes it is totally unconscious of this discovery. He may observe that his powers of achievement have increased around the age of 35 to 40, but in most cases he's not familiar with the cause of this change that nature begins to harmonize the emotions of love and sex in the individual between the ages of 30 and 40 so that he may draw upon these great forces and apply them jointly as stimuli to action. Sex alone is a mighty urge to action, but its forces are like a cyclone. They're often uncontrollable. When the emotion of love begins to mix itself with the emotion of sex, the result is calmness of purpose, poise, accuracy of judgment, and balance. What person who has attained the age of 40 is so unfortunate as to be unable to analyze these statements and to corroborate them by his own experience? When driven by his desire to please a woman based solely upon the emotion of sex, a man may be, and usually is, capable of great achievement, but his actions may be disorganized, distorted, and totally destructive. When driven by his desire to please a woman based upon the motive of sex alone, a man may steal, cheat, and even commit murder. But when the emotion of love is mixed with the emotion of sex, that same man will guide his actions with more sanity, balance, and reason. Criminologists have discovered that most hardened criminals can be reformed through the influence of a woman's love. There's no record of a criminal having been reformed solely through the sex influence. These facts are well known, but their cause is not. Reformation comes, if at all, through the heart or the emotional side of man, not through his head or reasoning aside. Reformation means a change of heart. It does not mean a change of head. A man may, because of reason, make certain changes in his personal conduct to avoid the consequences of undesirable effects. But genuine reformation comes only through a change of heart through a desire to change. Love, romance, and sex are all emotions capable of driving men to heights of superachievement. Love is the emotion which serves as a safety valve and ensures balance, poise, and constructive effort. 
When combined, these three emotions may lift one to an altitude of genius. There are geniuses, however, who know but little of the emotion of love. Most of them may be found engaged in some form of action which is destructive, or at least not based upon justice and fairness toward others. If good taste would permit, a dozen geniuses could be named in the field of industry and finance who ride ruthlessly over the rights of their fellow men. They seem totally lacking in conscience. The reader can easily supply his own list of such men. The emotions are states of mind. Nature has provided man with a chemistry of the mind which operates in a manner similar to the principles of chemistry of matter. It is a well-known fact that through the aid of chemistry of matter, a chemist may create a deadly poison by mixing certain elements, none of which are in themselves harmful in the right proportions. The emotions may likewise be combined so as to create a deadly poison. The emotions of sex and jealousy when mixed may turn a person into an insane beast. The presence of any other one or more of the destructive emotions in the human mind through the chemistry of the mind sets up a poison which may destroy one's sense of justice and fairness. In extreme cases, the presence of any combination of these emotions in the mind may destroy one's reason. The road to genius consists of the development, control, and use of sex, love, and romance. Briefly, the process may be stated as follows. Encourage the presence of these emotions as the dominating thoughts in one's mind, and discourage the presence of all the destructive emotions. The mind is a creature of habit. It thrives upon the dominating thoughts fed it. Through the faculty of willpower, one may discourage the presence of any emotion and encourage the presence of any other. Control of the mind through the power of will is not difficult. Control comes from persistence and habit. The secret of control lies in understanding the process of transmutation. When any negative emotion presents itself in one's mind, it can be transmuted into a positive or constructive emotion by the simple procedure of changing one's thoughts. There is no other road to genius than through voluntary self-effort. A man may attain to great heights of financial or business achievement solely by the driving force of sexual energy, but history is filled with evidence that he may, and usually does, carry with him certain traits of character which rob him of the ability to either hold or enjoy his fortune. This is worthy of analysis, thought, and meditation, for it states a truth, the knowledge of which may be helpful to women as well as men. Ignorance of this has cost thousands of people their privilege of happiness, even though they possessed riches. The emotions of love and sex leave their unmistakable marks upon the features. Moreover, these signs are so visible that all who wish may read them. The man who is driven by the storm of passion based upon sexual desires alone plainly advertises that fact to the entire world by the expression of his eyes and the lines of his face. The emotion of love, when mixed with the emotion of sex, softens, modifies, and beautifies the facial expression. No character analyst is needed to tell you this. You may observe it for yourself. The emotion of love brings out and develops the artistic and the aesthetic nature of man. It leaves its impress upon one's very soul, even after the fire has been subdued by time and circumstances. Memories of love never pass. They linger. They guide and influence long after the source of stimulation has faded. There's nothing new in this. Every person who has been moved by genuine love knows that it leaves enduring traces upon the human heart. The effect of love endures because love is spiritual in nature. The man who cannot be stimulated to great heights of achievement by love is hopeless. He is dead. He may seem to live. Even the memories of love are sufficient to lift one to a higher plane of creative effort. The major force of love may spend itself and pass away like a fire which has burned itself out, but it leaves behind indelible marks as evidence that it passed that way. Its departure often prepares the human heart for a still greater love. Go back into your yesterdays at times and bathe your mind in the beautiful memories of past love. It will soften the influence of the present worries and annoyances. It will give you a source of escape from the unpleasant realities of life. And maybe, who knows, your mind will yield to you during this temporary retreat into the world of fantasy, ideas or plans, which may change the entire financial or spiritual status of your life. If you believe yourself unfortunate because you have loved and lost, perish the thought. One who has loved truly can never lose entirely. Love is whimsical and temperamental. Its nature is ephemeral and transitory. It comes when it pleases and goes away without warning. Accept and enjoy it while it remains, but spend no time worrying about its departure. Worry will never bring it back. 
Dismiss also the thought that love never comes but once. Love may come and go times without number, but there are no two love experiences which affect one in just the same way. There may be, and there usually is, one love experience which leaves a deeper imprint on the heart than all the others. But all love experiences are beneficial, except to the person who becomes resentful and cynical when love makes its departure. There should be no disappointment over love, and there would be none if people understood the difference between the emotions of love and sex. The major difference is that love is spiritual, while sex is biological. No experience which touches the human heart with a spiritual force can possibly be harmful except through ignorance or jealousy. Love is, without question, life's greatest experience. It brings one into communion with infinite intelligence. When mixed with the emotions of romance and sex, it may lead one far up the ladder of creative effort. The emotions of love, sex, and romance are sides of the eternal triangle of achievement, building genius. Nature creates genius through no other force. Love is an emotion with many sides, shades, and colors. The love which one feels for parents or children is quite different from that which one feels for one's sweetheart. The one is mixed with the emotion of sex, while the other is not. The love which one feels in true friendship is not the same as that felt for one's sweetheart, parents, or children, but it too is a form of love. Then there is the emotion of love for things inanimate, such as the love of nature's handiwork. But the most intense and burning of all of these various kinds of love is that experienced in the blending of the emotions of love and sex. Marriage is not blessed with the eternal affinity of love, properly balanced and proportioned with sex, cannot be happy ones and seldom endure. Love alone will not bring happiness in marriage, nor will sex alone. When these two beautiful emotions are blended, marriage may bring about a state of mind closest to the spiritual that one may ever know on this earthly plane. When the emotion of romance is added to those of love and sex, the obstructions between the finite mind of man and infinite intelligence are removed. Then a genius has been born. What a different story is this than those usually associated with the emotion of sex. Here is an interpretation of the emotion which lifts it out of the commonplace and makes of it potter's clay in the hands of God, from which he fashions all that is beautiful and inspiring. It's an interpretation which would, when properly understood, bring harmony out of the chaos which exists in too many marriages. The disharmonies often expressed in the form of nagging may usually be traced to lack of knowledge on the subject of sex. Where love, romance, and the proper understanding of the emotion and function of sex abide, there is no disharmony between married people. Fortunate is the husband whose wife understands the true relationship between the emotions of love, sex, and romance. When motivated by this holy triumvirate, no form of labor is burdensome, because even the most lowly form of effort takes on the nature of a labor of love. It's a very old saying that a man's wife may either make him or break him, but the reason is not always understood. The making and breaking is the result of the wife's understanding or lack of understanding of the emotions of love, sex, and romance. Despite the fact that men are polygamous by the very nature of their biological inheritance, it's true that no woman has as great an influence on a man as his wife unless he's married to a woman totally unsuited to his nature. If a woman permits her husband to lose interest in her and become more interested in other women, it's usually because of her ignorance or indifference toward the subject of sex, love, and romance. This statement presupposes, of course, that genuine love once existed between a man and his wife. The facts are equally applicable to a man who permits his wife's interest in him to die. Married people often bicker over a multitude of trivialities. If these are analyzed accurately, the real cause of the trouble will often be found to be the indifference or ignorance on these subjects. Man's greatest motivating force is his desire to please women. The hunter who excelled during prehistoric days before the dawn of civilization did so because of his desire to appear great in the eyes of women. Man's nature has not changed in this respect. The hunter of today brings home no skins of wild animals, but he indicates his desire for her favor by supplying fine clothes, motor cars, and wealth. Man has the same desire to please women that he had before the dawn of civilization. The only thing that's changed is his method of pleasing. Men who accumulate large fortunes and attain to great heights of power and fame do so mainly to satisfy their desire to please the women. Take women out of their lives and great wealth would be useless to most men. It's this inherent desire of man to please women which give women the power to make or break a man. The woman who understands man's nature and tactfully caters to it 
need have no fear of competition from other women. Men may be giants with indomitable willpower when dealing with other men, but they are easily managed by the woman of their choice. Most men won't admit that they are easily influenced by the woman they prefer, because it's in the nature of the male to want to be recognized as the stronger of the species. Moreover, the intelligent woman recognizes this manly trait and very wisely makes no issue of it. Some men know that they're being influenced by the woman of their choice, their wives, sweethearts, mothers, or sisters, but they tactfully refrain from rebelling against the influence because they are intelligent enough to know that no man is happy or complete without the modifying influence of the right woman. The man who does not recognize this important truth deprives himself of the power which has done more to help men achieve success than all other forces combined. Chapter 12. The Subconscious Mind. The Connecting Link. The Eleventh Step Toward Riches. The subconscious mind consists of a field of consciousness in which every impulse of thought that reaches the objective mind through any of the five senses is classified and recorded and from which thoughts may be recalled or withdrawn as letters may be taken from a filing cabinet. It receives and files sense impressions or thoughts regardless of their nature. You may voluntarily plant in your subconscious mind any plan, thought, or purpose which you desire to translate into its physical or monetary equivalent. The subconscious acts first on the dominating desires which have been mixed with emotional feeling, like faith. Consider this in connection with the instructions given in the chapter on desire for taking the six steps there outlined and the instructions given in the chapter on the building and execution of plans and you'll understand the importance of the thought conveyed. Through a method of procedure unknown to man, the subconscious mind draws upon the forces of infinite intelligence for the power with which it voluntarily transmutes one's desires into their physical equivalent, making use always of the most practical media by which this end may be accomplished. You can't entirely control your subconscious mind, but you can voluntarily hand over to it any plan, desire, or purpose which you wish transformed into concrete form. Read again instructions for using the subconscious mind in the chapter on auto-suggestion. There's plenty of evidence to support the belief that the subconscious mind is the connecting link between the finite mind of man and infinite intelligence. It's the intermediary through which one may draw upon the forces of infinite intelligence at will. It alone contains the secret process by which mental impulses are modified and changed into their spiritual equivalent. It alone is the medium through which prayer may be transmitted to the source capable of answering prayer. The possibilities of creative effort connected with the subconscious mind are stupendous and imponderable. They inspire one with awe. I never approach the discussion of the subconscious mind without feeling of littleness and inferiority due, perhaps, to the fact that man's entire stock of knowledge on this subject is so pitifully limited. The very fact that the subconscious mind is the medium of communication between the thinking mind of man and infinite intelligence is, of itself, a thought which almost paralyzes one's reason. After you've accepted as a reality the existence of the subconscious mind and understand its possibilities as a medium for transmuting your desires into their physical or monetary equivalent, you'll comprehend the full significance of the instructions given in the chapter on desire. You'll also understand why you have been repeatedly admonished to make your desires clear and to reduce them to writing. You'll also understand the necessity of persistence in carrying out instructions. The 13 principles are the stimuli with which you acquire the ability to reach and to influence your subconscious mind. Don't become discouraged if you can't do this upon the first attempt. Remember that the subconscious mind may be voluntarily directed only through habit under the directions given in the chapter on faith. You have not yet had time to master faith. Be patient. Be persistent. A good many statements in the chapters on faith and auto-suggestion will be repeated here for the benefit of your subconscious mind. Remember your subconscious mind functions voluntarily whether you make any effort to influence it or not. This naturally suggests to you that thoughts of fear and poverty and all negative thoughts serve as stimuli to your subconscious mind unless you master these impulses and give it more desirable food upon which it may feed. The subconscious mind will not remain idle. If you fail to plant desires in your subconscious mind, it will feed upon the thoughts which reach it as the result of your neglect. 
We've already explained that thought impulses, both negative and positive, are reaching the subconscious mind continuously from the four sources which were mentioned in the chapter on sex transmutation. For the present, it's sufficient if you remember that you are living daily in the midst of all manner of thought impulses which are reaching your subconscious mind without your knowledge. Some of these impulses are negative and some are positive. You are now engaged in trying to help shut out the flow of negative impulses and to aid in voluntarily influencing your subconscious mind through positive impulses of desire. When you achieve this, you will possess the key which unlocks the door to your subconscious mind. Moreover, you will control that door so completely that no undesirable thought may influence your subconscious mind at all. Everything which man creates begins in the form of a thought impulse. Man can create nothing which he does not first conceive in thought. Through the aid of the imagination, thought impulses may be assembled into plans. The imagination, when under control, may be used for the creation of plans or purposes that lead to success in one's chosen occupation. All thought impulses intended for transmutation into their physical equivalent, voluntarily planted in the subconscious mind, must pass through the imagination and be mixed with faith. The mixing of faith with a plan or purpose intended for submission of the subconscious mind may be done only through the imagination. From these statements, you will readily observe that voluntary use of the subconscious mind calls for coordination and application of all the principles. Ella Wheeler Wilcox gave evidence of her understanding of the power of the subconscious mind when she wrote, You can never tell what a thought will do in bringing you hate or love. For thoughts are things, and their airy wings are swifter than carrier doves. They follow the law of the universe. Each thing creates its kind, and they speed o'er the track to bring you back, whatever went out from your mind. Mrs. Wilcox understood the truth that thoughts which go out from one's mind also embed themselves deeply in one's subconscious mind, where they serve as a magnet, pattern, or blueprint by which the subconscious mind is influenced while translating them into their physical equivalent. Thoughts are truly things for the reason that every material thing begins in the form of thought energy. The subconscious mind is more susceptible to influence by impulses of thought mixed with feeling or emotion than by those originating solely in the reasoning portion of the mind. In fact, there is much evidence to support the theory that only emotionalized thoughts have any action influence upon the subconscious mind. It is a well-known fact that emotion or feeling rules the majority of people. If it's true that the subconscious mind responds more quickly to and is influenced more readily by thought impulses which are well mixed with emotion, it's essential to become familiar with the more important of the emotions. There are seven major positive emotions and seven major negative emotions. The negatives voluntarily inject themselves into the thought impulses which ensure passage into the subconscious mind. The positives must be injected through the principle of auto-suggestion into the thought impulses which an individual wishes to pass on to his subconscious mind. Instructions have been given in this chapter on auto-suggestion. These emotions or feeling impulses may be likened to yeast in a loaf of bread because they constitute the action element which transforms thought impulses from the passive into the active state. Thus may one understand why thought impulses which have been well mixed with emotion are acted upon more readily than thought impulses originating in cold reason. You are preparing yourself to influence and control the inner audience of your subconscious mind in order to hand over to it the desire for money which you wish transmuted into its monetary equivalent. It is essential, therefore, that you understand the method of approach to this inner audience. You must speak its language, or it will not heed your call. It understands best the language of emotion or feeling. Let us, therefore, describe here the seven major positive emotions and the seven major negative emotions so that you may draw upon the positives and avoid the negatives when giving instructions to your subconscious mind. Here then are the seven major positive emotions. The emotion of desire, the emotion of faith, the emotion of love, the emotion of sex, the emotion of enthusiasm, the emotion of romance, the emotion of hope. There are other positive emotions, but these are the seven most powerful and the ones most commonly used in creative effort. Master these seven emotions, they can be mastered only by use, and the other positive emotions will be at your command when you need them. Remember in this connection that you are studying a book which is intended to help you develop a money consciousness by filling your mind with positive emotions. One does not become money conscious by filling one's mind with negative emotions. 
So here are the seven major negative emotions. Please avoid these. The emotion of fear. The emotion of jealousy. The emotion of hatred. The emotion of revenge. The emotion of greed. The emotion of superstition. And the emotion of anger. Positive and negative emotions cannot occupy the mind at the same time. One or the other must dominate. It's your responsibility to make sure that positive emotions constitute the dominating influence of your mind. Here the law of habit will come to your aid. Form the habit of applying and using the positive emotions. Eventually they will dominate your mind so completely that the negatives cannot enter it. Only by following these instructions literally and continuously can you gain control over your subconscious mind. The presence of a single negative in your conscious mind is sufficient to destroy all chances of constructive aid from your subconscious mind. If you are an observing person, you have noticed that most people resort to prayer only after everything else has failed, or else they pray by a ritual of meaningless words. And because it is a fact that most people who pray do so only after everything else has failed, they go to prayer with their minds filled with fear and doubt, which are the emotions the subconscious mind acts upon and passes on to infinite intelligence. Likewise, that's the emotion which infinite intelligence receives and acts upon. If you pray for a thing, but have fear as you pray that you may not receive it, or that your prayer will not be acted upon by infinite intelligence, your prayer will have been in vain. Prayer does sometimes result in the realization of that for which one prays. If you have ever had the experience of receiving that for which you prayed, go back in your memory and recall your actual state of mind while you were praying and you'll know for sure that the theory here described is more than just a theory. The time will come when the schools and educational institutions of the country will teach the science of prayer. Moreover, then prayer may be and will be reduced to a science. When that time comes, it will come as soon as mankind is ready for it and demands it, no one will approach the universal mind in a state of fear, for the very good reason that there will be no such emotion as fear. Ignorance, superstition, and false teaching will have disappeared, and man will have attained his true status as a child of infinite intelligence. A few have already attained this blessing. If you believe this prophecy is far-fetched, take a look at the human race in retrospect. Less than a hundred years ago, men believed the lightning to be evidence of the wrath of God, and they feared it. Now, thanks to the power of faith, men have harnessed the lightning and made it turn the wheels of industry. Much less than a hundred years ago, men believed the space between the planets to be nothing but a great void, a stretch of dead nothingness. Now, thanks to the same power of faith, men know that far from being either dead or a void, the space between the planets is very much alive, that it is the highest form of vibration known, excepting, perhaps, the vibration of thought. Moreover, men know that this living, pulsating, vibratory energy, which permeates every atom of matter and fills every niche of space, connects every human brain with every other human brain. What reason have men to believe that this same energy does not connect every human brain with infinite intelligence? There are no toll gates between the finite mind of man and the infinite intelligence. The communication costs nothing except patience, faith, persistence, understanding, and a sincere desire to communicate. Moreover, the approach can be made only by the individual himself. Paid prayers are worthless. Infinite intelligence does no business by proxy. You either go direct, or you do not communicate. You might buy prayer books and repeat them until the day of your doom without avail. Thoughts which you wish to communicate to infinite intelligence must undergo transformation such as can be given only through your own subconscious mind. The method by which you may communicate with infinite intelligence is very similar to that through which the vibration of sound is communicated by radio. If you understand the working principle of radio, you of course know that sound cannot be communicated through the ether until it's been stepped up or changed into a rate of vibration which the human ear cannot detect. The radio sending station picks up the sound of the human voice and scrambles or modifies it by stepping up the vibration millions of times. Only in this way can the vibration of sound be communicated through the ether. After this transformation has taken place, the ether picks up the energy, which originally was in the form of vibrations of sound, carries that energy to radio receiving stations, and these receiving sets step that energy back down to its original rate of vibration so that it's recognized as sound. The subconscious mind is the intermediary which translates one's prayer into terms which infinite intelligence can recognize, presents the message, then brings back the answer in the form of a definite plan or idea 
for procuring the object of the prayer. Understand this principle, and you'll know why mere words read from a prayer book cannot and will never serve as an agency of communication between the mind of man and infinite intelligence. Before your prayer will reach infinite intelligence, a statement of the author's theory only, it probably is transformed from its original thought vibration into terms of spiritual vibration. Faith is the only known agency which will give your thoughts a spiritual nature. Faith and fear make poor bedfellows. Where one is found, the other cannot exist. Chapter 13 The Brain, a Broadcasting and Receiving Station for Thought The Twelfth Step Toward Riches More than twenty years ago, the author, working in conjunction with the late Dr. Alexander Graham Bell and Dr. Elmer R. Gates, observed that every human brain is both a broadcasting and receiving station for the vibration of thought. Through the medium of the ether, in a fashion similar to that employed by the radio broadcasting principle, every human brain is capable of picking up vibrations of thought which are being released by other brains. In connection with the statement in the preceding paragraph, compare and consider the description of the creative imagination as outlined in the chapter on imagination. The creative imagination is the receiving set of the brain, which receives thoughts released by the brains of others. It's the agency of communication between one's conscious or reasoning mind and the four sources from which one may receive thought stimuli. When stimulated or stepped up to a high rate of vibration, the mind becomes more receptive to the vibration of thought which reaches it through the ether from outside sources. This stepping up process takes place through the positive emotions or the negative emotions. Through the emotions, the vibrations of thought may be increased. Vibrations of exceedingly high rates are the only vibrations picked up and carried by the ether from one brain to another. Thought is energy traveling at an exceedingly high rate of vibration. Thought which has been modified or stepped up by any of the major emotions vibrates at a much higher rate than ordinary thought and it is this type of thought which passes from one brain to another through the broadcasting machinery of the human brain. The emotion of sex stands at the head of the list of human emotions as far as intensity and driving force are concerned. The brain, which has been stimulated by the emotion of sex, vibrates at a much more rapid rate than it does when that emotion is quiescent or absent. The result of sex transmutation is the increase of that rate of vibration, of thoughts to such a pitch that the creative imagination becomes highly receptive to ideas which it picks up from the ether. On the other hand, when the brain is vibrating at a rapid rate, it not only attracts thoughts and ideas released by other brains through the medium of the ether, but it gives to one's own thoughts that feeling which is essential before those thoughts will be picked up and acted upon by one's subconscious mind. Thus you'll see that the broadcasting principle is the factor through which you mix feeling or emotion with your thoughts and pass them on to your subconscious mind. The subconscious mind is the sending station of the brain through which vibrations of thought are broadcast. The creative imagination is the receiving set through which the vibrations of thought are picked up from the ether. Along with the important factors of the subconscious mind and the faculty of the creative imagination which constitute the sending and receiving sets of your mental broadcasting machinery, Consider now the principle of auto-suggestion, which is the medium by which you may put into operation your broadcasting station. Through the instructions described in this chapter on auto-suggestion, you are definitely informed of the method by which desire may be transmuted into its monetary equivalent. Operation of your mental broadcasting station is a comparatively simple procedure. You have but three principles to bear in mind and to apply when you wish to use your broadcasting station. The subconscious mind creative imagination, and auto-suggestion. The stimuli through which you put these three principles into action have been described as the procedure beginning with desire. The depression brought to the world the very borderline of understanding of the forces which are intangible and unseen. Through the ages which have passed, man has depended too much upon his physical senses and has limited his knowledge to physical things which he could see, touch, weigh, and measure. We're now entering the most marvelous of all ages, an age which will teach us something of the intangible forces of the world about us. Perhaps we shall learn as we pass through this age that the other self is more powerful than the physical self that we see when we look into a mirror. 
Sometimes men speak lightly of the intangibles, the things which they cannot perceive through any of their five senses. And when we hear them, it should remind us that all of us are controlled by forces which are unseen and intangible. The whole of mankind has not the power to cope with nor to control the intangible force wrapped up in the rolling waves of the oceans. Man has not the capacity to understand the intangible force of gravity, which keeps this little earth suspended in mid-air, and keeps man from falling from it, much less the power to control that force. Man is entirely subservient to the intangible force which comes with a thunderstorm, and he is just as helpless in the presence of the intangible force of electricity. Nay, he does not even know what electricity is, where it comes from, or what is its purpose. Nor is this by any means the end of man's ignorance in connection with things unseen and intangible. He does not understand the intangible force and intelligence wrapped up in the soil of the earth, the force which provides him with every morsel of food that he eats, every article of clothing he wears, and every dollar he carries in his pocket. Last but not least, man, with all of his boasted culture and education, understands little or nothing of the intangible force, which is the greatest of all the intangibles of thought. He knows but little concerning the physical brain and its vast network of intricate machinery through which the power of thought is translated into its material equivalent. But he is now entering an age which shall yield enlightenment on that subject. Already men of science have begun to turn their attention to the study of this stupendous thing called a brain, and while they are still in the kindergarten stage of their studies, they've uncovered enough knowledge to know that the central switchboard of the human brain, the number of lines which connect the brain cells one with another, equal the figure one followed by 15 million ciphers. The figure is so stupendous, said Dr. C. Judson Herrick of the University of Chicago, that astronomical figures dealing with hundreds of millions of light years become insignificant by comparison. It's been determined that there are from 10 billion to 14 billion nerve cells in the human cerebral cortex, and we know that these are arranged in definite patterns. These arrangements are not haphazard, they are orderly. Recently developed methods of electrophysiology draw off action currents from very precisely located cells or fibers with microelectrodes. They amplify them with radio tubes and record potential differences to one millionth of a volt. It's inconceivable that such a network of intricate machinery should be in existence for the sole purpose of carrying on the physical functions incidental to growth and maintenance of the physical body. Is it not likely that the same system which gives billions of brain cells the media for communication one with another provides also the means of communication with other intangible forces? After this book had been written just before the manuscript went to the publisher, there appeared in the New York Times an editorial showing that at least one great university and one intelligent investigator in the field of mental phenomena are carrying on an organized research through which conclusions have been reached that parallel many of those described in this and the following chapter. The editorial briefly analyzed the work carried on by Dr. Ryan and his associates at Duke University. The question, what is telepathy? A month ago we cited on this page some of the remarkable results achieved by Professor Ryan and his associates at Duke for more than a hundred thousand tests to determine the existence of telepathy and clairvoyance. These results were summarized in the first two articles in Harper's Magazine. In the second, which has now appeared, the author, E. H. Wright, attempts to summarize what has been learned or what it seems reasonable to infer regarding the exact nature of these extrasensory modes of perception. The actual existence of telepathy and clairvoyance now seems to some scientists enormously probable as the result of Ryan's experiments. Various participants were asked to name as many cards in a special pack as they could without looking at them and without other sensory access to them. About a score of men and women were discovered who could regularly name so many of the cards correctly that there was not one chance in many a million, million, of their having done their feats by luck or by accident. But how did they do them? These powers, assuming that they do exist, don't seem to be sensory. There is no known organ for them. The experiments worked just as well at distances of several hundred miles as they did in the same room. These facts also depose, in Mr. Wright's opinion, of the attempt to explain telepathy or clairvoyance through any physical theory of radiation. All known forms of radiant energy decline inversely as the square of the distance traversed. Telepathy and clairvoyance do not. 
but they do vary through physical causes as our other mental powers do. Contrary to widespread opinion, they don't improve when the participant is asleep or half asleep, but on the contrary, when he is most wide awake and alert. Ryan discovered that a narcotic will invariably lower a participant's score, while a stimulant will always send it higher. The most reliable performer apparently cannot make a good score unless he tries to do his best. One conclusion that Wright draws with some confidence is that telepathy and clairvoyance are really one and the same gift, that is, the faculty that sees a card face down on a table seems to be exactly the same one that reads a thought residing only in another mind. There are several grounds for believing this. So far, for example, the two gifts have been found in every person who enjoys either of them. In every one, so far, the two have been of equal vigor, almost exactly. Screens, walls, distances have no effect at all on either of them. Wright advances from this conclusion to express what he puts forward as no more than the mere hunch that the other extrasensory experiences, prophetic dreams, premonitions of disaster, and the like, may also prove to be a part of the same faculty. The reader is not asked to accept any of these conclusions unless he finds it necessary, but the evidence that Ryan has piled up must remain impressive. In view of Dr. Ryan's announcements, in connection with the conditions under which the mind responds to what he terms extrasensory modes of perception, I now feel privileged to add to his testimony by stating that my associates and I have discovered what we believe to be the ideal conditions under which the mind can be stimulated so that the sixth sense described in the next chapter can be made to function in a practical way. Two conditions to which I refer consist of a close working alliance between myself and two members of my staff. Through experimentation and practice, we've discovered how to stimulate our minds by applying the principle used in connection with the invisible counselors described in the next chapter, so that we can, by a process of blending our three minds into one, find the solution to a great variety of personal problems which are submitted by my clients. The procedure is very simple. We sit down at a conference table, clearly state the nature of the problem we have under consideration, and then begin discussing it. Each contributes whatever thoughts that may occur. The strange thing about this method of mind stimulation is that it places each participant in a communication with unknown sources of knowledge definitely outside his own experience. If you understand the principle described in the chapter on the master mind, you of course recognize the round table procedure here described as being a practical application of the master mind. This method of mind stimulation through harmonious discussion of definite subjects between three people illustrates the simplest and most practical use of the master mind. By adopting and following a similar plan, any student of this philosophy may come into possession of the famous Carnegie formula briefly described in the introduction. If it means nothing to you at this time, mark this page and read it again after you have finished the last chapter. The depression was a blessing in disguise. It reduced the whole world to a new starting point that gives everyone a new opportunity. Chapter 14. The Sixth Sense. The Door to the Temple of Wisdom. The Thirteenth Step Toward Riches. The thirteenth principle is known as the sixth sense, through which infinite intelligence may and will communicate voluntarily without any effort from or demands by the individual. The principle is the apex of this philosophy. It can be assimilated, understood, and applied only by first mastering the other twelve principles. The sixth sense is that portion of the subconscious mind which has been referred to as the creative imagination. It has also been referred to as the receiving set through which ideas, plans, and thoughts flash into the mind. The flashes are sometimes called hunches or inspirations. The sixth sense defies description. It can't be described to a person who has not mastered the other principles of this philosophy because such a person has no knowledge and no experience with which the sixth sense may be compared. Understanding of the sixth sense when it comes only by meditation through mind development from within. The sixth sense probably is the medium of contact between the finite mind of man and infinite intelligence, and for this reason, it's a mixture of both the mental and the spiritual. It's believed to be the point at which the mind of man contacts the universal mind. After you've mastered the principles described in this book, you'll be prepared to accept as truth a statement which may otherwise be incredible to you, namely, through the aid of the sixth sense, you will be warned of impending dangers in time to avoid them, 
and notified of opportunities in time to embrace them. There comes to your aid and to your bidding, with the development of the sixth sense, a guardian angel, who will open to you at all times the door to the temple of wisdom. Whether or not this is a statement of truth, you'll never know except by following the instructions described in the pages of this book, or some similar method of procedure. The author is not a believer in, nor an advocate of, miracles, for the reason that he has enough knowledge of nature to understand that nature never deviates from her established laws. Some of her laws are so incomprehensible that they may produce what appear to be miracles. The sixth sense comes as near to being a miracle as anything I have ever experienced, and it appears so only because I do not understand the method by which this principle is operated. This much the author does know, that there is a power, or a first cause, or an intelligence which permeates every atom of matter, and embraces every unit of energy perceptible to man, that this infinite intelligence converts acorns into oak trees, causes water to flow downhill in response to the law of gravity, it follows night with day, and winter with summer, each maintaining its proper place and relationship to the other. This intelligence may, through the principles of this philosophy, be induced to aid in transmuting desires into concrete or material form. The author has this knowledge because he has experimented with it and has experienced it. Step by step, through the preceding chapters, you've been led to this, the last principle. If you've mastered each of the preceding principles, you are now prepared to accept, without being skeptical, the stupendous claims made here. If you've not mastered the other principles, you must do so before you may determine definitely whether or not the claims made in this chapter are fact or fiction. While I was passing through the age of hero worship, I found myself trying to imitate those whom I most admired. Moreover, I discovered that the element of faith with which I endeavored to imitate my idols gave me great capacity to do so quite successfully. I have never entirely divested myself of this habit of hero worship, although I have passed the age commonly given over to such. My experience has taught me that the next best thing to being truly great is to emulate the great by feeling and action as nearly as possible. Long before I had ever written a line for publication or endeavored to deliver a speech in public, I have followed the habit of reshaping my own character by trying to imitate the nine men whose lives and life works had been most impressive to me. These nine men were Emerson, Paine, Edison, Darwin, Lincoln, Burback, Napoleon, Ford, and Carnegie. Every night over a long period of years, I held an imaginary council meeting with this group, whom I called my invisible counselors. The procedure was this. Just before going to sleep at night, I would shut my eyes and see in my imagination this group of men seated with me around my council table. Here I had not only an opportunity to sit among those whom I considered to be great, but I actually dominated the group by serving as the chairman. I had a very definite purpose in indulging my imagination through these nightly meetings. My purpose was to rebuild my own character so it would represent a composite of the characters of my imaginary counselors. Realizing as I did early in life that I had to overcome the handicap of birth in an environment of ignorance and superstition, I deliberately assigned myself the task of voluntary rebirth through the method here described. Being an earnest student of psychology, I knew, of course, that all men have become what they are because of their dominating thoughts and desires. I knew that every deeply seated desire has the effect of causing one to seek outward expression through which that desire may be transmuted into reality. I knew that self-suggestion is a powerful factor in building character, that it is, in fact, the sole principle through which character is built. With this knowledge of the principles of mind operation, I was fairly well armed with the equipment needed in rebuilding my character. In these imaginary council meetings, I called on my cabinet members for the knowledge that I wished each to contribute, addressing myself to each member in audible words as follows. Mr. Emerson, I desire to acquire from you the marvelous understanding of nature which distinguished your life. I ask that you make an impress upon my subconscious mind of whatever qualities you possessed which enabled you to understand and adapt yourself to the laws of nature. I ask that you assist me in reaching and drawing upon whatever sources of knowledge are available to this end. Mr. Burbank, I request that you pass on to me the knowledge which enabled you to harmonize the laws of nature that you caused the cactus to shed its thorns and become an edible food. Give me access to the knowledge which enabled you to make two blades of grass grow where but one grew before, and helped you to blend the coloring of the flowers with more splendor and harmony, for you alone have successfully gilded the lily. 
Napoleon, I desire to acquire from you by emulation the marvelous ability that you possessed to inspire men and to arouse them to greater and more determined spirit of action. Also to acquire the spirit of enduring faith, which enabled you to turn defeat into victory and to surmount staggering obstacles. Emperor of fate, king of chance, man of destiny, I salute you. Mr. Payne, I desire to acquire from you the freedom of thought and the courage and clarity with which to express convictions which so distinguished you. And Mr. Darwin, I wish to acquire from you the marvelous patience and the ability to study cause and effect without bias or prejudice, so exemplified by you in the field of natural science. Mr. Lincoln, I desire to build into my own character the keen sense of justice, the untiring spirit of patience, the sense of humor, the human understanding, and the tolerance which were your distinguishing characteristics. Mr. Carnegie, I'm already indebted to you for my choice of a life work, which has brought me great happiness and peace of mind. I wish to acquire a thorough understanding of the principles of organized effort which you used so effectively in the building of a great industrial enterprise. Mr. Ford, you've been among the most helpful of the men who have supplied much of the material essential to my work. I wish to acquire your spirit of persistence, the determination, poise, and self-confidence which have enabled you to master poverty, organize, unify, and simplify human effort so that I may help others to follow in your footsteps. Mr. Edison, I have seated you nearest to me at my right because of the personal cooperation that you have given me during my research into the causes of success and failure. I wish to acquire from you the marvelous spirit of faith with which you have uncovered so many of nature's secrets, the spirit of unremitting toil with which you have so often wrested victory from defeat. My method of addressing the members of the imaginary cabinet would vary according to the traits of character in which I was, for the moment, most interested in acquiring. I studied the records of their lives with painstaking care. After some months of this nightly procedure, I was astounded by the discovery that these imaginary figures became apparently real. Each of these nine men developed individual characteristics which surprised me. For example, Lincoln developed the habit of always being late and then walking around in solemn parade. When he came, he walked very slowly with his hands clasped behind him, and once in a while he would stop as he passed and rest his hand momentarily upon my shoulder. He always wore an expression of seriousness upon his face. Rarely did I see him smile. The cares of a sundered nation made him grave. This was not true of the others. Burbank and Payne often indulged in witty repartee, which seemed at times to shock the other members of the cabinet. One night Payne suggested that I prepare a lecture on The Age of Reason, and deliver it from the pulpit of a church which I formerly attended. Many around the table laughed heartily at that suggestion. Not Napoleon. He drew his mouth down at the corners and groaned so loudly that all turned and looked at him with amazement. To him the church was but a pawn of the state, not to be reformed, but to be used as a convenient insider to mass activity by the people. On one occasion Burbank was late. When he came he was excited with enthusiasm and explained that he'd been late because of an experiment he was making through which he hoped to be able to grow apples on any sort of tree. Payne chided him by reminding him that it was an apple which started all the trouble between men and women. Darwin chuckled heartily as he suggested that Payne should watch out for little serpents when he went into the forest to gather apples, as they had the habit of growing into big snakes. Emerson observed, No serpents, no apples. And Napoleon remarked, No apples, no state. Lincoln developed the habit of always being the last one to leave the table after each meeting. On one occasion, he leaned across the end of the table, his arms folded, and remained in that position for many minutes. I made no attempt to disturb him. Finally, he lifted his head slowly, got up, and walked to the door. Then he turned around, came back, and laid his hand on my shoulder and said, My boy, you will need much courage if you remain steadfast in carrying out your purpose in life. But remember... When difficulties overtake you, the common people have common sense. Adversity will develop it. One evening Edison arrived ahead of all the others. He walked over and seated himself at my left where Emerson was accustomed to sit, and said, You are destined to witness the discovery of the secret of life. When the time comes, you'll observe that life consists of great swarms of energy or entities, such as intelligent as human beings think themselves to be. These units of life group together like hives of bees, and they remain together until they disintegrate through lack of harmony. These units have differences of opinion, the same as human beings, and they often fight among themselves. 
These meetings which you are conducting will be very helpful to you. They'll bring to your rescue some of the same units of life which serve the members of your cabinet during their lives. These units are eternal. They never die. Your own thoughts and desires serve as the magnet which attracts units of life from the great ocean of life out there. Only the friendly units are attracted, the ones which harmonize with the nature of your desires. The other members of this cabinet began to enter the room. Edison got up and slowly walked around to his own seat. Edison was still living when this happened. It impressed me so greatly that I went to see him and told him about the experience. He smiled broadly and he said, Your dream was more a reality than you may imagine it to have been. He added no further explanation to that statement. These meetings became so realistic that I became fearful of their consequences and discontinued them for several months. The experiences were so uncanny I was afraid if I continued them I would lose sight of the fact that the meetings were purely experiences of my imagination. Some six months after I had discontinued the practice I was awakened one night, or thought I was, when I saw Lincoln standing at my bedside. He said, The world will soon need your services. It's about to undergo a period of chaos which will cause men and women to lose faith and become panic-stricken. Go ahead with your work and complete your philosophy. That is your mission in life. If you neglect it for any cause whatsoever, you will be reduced to a primal state and be compelled to retrace the cycles through which you have passed during thousands of years. I was unable to tell the following morning whether I had dreamed this or had actually been awake, and I have never since found out which it was, but I do know that the dream, if it was a dream, was so vivid in my mind the next day that I resumed my meetings the following night. At our next meeting, the members of my cabinet all filed into the room together and stood at their accustomed places at the council table while Lincoln raised a glass and said, Gentlemen, let us drink a toast to a friend who has returned to the fold. After that, I began to add new members to my cabinet until now it consists of more than 50, among them Christ. St. Paul, Galileo, Copernicus, Aristotle, Plato, Socrates, Homer, Voltaire, Bruno, Spinoza, Drummond, Kant, Schopenhauer, Newton, Confucius, Elbert, Hubbard, Brown, Ingersoll, Wilson, and William James. This is the first time that I've had the courage to mention this. Heretofore, I have remained quiet on the subject because I knew from my own attitude in connection with such matters that I would be misunderstood if I described my unusual experience. I have been emboldened now to reduce my experience to the printed page because I am now less concerned about what they say than I was in the years that have passed. One of the blessings of maturity is that it sometimes brings one greater courage to be truthful regardless of what those who do not understand may think or say. Lest I be misunderstood, I wish here to state most emphatically that I still regard my cabinet meetings as being purely imaginary, but I feel entitled to suggest that while the members of my cabinet may be purely fictional and the meetings existent only in my own imagination, they've led me into glorious paths of adventure, rekindled an appreciation of true greatness, encouraged creative endeavor, and emboldened the expression of honest thought. Somewhere in the cell structure of the brain is located an organ which receives vibrations of thought, ordinarily called hunches. So far, science has not discovered where this organ of the sixth sense is located, but this is not important. The fact remains that human beings do receive accurate knowledge through sources other than the physical senses. Such knowledge generally is received when the mind is under the influence of extraordinary stimulation. Any emergency which arouses the emotions and causes the heart to beat more rapidly than normal may, and generally does, bring the sixth sense into action. Anyone who has experienced a near accident while driving knows that on such occasions the sixth sense often comes to one's rescue and aids by split seconds in avoiding the accident. These facts are mentioned preliminary to a statement of fact which I shall now make, namely that during my meetings with the invisible counselors I found my mind most receptive to ideas, thoughts, and knowledge which reach me through the sixth sense. I can truthfully say that I owe entirely to my invisible counselors full credit for such ideas, facts, or knowledge as I received through inspiration. On scores of occasions when I've faced emergencies, some of them so grave that my life was in jeopardy, I have been miraculously guided past these difficulties through the influence of my invisible counselors. My original purpose in conducting council meetings with imaginary beings was solely that of impressing my own subconscious mind through the principle of auto-suggestion with certain characteristics which I desired to acquire. 
In more recent years, my experimentation has taken on an entirely different trend. I now go to my imaginary counselors with every difficult problem which confronts me and my clients. The results are often astonishing, although I don't depend entirely upon this form of counsel. You, of course, have recognized that this chapter covers a subject with which a majority of people are not familiar. The sixth sense is a subject that will be of great interest and benefit to the person whose aim is to accumulate vast wealth, but it need not claim the attention of those whose desires are more modest. Henry Ford undoubtedly understands and makes practical use of this sixth sense. His vast business and financial operations make it necessary for him to understand and use this principle. The late Thomas Edison understood and used the sixth sense in connection with the development of inventions, especially those involving basic patents, in connection with which he had no human experience and no accumulated knowledge to guide him, as was the case while he was working on the talking machine and the moving picture machine. Nearly all great leaders such as Napoleon, Bismarck, Joan of Arc, Christ, Buddha, Confucius, and Muhammad understood and probably made use of the sixth sense almost continuously. The major portion of their greatness consisted of their knowledge of this principle. The sixth sense is not something that one can take off and put on at will. Ability to use this great power comes slowly through application of the other principles outlined in this book. Seldom does any individual come into workable knowledge of the sixth sense before the age of 40. More often the knowledge is not available until one is well past 50, and this for the reason that the spiritual forces with which the sixth sense is so closely related do not mature and become usable except through years of meditation, self-examination, and serious thought. No matter who you are, or what may have been your purpose in reading this book, you can profit by it without understanding the principle described in this chapter. This is especially true if your major purpose is that of accumulation of money or other material things. The chapter on the sixth sense was included because the book is designed for the purpose of presenting a complete philosophy by which individuals may unerringly guide themselves in attaining whatever they ask of life. The starting point of all achievement is desire. The finishing point is that brand of knowledge which leads to understanding, understanding of self, understanding of others, understanding of the laws of nature, recognition, and the understanding of happiness. This sort of understanding comes in its fullness only through familiarity with and use of the principle of the sixth sense. Hence that principle had to be included as part of this philosophy for the benefit of those who demand more money. Having read the chapter, you must have observed that while reading it, you were lifted to a high level of mental stimulation. Splendid! Come back to this again a month from now. Read it once more and observe that your mind will soar to a still higher level of stimulation. Repeat this experience from time to time, giving no concern as to how much or how little you learn at the time, and eventually you'll find yourself in possession of a power that will enable you to throw off discouragement, master fear, overcome procrastination, and draw freely upon your imagination. Then you will have felt the touch of that unknown something which has been the moving spirit of every truly great thinker, leader, artist, musician, writer, and statesman. Then you'll be in a position to transmute your desires into their physical or financial counterpart as easily as you may lie down and quit at the first sign of opposition. Previous chapters have described how to develop faith through auto-suggestion, desire, and the subconscious. The next chapter presents detailed instructions for the mastery of fear. Here will be found a full description of the six fears which are the cause of all discouragement, timidity, procrastination, indifference, indecision, and the lack of ambition, self-reliance, initiative, self-control, and enthusiasm. Search yourself carefully as you study these six enemies as they may exist only in your subconscious mind, where their presence will be hard to detect. Remember, too, as you analyze the six ghosts of fear, that they're nothing but ghosts, because they exist only in one's mind. Remember also that ghosts, creations of uncontrolled imagination, have caused most of the damage people have done to their own minds, Therefore, ghosts can be as dangerous as if they lived and walked on the earth in physical bodies. The ghost of the fear of poverty, which seized the minds of millions of people in 1929, was so real that it caused the worst business depression that this country has ever known. Moreover, this particular ghost still frightens some of us right out of our own wits. Chapter 15. How to Outwit the Six Ghosts of Fear 
Take inventory of yourself as you read this closing chapter and find out how many of the ghosts are standing in your way before you can put any portion of this philosophy into successful use. Your mind must be prepared to receive it. The preparation is not difficult. It begins with study, analysis, and understanding of three enemies which you shall have to clear out. These are indecision, doubt, and fear. The sixth sense will never function while these three negatives or any of them remain in your mind. The members of this unholy trio are closely related where one is found, the other two are close at hand. Indecision is the seedling of fear. Remember this as you read. Indecision crystallizes into doubt. The two blend together and become fear. The blending process often is slow. This is one reason why these three enemies are so dangerous. They germinate and grow without their presence being observed. The remainder of this chapter describes an end which must be attained before the philosophy as a whole can be put into practical use. It also analyzes a condition which has, but lately, reduced a huge number of people to poverty, and it states a truth which must be understood by all who accumulate riches, whether measured in terms of money or a state of mind of far greater value than money. The purpose of this chapter is to turn the spotlight of attention upon the cause and the cure of the six basic fears. Before we can master an enemy, we must know its name, its habits, and its place of abode. As you read, analyze yourself carefully and determine which, if any, of the six common fears have attached themselves to you. Don't be deceived by the habits of these subtle enemies. Sometimes they remain hidden in the subconscious mind, where they are difficult to locate and still more difficult to eliminate. There are six basic fears with some combination of which every human suffers at one tune or another. Most people are fortunate if they don't suffer from the entire six. Named in the order of their most common appearance, they are the fear of poverty, the fear of criticism, the fear of ill health, the fear of loss of love of someone, the fear of old age, and the fear of death. All other fears are of minor importance. They can be grouped under these six headings. The prevalence of these fears as a curse to the world runs in cycles. For almost six years, while the Depression was on, we floundered in the cycle of fear of poverty. During the World War, we were in the cycle of fear of death. Just following the war, we were in the cycle of fear of ill health, as evidenced by the epidemic of disease which spread itself all over the world. Fears are nothing more than states of mind. One state of mind is subject to control and direction. Physicians, as everyone knows, are less subject to attack by disease than ordinary laymen, for the reason that physicians do not fear disease. Physicians without fear or hesitation have been known to physically contact hundreds of people daily who are suffering from such contagious diseases as smallpox without becoming infected. Their immunity against the disease consisted largely, if not solely, in their absolute lack of fear. Man can create nothing which he does not first conceive in the form of an impulse of thought. Following this statement comes another of still greater importance, namely, Man's thought impulses begin immediately to translate themselves into their physical equivalent, whether those thoughts are voluntary or involuntary. Thought impulses which are picked up through the ether by mere chance, thoughts which have been released by other minds, may determine one's financial business, professional or social destiny, just as surely as do the thought impulses which one creates by intent and design. We are here laying the foundation for the presentation of a fact of great importance to the person who does not understand why some people appear to be lucky, while others of equal or greater ability, training, experience, and brain capacity seem destined to ride with misfortune. This fact may be explained by the statement that every human being has the ability to completely control his own mind, and with this control, obviously every person may open his mind to the tramp thought impulses which are being released by other brains, or close the doors tightly and admit only thought impulses of his own choice. Nature has endowed man with absolute control over but one thing, and that is thought. This fact, coupled with the additional fact that everything which man creates begins in the form of a thought, leads one very near to the principle by which fear may be mastered. If it's true that all thought has a tendency to clothe itself in its physical equivalent, and this is true beyond any reasonable room for doubt, it is equally true that thought impulses of fear and poverty cannot be translated into terms of courage and financial gain. The people of America began to think of poverty following the Wall Street crash of 1929. 
Slowly but surely, that mass thought was crystallized into its physical equivalent, which was known as a depression. This had to happen. It is in conformity with the laws of nature. There can be no compromise between poverty and riches. The two roads that lead to poverty and riches travel in opposite directions. If you want riches, you must refuse to accept any circumstance that leads toward poverty. The word riches is here used in its broadest sense, meaning financial, spiritual, mental, and material estates. The starting point of the path that leads to riches is desire. In chapter 1, you received full instructions for the proper use of desire. In this chapter on fear, you have complete instructions for preparing your mind to make practical use of desire. Here then is the place to give yourself a challenge which will definitely determine how much of this philosophy that you've absorbed. Here's the point at which you can turn profit and foretell accurately what the future holds in store for you. If after reading this chapter you are willing to accept poverty, you may as well make up your mind to receive poverty. This is one decision that you cannot avoid. If you demand riches, determine what form and how much will be required to satisfy you. You know the road that leads to riches. You have been given a road map which, if followed, will keep you on that road. If you neglect to make the start or stop before you arrive, no one will be to blame but you. This responsibility is yours. No alibi will save you from accepting the responsibility if you now fail or refuse to demand riches of life because the acceptance calls for but one thing. Incidentally, the only thing you can control, and that is a state of mind. A state of mind is something that one assumes. It cannot be purchased. It must be created. Fear of poverty is a state of mind, nothing else. But it is sufficient to destroy one's chances of achievement in any undertaking, a truth which became painfully evident during the Depression. This fear paralyzes the faculty of reason, destroys the faculty of imagination, kills off self-reliance, undermines enthusiasm, discourages initiative, leads to uncertainty of purpose, encourages procrastination, wipes out enthusiasm, and makes self-control an impossibility. It takes the charm from one's personality, destroys the possibility of accurate thinking, it diverts concentration of effort, it masters persistence, turns the willpower into nothingness, destroys ambition, beclouds the memory, and invites failure in every conceivable form. It kills love and assassinates the finer emotions of the heart. It discourages friendship and invites disaster in a hundred forms. It leads to sleeplessness, misery, and unhappiness. And all of this despite the obvious truth that we live in a world of overabundance of everything the heart could desire, with nothing standing between us and our desires except lack of a definite purpose. The fear of poverty is without a doubt the most destructive of the six basic fears. It has been placed at the head of the list because it's the most difficult to master. Considerable courage is required to state the truth about the origin of this fear, and still greater courage to accept the truth after it has been stated. The fear of poverty grew out of man's inherited tendency to prey upon his fellow man economically. Nearly all animals lower than man are motivated by instinct, but their capacity to think is limited. Therefore, they prey upon one another physically. Man, with his superior sense of intuition, with the capacity to think and to reason, does not eat his fellow man bodily. He gets more satisfaction out of eating him financially. Man is so avaricious that every conceivable law has been passed to safeguard him from his fellow man. Of all the ages of the world of which we know anything, the age in which we live seems to be the one that is outstanding because of man's money madness. A man is considered less than the dust of the earth unless he can display a fat bank account. But if he has money, never mind how he acquired it, he is a king or a big shot. He's above the law. He rules in politics. He dominates in business, and the whole world about him bows in respect when he passes. Nothing brings man so much suffering and humility as poverty. Only those who have experienced poverty understand the full meaning of this. It's no wonder, then, that man fears poverty. Through a long line of inherited experiences, man has learned for sure that some men cannot be trusted where matters of money and earthly possessions are concerned. This is a rather stinging indictment, the worst part of it being that it's true. The majority of marriages are motivated by the wealth possessed by one or both of the contracting parties. It's no wonder, therefore, that the divorce courts are busy. So eager is man to possess wealth that he will acquire it in whatever manner he can, through legal methods if possible, through other methods if necessary or expedient. 
Self-analysis may disclose weaknesses which one does not like to acknowledge. This form of examination is essential to all who demand of life more than mediocrity and poverty. Remember as you check yourself point by point that you are both the court and the jury, the prosecuting attorney and the attorney for the defense, and that you are the plaintiff and the defendant. Also, that you're on trial. Face the facts squarely. Ask yourself definite questions and demand direct replies. When the examination is over, you'll know more about yourself. If you don't feel that you can be an impartial judge in this self-examination, call upon someone who knows you well to serve as judge while you cross-examine yourself. You are after the truth. Get it, no matter at what cost, even though it may temporarily embarrass you. The majority of people if asked what they fear most would reply, I fear nothing. The reply would be inaccurate because few people realize that they are bound, handicapped, whipped spiritually and physically through some form of fear. So subtle and deeply seated is the emotion of fear that one may go through life burdened with it, never recognizing its presence. Only a courageous analysis will disclose the presence of this universal enemy. When you begin such an analysis, search deeply into your character. Here's a list of the symptoms for which you should look. Indifference, commonly expressed through lack of ambition, willingness to tolerate poverty, acceptance of whatever compensation life may offer without protest, mental and physical laziness, lack of initiative, imagination, enthusiasm, and self-control. Indecision, the habit of permitting others to do one's thinking, staying on the fence, doubt. Generally expressed through alibis and excuses designed to cover up, explain away, or apologize for one's failures, sometimes expressed in the form of envy of those who are successful or by criticizing them. Worry, usually expressed by finding fault with others, a tendency to spend beyond one's income, neglect of personal appearance, scowling and frowning, intemperance in the use of alcohol drink, sometimes through the use of narcotics, nervousness and lack of poise, as well as self-consciousness and lack of self-reliance. Overcaution, the habit of looking for the negative side of every circumstance, thinking and talking of possible failure, instead of concentrating upon the means of succeeding. Knowing all the roads to disaster but never searching for the plans to avoid failure. Waiting for the right time to begin putting ideas and plans into action until the waiting becomes a permanent habit. Remembering those who have failed and forgetting those who have succeeded Seeing the hole of a donut, but overlooking the donut. Pessimism, leading to indigestion, poor elimination, auto-intoxication, bad breath, and bad disposition. Procrastination, the habit of putting off until tomorrow that which should have been done last year. Spending enough time in creating alibis and excuses to have done the job. This symptom is closely related to overcaution, doubt, and worry. Refusal to accept responsibility when it can be avoided. Willingness to compromise rather than put up a stiff fight. Compromising with difficulties instead of harnessing and using them as stepping stones to advancement. Bargaining with life for a penny instead of demanding prosperity, opulence, riches, contentment, and happiness. Planning what to do if and when overtaken by failure instead of burning all bridges and making retreat impossible. Weakness of and often total lack of self-confidence. Definiteness of purpose self-control, initiative, enthusiasm, ambition, thrift, and sound reasoning ability. Expecting poverty instead of demanding riches. Association with those who accept poverty instead of seeking the company of those who demand and receive riches. Money talks. Some will ask, why did you write a book about money? Why measure riches in dollars alone? Some will believe, and rightly so, that there are other forms of riches more desirable than money. Yes, there are riches which cannot be measured in terms of dollars, but there are millions of people who will say, Give me all the money I need and I will find everything else I want. The major reason I wrote this book on how to get money is the fact that the world has but lately passed through an experience that left millions of men and women paralyzed with the fear of poverty. What this sort of fear does to one was well described by Westbrook Pegler in the New York World Telegram. He said, money is only clamshells or metal discs or scraps of paper, and there are treasures of the heart and soul which money can't buy. But most people, being broke, are unable to keep this in mind and sustain their spirits. When a man is down and out and on the street, unable to get any job at all, something happens to his spirit which can be observed in the droop of his shoulders, the set of his hat, his walk, and his gaze. 
he can't escape a feeling of inferiority among people with regular employment, even though he knows they are definitely not his equals in character, intelligence, or ability. These people, even his friends, feel, on the other hand, a sense of superiority and regard him perhaps unconsciously as a casualty. He may borrow for a time, but not enough to carry on in his accustomed way, and he cannot continue to borrow for very long. But borrowing in itself when a man is borrowing merely to live is a depressing experience, and the money lacks the power of earned money to revive his spirits. Of course, none of this applies to bums or habitual ne'er-do-wells, but only to men of normal ambitions and self-respect. Women in the same predicament must be different. We somehow don't think of women at all in considering the down-and-outers. They're scarce in the bread lines, and they are rarely seen begging on the streets, and they're not recognizable in crowds by the same plain signs which identify busted men. Of course, I don't mean the shuffling hags of the city streets or the opposite number of the confirmed male bums. I mean reasonably young, decent, and intelligent women. There must be many of them, but their despair is not apparent. Maybe they kill themselves. When a man is down and out, he has time on his hands for brooding. He may travel miles to see a man about a job and discover that the job is filled or that it's one of these jobs with no base pay but only a commission on the sale of some useless knick-knack which nobody would buy except out of pity. Turning that down, he finds himself back on the street with nowhere to go but just anywhere. So he walks and walks. He gazes into store windows at luxuries which are not for him, and he feels inferior and gives way to people who stop and look with active interest. He wanders into the railroad station or puts himself down in the library to ease his legs and soak up a little heat, but that isn't looking for a job, so he gets going again. He may not know it, but his aimlessness would give him away even if the very lines of his figure did not. He may be well dressed in the clothes left over from the days when he had a steady job, but the clothes cannot disguise the droop. He sees thousands of other people, bookkeepers or clerks, chemists, wagon hands, all busy at their work, and he envies them from the bottom of his soul. They have their independence, their self-respect, and manhood, and he simply cannot convince himself that he's a good man, too, though he argues it out and arrives at a favorable verdict hour after hour. It's just money which makes this difference in him. With a little money, he would be himself again. Some employers take the most shocking advantage of people who are down and out. The agencies hang out little colored cards offering miserable wages to busted men, $12 a week, $15 a week. An $18 a week job is a plum, and anyone with $25 a week to offer does not hang the job in front of an agency on a colored card. I have a want ad clips from a local paper demanding a clerk, a good clean penman, to take telephone orders for a sandwich shop from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. for $8 a month. Not $8 a week, but $8 a month. The ad also says, State Religion. Can you imagine the brutal effrontery of anyone who demands a good, clean penman for 11 cents an hour inquiring into the victim's religion? But that is what busted people are offered. Just how man originally came into this sphere, no one can definitely state. But one thing is certain, he has it in a highly developed form. Some believe that this fear made its appearance about the time that politics became a profession. Others believe it can be traced to the age when women first began to concern themselves with styles in wearing apparel. This author, being neither a humorist nor a prophet, is inclined to attribute the basic fear of criticism to that part of man's inherited nature which prompts him not only to take away his fellow man's goods and wares, but to justify his action by criticism of his fellow man's character. It's a well-known fact that a thief will criticize the man from whom he steals that politicians seek office, not by displaying their own virtues and qualifications, but by attempting to besmirch their opponents. The fear of criticism takes on many forms, the majority of which are petty and trivial. Bald-headed men, for example, are bald for no other reason than their fear of criticism. Heads become bald because of the tight-fitting bands of hats which cut off the circulation from the roots of the hair. Men wear hats not because they actually need them, but mainly because everyone is doing it. The individual falls into line and does likewise, lest some other individual criticize him. Women seldom have bald heads or even thin hair because they wear hats which fit their heads loosely, the only purpose of the hats being adornment. But it must not be supposed that women are free from the fear of criticism. If any woman claims to be superior to man with reference to this fear, ask her to walk down the street wearing a vintage hat of 1890. The astute manufacturers of clothing have not been slow to capitalize on this basic fear of criticism with which all mankind has been cursed. 
Every season, the styles and many articles of wearing apparel change. Who establishes the styles? Certainly not the purchaser of clothing, but the manufacturer. Why does he change the styles so often? The answer is obvious. He changes the styles so he can sell more clothes. For the same reason, the manufacturers of automobiles, with a few rare and very sensible exceptions, change styles of models every season. No man wants to drive an automobile which is not of the latest style, although the older model may actually be the better car. We've been describing the manner in which people behave under the influence of fear of criticism as applied to the small and petty things of life. Let us now examine human behavior when this fear affects people in connection with the more important events of human relationship. Take, for example, practically any person who has reached the age of mental maturity. That's from 35 to 40 years of age as a general average. And if you could read the secret thoughts of his mind, you would find a very decided disbelief in most of the fables taught by the majority of the dogmatists and theologians a few decades back. Not often, however, will you find a person who has the courage to openly state his beliefs on this subject. Most people will, if pressed far enough, tell a lie rather than admit that they don't believe the stories associated with that form of religion which held people in bondage prior to the age of scientific discovery and education. Why does the average person, even in this day of enlightenment, shy away from denying his belief in the fables which were the basis of most of the religions a few decades ago? The answer is because of the fear of criticism. Men and women have been burned at the stake for daring to express disbelief in ghosts. It's no wonder we have inherited a consciousness which makes us fear criticism. The time was, and not so far in the past, when criticism carried severe punishments. It still does in some countries. The fear of criticism robs man of his initiative, destroys his power of imagination, limits his individuality, takes away his self-reliance, and does him damage in a hundred other ways. Parents often do their children irreparable injury by criticizing them. The mother of one of my boyhood chums used to punish him with a switch almost daily, always completing the job with the statement, You'll land in the penitentiary before you are twenty. He was sent to a reformatory at the age of seventeen. Criticism is the one form of service of which everyone has too much. Everyone has a stock of it which is handed out gratis, whether called for or not. One's nearest relatives often are the worst offenders. It should be recognized as a crime. And in, reali in reality, it is a crime of the worst nature. For any parent to build inferiority complexes in the mind of a child through unnecessary criticism. Employers who understand human nature get the best there is in men, not by criticism, but by constructive suggestion. Parents may accomplish the same results with their children. Criticism will plant fear in the human heart or resentment, but it will not build love or affection. The fear is almost as universal as the fear of poverty, and its effects are just as fatal to personal achievement, mainly because this fear destroys initiative and discourages the use of imagination. The major symptoms of the fear are self-consciousness, generally expressed through nervousness, timidity in conversation, and in meeting strangers, awkward movements of the hands and limbs, and shifting of the eyes, lack of poise, expressed through lack of voice control, nervousness in the presence of others, poor posture of body, and poor memory, personality, lacking in firmness of decision, personal charm, and ability to express opinions definitely. The habit of sidestepping issues instead of meeting them squarely. Agreeing with others without careful examination of their opinions. Inferiority complex. The habit of expressing self-approval by word of mouth and by actions as a means of covering up a feeling of inferiority. Using big words to impress others, often without knowing the real meaning of the words. Imitating others in dress, speech, and manners. Boasting of imaginary achievements. This sometimes gives a surface appearance of a feeling of superiority. Extravagance, the habit of trying to keep up with the Joneses, spending beyond one's income. Lack of initiative, failure to embrace opportunities for self-advancement, fear to express opinions, lack of confidence in one's own ideas, giving evasive answers to questions asked by superiors, hesitancy of manner and speech, and deceit in both words and deeds. Lack of ambition, mental and physical laziness, lack of self-assertion, Slowness in reaching decisions easily influenced by others, the habit of criticizing others behind their backs and flattering them to their faces, the habit of accepting defeat without protest, quitting an undertaking when opposed by others, suspicious of other people without cause, lacking in tactfulness of manner and speech, unwillingness to accept the blame for mistakes.
The fear of ill health may be traced to both physical and social heredity. It is closely associated as to its origin with the cause of fear of old age and the fear of death, because it leads one closely to the border of terrible worlds of which man knows not, but concerning which he has been taught some discomforting stories. The opinion is somewhat general also that certain unethical people engaged in the business of selling health have had not a little to do with keeping alive the fear of ill health. In the main, man fears ill health because of the terrible pictures which have been planted in his mind of what may happen if death should overtake him. He also fears it because of the economic toil which it may claim. A reputable physician estimated that 75% of all people who visit physicians for professional services are suffering with hypochondria. It has been shown most convincingly that the fear of disease, even where there is not the slightest cause for fear, often produces the physical symptoms of the disease feared. Powerful and mighty is the human mind. It builds or it destroys. Playing upon this common weakness of fear of ill health, dispensers of patent medicines have reaped fortunes. This form of imposition upon credulous humanity became so prevalent some 20 years ago that Collier's Weekly Magazine conducted a bitter campaign against some of the worst offenders in the patent medicine business. During the flu epidemic, which broke out during the World War, the mayor of New York City took drastic steps to check the damage which people were doing to themselves through their inherent fear of ill health. He called in the newspaper men and said to them, Gentlemen, I feel it necessary to ask you not to publish any scare headlines concerning the flu epidemic. Unless you cooperate with me, we'll have a situation which we can't control. The newspapers quit publishing stories about the flu, and within about a month the epidemic had been successfully checked. Through a series of experiments conducted some years ago, it was proven that people may be made ill by suggestion. We conducted this experiment by causing three acquaintances to visit the victims, each of whom asked the question, What ails you? You look terribly ill, the first questioner usually provoked a grin and a nonchalant, Oh, nothing, I'm all right, from the victim. The second questioner usually was answered with the statement, I don't know exactly, but I do feel badly. The third questioner was usually met with the frank admission that the victim was actually feeling ill. Try this on an acquaintance. If you doubt that it will make him uncomfortable, but don't carry the experiment too far, there's a certain religious sect whose members take vengeance upon their enemies by the hexing method. They call it placing a spell on the victim. There's overwhelming evidence that disease sometimes begins in the form of a negative thought impulse. Such an impulse may be passed from one mind to another by a suggestion or created by an individual in his own mind. A man who was blessed with more wisdom than this incident might indicate once said, When anyone asks me how I feel, I always want to answer by knocking him down. Doctors send patients into new climates for their health because a change of mental attitude is necessary. The seed of fear of ill health lives in every human mind. Worry, fear, discouragement, disappointment in love and business affairs cause this seed to germinate and grow. The recent business depression kept the doctors on the run because every form of negative thinking may cause ill health. Disappointments in business and in love stand at the head of the list of causes of fear and of ill health. A young man suffered a disappointment in love which sent him to a hospital. For months he hovered between life and death. A specialist in suggestive therapeutics was called in. The specialist changed nurses and placed him in the charge of a very charming young woman who began by prearrangement with the doctor to flirt with him the first day of her arrival on the job. Within three weeks, the patient was discharged from the hospital, still suffering but with an entirely different malady. He was in love again. The remedy was a hoax, but the patient and the nurse were both later married to each other. Both are in good health now at the same time of this writing. Symptoms of the fear of ill health. The symptoms of this almost universal fear are autosuggestion, the habit of negative use of self-suggestion by looking for and expecting to find the symptoms of all kinds of disease, enjoying imaginary illness and speaking of it as being real, the habit of trying all fads and isms recommended by others as having therapeutic value, talking to others of operations, accidents, and other forms of illness. Experimenting with diets, physical exercises, reducing systems, without professional guidance, trying home remedies, patent medicines, and quack remedies. Hypochondria, the habit of talking of illness, concentrating the mind upon disease, and expecting its appearance until a nervous break occurs. Nothing that comes in bottles can cure this condition. It's brought on by negative thinking, and nothing but positive thought can affect a cure. 
Hypochondria, a medical term for imaginary disease, is said to do as much damage on occasion as the disease one fears might do. Most so-called cases of nerves come from imaginary illnesses. Exercise, fear of health, often interferes with proper physical exercise and results in overweight by causing one to avoid outdoor life. Susceptibility. Fear of ill health breaks down nature's body resistance and creates a favorable condition for any form of disease one may contact. The fear of ill health often is related to the fear of poverty, especially in the case of the hypochondriac who constantly worries about the possibility of having to pay doctor's bills, hospital bills, and etc. This type of person spends much time preparing for sickness, talking about death, saving money for cemetery lots, and burial expenses. Self-coddling. The habit of making a bid for sympathy using imaginary illness as the lure. People often resort to this trick to avoid work. The habit of feigning illness is to cover plain laziness or to serve as an alibi for lack of ambition. Intemperance. The habit of using alcohol or narcotics to destroy pains like headaches, neuralgia, etc. instead of eliminating the cause. The habit of reading about illness and worrying over the possibility of being stricken by it. The habit of reading patent medicine advertisements. The fear of loss of love. The original source of this inherent fear needs but little description, because it obviously grew out of man's polygamous habit of stealing his fellow man's mate, and his habit of taking liberties with her whenever he could. Jealousy and other similar forms of dementia grow out of a man's inherited fear of the loss of love of someone. This fear is the most painful of all of the six basic fears. It probably plays more havoc with the body and mind than any of the other basic fears, as it often leads to permanent insanity. The fear of the loss of love probably dates back to the Stone Age, when men stole women by brute force. They continue to steal females, but their technique has changed. Instead of force, now they use persuasion, the promise of pretty clothes, motor cars, and other bait, which is much more effective than physical force. Man's habits are the same as they were at the dawn of civilization. It's just that he expresses them differently. Careful analysis has shown that women are more susceptible to this fear than men. This fact is easily explained. Women have learned from experience that men are polygamous by nature, that they are not to be trusted in the hands of rivals. Symptoms of the fear of loss of love. This distinguishing symptom of this fear is jealousy, the habit of being suspicious of friends and loved ones without any reasonable evidence of sufficient grounds. Jealousy is a form of dementia which sometimes becomes violent without the slightest cause. The habit of accusing wife or husband of infidelity without grounds. General suspicion of everyone. Absolute faith in no one. Fault finding. The habit of finding fault with friends, relatives, business associates, and loved ones upon the slightest provocation or without any cause whatsoever. Gambling. The habit of gambling, stealing, cheating, and otherwise taking hazardous chances to provide money for loved ones with the belief that love can be bought. The habit of spending beyond one's means or incurring debts to provide gifts for loved ones with the object of making a favorable showing. Insomnia, nervousness, lack of persistence, weakness of will, lack of self-control, lack of self-reliance, bad temper. The fear of old age. In the main, this fear grows out of two sources. First, the thought that old age may bring with it poverty. Secondly, and by far the most common source of origin from faults and cruel teachings of the past, which have been too well mixed with fire and brimstone, and other bogies cunningly designed to enslave men through fear. In the basic fear of old age, man has two very sound reasons for his apprehension. One growing out of his distrust of his fellow man, who may seize whatever worldly goods he may possess, and the other arising from the terrible pictures of the world beyond, which were planted in his mind through social heredity before he came into full possession of his mind. The possibility of ill health, which is more common as people grow older, is also a contributing cause of this common fear of old age. Eroticism also enters into the cause of the fear of old age, as no man cherishes the thought of diminishing sexual attraction. The most common cause of fear of old age is associated with the possibility of poverty, Poorhouse is not a pretty word. It throws a chill into the mind of every person who faces the possibility of having to spend his declining years on a poor farm. Another contributing cause of the fear of old age is the possibility of loss of freedom and independence, as old age may bring with it the loss of both physical and economic freedom. The commonest symptoms of the fear of old age are 
the tendency to slow down and develop an inferiority complex at the age of mental maturity, around the age of 40, falsely believing oneself to be slipping because of age. The truth is that man's most useful years, mentally and spiritually, are those between 40 and 60. The habit of speaking apologetically of oneself as being old, merely because one has reached the age of 40 or 50, instead of reversing the rule and expressing gratitude for having reached the age of wisdom and understanding. The habit of killing off initiative, imagination, and self-reliance by falsely believing oneself too old to exercise these qualities. The habit of the man or woman of 40 dressing with the aim of trying to appear much younger and affecting mannerisms of youth, thereby inspiring ridicule by both friends and strangers. The fear of death. To some, this is the cruelest of all the basic fears. The reason's obvious. The terrible pangs of fear associated with the thought of death in the majority of cases may be charged directly to religious fanaticism. So-called heathen are less afraid of death than the more civilized. For hundreds of millions of years, man has been asking the still unanswered question, whence and whither? Where did I come from, why am I here, and where am I going? During the darker ages of the past, the more cunning and crafty were not slow to offer the answer to these questions. For a price, witness now the major source of origin of the fear of death. Come into my tent, embrace my faith, accept my dogmas, and I will give you a ticket that will admit you straight away into heaven when you die, cries a leader of sectarianism. Remain out of my tent, says the same leader, and may the devil take you and burn you throughout eternity. Eternity is a long time. Fire is a terrible thing. The thought of eternal punishment with fire not only causes man to fear death, it often causes him to lose his reason. It destroys interest in life and makes happiness impossible. During my research, I reviewed a book entitled A Catalog of the Gods, in which were listed the 30,000 gods which man has worshipped. Think of it. 30,000 of them, represented by everything from a crawfish to a man. It's little wonder that men have become frightened at the approach of death. While the religious leader may not be able to provide safe conduct into heaven, nor by lack of such provision allow the unfortunate to descend into hell, the possibility of the latter seems so terrible that the very thought of it lays hold of the imagination in such a realistic way that it paralyzes reason and sets up the fear of death. In truth, no man knows, and no man has ever known, what heaven or hell is like, nor does any man know if either place actually exists. This very lack of positive knowledge opens the door of the human mind to the charlatan so that he may enter and control that mind with his stock of ledger domain and various brands of pious fraud and trickery. The fear of death is not as common now as it was during the age when there were no great colleges and university. Men of science have turned the spotlight of truth upon the world, and this truth is rapidly freeing men and women from this terrible fear of death. The young men and young women who attend the colleges and universities are not easily impressed by fire and brimstone. Through the aid of biology, astronomy, geology, and other related sciences, the fears of the Dark Ages which gripped the minds of men and destroyed their reason have been dispelled. Insane asylums are filled with men and women who have gone mad because of the fear of death. The fear is useless. Death will come, no matter what anybody might think about it. Accept it as a necessity and pass the thought out of your mind. It must be a necessity, or it would not come to all. Perhaps it's not as bad as it's been pictured. The entire world is made up of only two things, energy and matter. In elementary physics, we learn that neither matter nor energy, the only two realities known to man, can be created nor destroyed. Both matter and energy can be transformed, but neither can be destroyed. Life is energy, if it's anything. If neither energy nor matter can be destroyed, of course life cannot be destroyed. Life, like other forms of energy, may be passed through various processes of transition or change, but it cannot be destroyed. Death is a mere transition. If death is not mere change or transition, then nothing comes after death except a long, eternal, peaceful sleep. And sleep is nothing to be feared. Thus you may wipe out forever the fear of death. The symptoms of the fear of death are the habit of thinking about dying instead of making the most out of life, due generally to lack of purpose or lack of a suitable occupation. This fear is more prevalent among the aged, but sometimes the more youthful are victims of it. The greatest of all remedies for the fear of death is a burning desire for achievement, backed by useful service to others. 
A busy person seldom has time to think about dying. He finds life too thrilling to worry about death. Sometimes the fear of death is closely associated with the fear of poverty, where one's death would leave loved ones poverty-stricken. In other cases, the fear of death is caused by illness and the consequent breaking down of physical body resistance. The most common causes of the fear of death are ill health, poverty, lack of appropriate occupation, disappointment over love, insanity, and religious fanaticism. Old Man Worry Worry is a state of mind based upon fear. It works slowly but persistently. It is insidious and subtle. Step by step it digs itself in until it paralyzes one's reasoning faculty, destroys self-confidence and initiative. Worry is a form of sustained fear caused by indecision. Therefore, it is a state of mind which can be controlled. An unsettled mind is helpless. Indecision makes an unsettled mind. Most individuals lack the willpower to reach decisions promptly and to stand by them after they've been made, even during normal business conditions. During periods of economic unrest, like the world recently experienced, the individual is handicapped, not alone by his inherent nature to be slow at reaching decisions, but he is influenced by the indecision of others around him who have created a state of mass indecision. During the Depression, the whole atmosphere all over the world was filled with fearenza and worryitis, the two mental disease germs which began to spread themselves after the Wall Street frenzy in 1929. There is only one known antidote for these germs. It's the habit of prompt and firm decision. Moreover, it's an antidote which every individual must apply for himself. We don't worry over conditions once we have reached a decision to follow a definite line of action. I once interviewed a man who was to be electrocuted two hours later. The condemned man was the calmest of some eight men who were in the death cell with him. His calmness prompted me to ask him how it felt to know that he was going into eternity in a short while. With a smile of confidence on his face, he said, It feels fine. Just think, brother, my troubles will soon be over. I've had nothing but trouble all of my life. It's been a hardship to get food and clothing. Soon I won't need these things. I have felt fine ever since I learned for certain that I must die. I made up my mind then to accept my fate in good spirit. As he spoke, he devoured a dinner of proportions sufficient for three men, eating every mouthful of the food brought to him and apparently enjoying it as much as if no disaster awaited him. Decision gave this man resignation to his fate. Decision can also prevent one's acceptance of undesired circumstances. The six basic fears become translated into a state of worry through indecision. Relieve yourself forever of the fear of death by reaching a decision to accept death as an inescapable event. Whip the fear of poverty by reaching a decision to get along with whatever wealth you can accumulate. Without worry, put your foot up on the neck of a fear of criticism by reaching a decision not to worry about what other people think, do, or say. Eliminate the fear of old age by reaching a decision to accept it, not as a handicap, but as a great blessing which carries with it wisdom, self-control, and understanding not known to youth. Acquit yourself of the fear of ill health by the decision to forget symptoms. Master the fear of loss of love by reaching a decision to get along without love, if that's necessary. Kill the habit of worry in all of its forms by reaching a general blanket decision that nothing which life has to offer is worth the price of worry. With this decision will come poise, peace of mind, and calmness of thought, which will bring happiness. A man whose mind is filled with fear not only destroys his own chances of intelligent action, but he transmits these destructive vibrations to the minds of all who come into contact with him and destroys also their chances. Even a dog or a horse knows when its master lacks courage. Moreover, a dog or a horse will pick up the vibrations of fear thrown off by its master, and they will behave accordingly. Lower down the line of intelligence in the animal kingdom, one finds this same capacity to pick up the vibrations of fear. A honeybee immediately senses fear in the mind of a person for reasons unknown, and a bee will sting the person whose mind is releasing vibrations of fear much more readily than it will molest the person whose mind registers no fear. The vibrations of fear pass from one mind to another just as quickly and as surely as the sound of the human voice passes from the broadcasting station to the receiving set of a radio and by the self-same medium. Mental telepathy is a reality. Thoughts pass from one mind to another voluntarily whether or not this fact is recognized by either the person releasing the thoughts or the persons who pick up those thoughts. 
The person who gives expression by the word of mouth to negative or destructive thoughts is practically certain to experience the results of those words in the form of a destructive kickback. The release of destructive thought impulses alone, without the aid of words, produces also a kickback in more ways than one. First of all, and perhaps most important to be remembered, the person who releases thoughts of a destructive nature must suffer damage through the breaking down of the faculty of creative imagination. Secondly, the presence in the mind of any destructive emotion develops a negative personality, which repels people and often converts them into the antagonists. The third source of damage to the person who entertains or releases negative thoughts lies in this significant fact. These thought impulses are not only damaging to others, but they embed themselves in the subconscious mind of the person releasing them, and there they become a part of his character. One is never through with a thought merely by releasing it. When a thought is released, it spreads in every direction through the medium of the ether, but it also plants itself permanently in the subconscious mind of the person releasing it. Your business in life is presumably to achieve success. To be successful, you must find peace of mind, acquire the material needs of life, and above all, attain happiness. All of these evidences of success begin in the form of thought impulses. You may control your own mind. You have the power to feed it whatever thought impulses you choose. With this privilege goes also the responsibility of using it constructively. You are the master of your own earthly destiny just as surely as you have the power to control your own thoughts. You may influence, direct, and eventually control your own environment, making your life what you want it to be. Or you may neglect to exercise the privilege which is yours, to make your life to order, thus casting yourself upon the broad sea of circumstance, where you'll be tossed hither and thither and yon like a chip on the waves of the ocean. In addition to the six basic fears, there's another evil by which people suffer. It constitutes a rich soil in which the seeds of failure grow abundantly. It is so subtle that its presence often is not detected. This affliction cannot be properly classed as fear. It's more deeply seated and more often fatal than all of the six fears. For want of a better name, let's call this evil susceptibility to negative influences. Men who accumulate great riches always protect themselves against this evil. The poverty-stricken never do. Those who succeed in any calling must prepare their minds to resist the evil. If you are reading this philosophy for the purpose of accumulating riches, you should examine yourself very carefully to determine whether you are susceptible to negative influences. If you neglect this self-analysis, you will forfeit your right to attain the object of your desire. Make the analysis searching. After you read the questions prepared for this self-analysis, hold yourself to a strict accounting in your answers. Go at the task as carefully as you would search for any other enemy that you knew to be awaiting you in ambush, and deal with your own faults as you would with a more tangible enemy. You can easily protect yourself against highway robbers because the law provides organized cooperation for your benefit. But the seventh basic evil is more difficult to master because it strikes when you're not aware of its presence when you're asleep and while you're awake. Moreover, its weapon is intangible because it consists of merely a state of mind. This evil is also dangerous because it strikes in as many different forms as there are human experiences. Sometimes it enters the mind through the well-meant words of one's own relatives. At other times it bores from within through one's own mental attitude. Always it is as deadly as poison even though it may not kill as quickly. To protect yourself against negative influences, whether of your own making or the result of activities of negative people around you, recognize that you have a willpower and put it into constant use until it builds a wall of immunity against negative influences in your own mind. Recognize the fact that you and every other human being are by nature lazy, indifferent, and susceptible to all suggestions which harmonize with your weaknesses. Recognize that you're by nature susceptible to all six basic fears and set up habits for the purpose of counteracting all of these fears. Recognize that negative influences often work on you through your subconscious mind. Therefore, they're difficult to detect and keep your mind closed against all people who depress or discourage you in any way. Clean out your medicine chest, throw away all the pill bottles and stop pandering to colds, aches, pains, and imaginary illnesses. Deliberately seek the company of people who influence you. Think and act for yourself. Don't expect troubles, as they have a tendency not to disappoint. 
Without doubt, the most common weakness of all human beings is the habit of leaving their minds open to the negative influence of other people. This weakness is all the more damaging because most people don't recognize that they are cursed by it, and many who acknowledge it neglect or refuse to correct the evil until it becomes an uncontrollable part of their daily habits. To aid those who wish to see themselves as they really are, the following list of questions has been prepared. Read the questions and state your answers aloud so that you can hear your own voice. This will make it easier for you to be truthful with yourself. Here are the questions. Do you complain often of feeling bad? And if so, what is the cause? Do you find fault with other people at the slightest provocation? Do you frequently make mistakes in your work? And if so, why? Are you sarcastic and offensive in your conversation? Do you deliberately avoid the association of anyone? And if so, why? Do you suffer frequently with indigestion? If so, what's the cause? Does life seem futile and the future hopeless to you? If so, why? Do you like your occupation? If not, why? Do you often feel self-pity? And if so, why? Are you envious of those who excel you? To which do you devote most time thinking of success or of failure? Are you gaining or losing self-confidence as you grow older? Do you learn something of value from all mistakes? Are you permitting some relative or acquaintance to worry you? If so, why? Are you sometimes in the clouds and at other times in the depths of despondency? Who has the most inspiring influence upon you? What is the cause? Do you tolerate negative or discouraging influences which you can avoid? Are you careless of your personal appearance? If so, when and why? Have you learned how to drown your troubles by being too busy to be annoyed by them? Would you call yourself a spineless weakling if you permitted others to do your thinking for you? Do you neglect internal bathing until auto-intoxication makes you ill-tempered and irritable? How many preventable disturbances annoy you and why do you tolerate them? Do you resort to liquor, narcotics, or cigarettes to quiet your nerves? If so, why do you not try willpower instead? Does anyone nag you? And if so, for what reason? Do you have a definite major purpose? If so, what is it? And what plan do you have for achieving it? Do you suffer from any of the six basic fears? If so, which ones? Have you a method by which you can shield yourself against the negative influence of others? Do you make deliberate use of auto-suggestion to make your mind positive? Which do you value most, your material possessions or your privilege of controlling your own thoughts? Are you easily influenced by others against your own judgment? Has today added anything of value to your stock of knowledge or state of mind? Do you face squarely the circumstances which make you unhappy or sidestep the responsibility? Do you analyze all mistakes and failures and try to profit by them? Or do you take the attitude that this is not your duty? Can you name three of your most damaging weaknesses? What are you going to do to correct them? Do you encourage other people to bring their worries to you for sympathy? Do you choose from your daily experiences lessons or influences which aid in your personal advancement? Does your presence have a negative influence on other people as a rule? What habits of other people annoy you the most? Do you form your own opinions or permit yourself to be influenced by other people? Have you learned how to create a mental state of mind with which you can shield yourself against all discouraging influences? Does your occupation inspire you with faith and hope? Are you conscious of possessing spiritual forces of sufficient power to enable you to keep your mind free from all forms of fear? Does your religion help you to keep your own mind positive? Do you feel it your duty to share other people's worries? And if so, why? Do you believe that birds of a feather flock together? What have you learned about yourself by studying the friends whom you attract? What connection, if any, do you see between the people with whom you associate most closely and any unhappiness that you might experience? Could it be possible that some person whom you consider to be a friend is, in reality, your worst enemy because of his negative influence on your mind? By what rules do you judge who is helpful and who is damaging to you? Are your intimate associates mentally superior or inferior to you? How much time out of every 24 hours do you devote to A. Your occupation B. Sleep C. Play and relaxation and D. Acquiring useful knowledge E. Plain waste Who among your acquaintances A. Encourages you most B. Cautions you most C. Discourages you most D. Helps you most in other ways What is your greatest worry? Why do you tolerate it? 
When others offer you free unsolicited advice, do you accept it without question or analyze their motive? What above all else do you most desire? Do you intend to acquire it? Are you willing to subordinate all other desires for this one? How much time daily do you devote to acquiring it? Do you change your mind often? If so, why? Do you usually finish everything you begin? Are you easily impressed by other people's business or professional titles, college degrees, or wealth? Are you easily influenced by what other people think or say of you? Do you cater to people because of their social or financial status? Whom do you believe to be the greatest person living? In what respect is this person superior to yourself? How much time have you devoted to studying and answering these questions? At least one day is necessary for the analysis and the answering of the entire list. If you'd answered all these questions truthfully, you'd know more about yourself than the majority of people. Study the questions carefully. Come back to them once each week for several months and be astounded at the amount of additional knowledge of great value to yourself that you will have gained by the simple method of answering the questions truthfully. If you're not certain concerning the answers to some of the questions, seek the counsel of those who you know well, especially those who have no motive in flattering you, and see yourself through their eyes. The experience will be astonishing. You have absolute control over but one thing, and that is your thoughts. This is the most significant and inspiring of all facts known to man. It reflects man's divine nature. This divine prerogative is the sole means by which you may control your own destiny. If you fail to control your own mind, you may be sure that you'll control nothing else. If you must be careless with your possessions, let it be in connection with material things. Your mind is your spiritual estate. Protect and use it with the care to which divine royalty is entitled. You were given a willpower for this very purpose. Unfortunately, there's no legal protection against those who, either by design or ignorance, poison the minds of others by negative suggestion. This form of destruction should be punishable by heavy legal penalties because it may and often does destroy one's chances of acquiring material things which are protected by law. Men with negative minds tried to convince Thomas Edison that he could not build a machine that would record and reproduce the human voice because, they said, no one else had ever produced such a machine. Edison did not believe them. He knew that the mind could produce anything that the mind could conceive and believe and that knowledge was the thing that lifted the great Edison above the common herd. Men with negative minds told F.W. Woolworth he could go broke trying to run a store on five and ten cent sales. He did not believe them. He knew that he could do anything within reason if he backed his plans with faith. Exercising his right to keep other men's negative suggestions out of his mind, he piled up a fortune of more than a hundred million dollars. Men with negative minds told George Washington he could not hope to win against the vastly superior forces of the British, but he exercised his divine right to believe. Therefore, this book was published under the protection of the Stars and Stripes, while the name of Lord Cornwallis has been all but forgotten. Doubting Thomas's scoffed scornfully when Henry Ford tried out his first crudely built automobile on the streets of Detroit. Some said the thing never would become practical. Others said no one would pay money for such a contraption. Ford said, I'll belt the earth with dependable motor cars, and he did. His decision to trust his own judgment has already piled up a fortune far greater than the next five generations of his descendants can squander. For the benefit of those seeking vast riches, let it be remembered that practically the sole difference between Henry Ford and a majority of the more than 100,000 men who work for him is this. Ford has a mind, and he controls it. The others have minds which they don't try to control. Henry Ford has been repeatedly mentioned because he's an outstanding example of what a man with a mind of his own and a will to control it can accomplish. His record knocks the foundation from under that time-worn alibi, I never had a chance. Ford never had a chance either, but he created an opportunity and backed it with persistence until it made him richer than Croesus. Mind control is the result of self-discipline and habit. You either control your mind or it controls you. There is no halfway compromise. The most practical of all methods for controlling the mind is the habit of keeping it busy with a definite purpose, backed by a definite plan. Study the record of any man who achieves noteworthy success, and you will observe that he has control over his own mind. Moreover, that he exercises that control and directs it toward the attainment of definite objectives. Without this control, success is not possible. People who do not succeed have one distinguishing trait in common. 
They know all of the reasons for failure and have what they believe to be airtight alibis to explain away their own lack of achievement. Some of these alibis are clever and a few of them are justifiable by the facts. But alibis cannot be used for money. The world wants to know only one thing. Have you achieved success? A character analyst compiled a list of the most commonly used alibis. As you read the list, examine yourself carefully and determine how many of these alibis, if any, are your own property. Remember, too, the philosophy presented in the book makes every one of these alibis obsolete. If I didn't have a wife and family, if I had enough pull, if I had money, if I had a good education, if I could get a job, if I had good health, if I only had time, if times were better, if other people understood me, if conditions around me were only different, if I could live my life over again, if I did not fear what they would say, if I'd been given a chance, if I now had a chance, if other people didn't have it in for me, if nothing happens to stop me, if I were only younger, if I could only do what I want, if I had been born rich, if I could just meet the right people, if I had the talent that some people have, if I dared assert myself, if I had embraced past opportunities, if people didn't get on my nerves, if I didn't have to keep house and look after the children, if I could save some money, if the boss only appreciated me, if I only had somebody to help me, if my family understood me, if I lived in a big city, if I could just get started, if I were only free, if I had the personality of some people, if I were not so fat, if my talents were known, if I could just get a break, if I could only get out of debt, if I hadn't failed, if I only knew how, if everybody didn't oppose me, if I didn't have so many worries, if I could marry the right person, if people weren't so dumb, if my family were not so extravagant, if I were sure of myself, if luck was not against me, if I'd not been born under the wrong star, if it were not true that what is to be will be, if I didn't have to work so hard, if I hadn't lost my money, if I lived in a different neighborhood, if I didn't have a past, if I only had a business of my own, if other people would just listen to me, if, 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 and this is the greatest of them all, I had the courage to see myself as I really am, I would find out what is wrong with me and correct it. Then I might have a chance to profit by my mistakes and learn something from the experience of others. For I know that there is something wrong with me, or I would now be where I would have been if I had spent more time analyzing my weaknesses and less time building alibis to cover them. Building alibis with which to explain away failure is a national pastime. The habit is as old as the human race and is fatal to success. Why do people cling to their pet alibis? The answer is obvious. They defend their alibis because they create them. A man's alibi is the child of his own imagination. It is human nature to defend one's own brainchild. Building alibis is a deeply rooted habit. Habits are difficult to break, especially when they provide justification for something we do. Plato had this truth in mind when he said, The first and best victory is to conquer self. To be conquered by self is, of all things, the most shameful and vile. Another philosopher had the same thought in mind when he said, It was a great surprise to me when I discovered that most of the ugliness I saw in others was but a reflection of my own nature. It has always been a mystery to me, said Albert Hubbard, why people spend so much time deliberately fooling themselves by creating alibis to cover their weaknesses. If used differently, this same time would be sufficient to cure the weakness, then no alibis would be needed. In parting, I would remind you that life is a checkerboard, and the player opposite you is time. If you hesitate before moving or neglect to move promptly, your men will be wiped off the board by time. You are playing against a partner who will not tolerate indecision. Previously, you may have had a logical excuse for not having forced life to come through with whatever you asked, but that alibi is now obsolete because you are in possession of the master key that unlocks the door to life's bountiful riches. The master key is intangible, but it is powerful. It is the privilege of creating in your own mind a burning desire for a definite form of riches. There is no penalty for the use of the key, but there is a price you must pay if you do not use it. The price is failure. There is a reward of stupendous proportion if you put the key to use. 
It is the satisfaction that comes to all who conquer self and force life to pay whatever it is asked. The reward is worthy of your effort. Will you make the start and be convinced? If we are related, said the immortal Emerson, we shall meet. In closing, may I borrow his thought and say, If we are related, we have, through these pages, met. <laughs>